chapter first of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dion gines salt lake city utah whoever's been at paris must needs know the grave the fatal retreat of the unfortunate brave where honour and justice most oddly contribute to ease heroes pains by an halter and gibbet there death breaks the shackles which force had put on and the hangman completes what the judge but began there the squire of the poet and knight of the post find their pains no more balked and their hopes no more crossed prior in former times england had her tyburn to which the devoted victims of justice were conducted in solemn procession up what is now called oxford street in edinburgh a large open street or rather oblong square surrounded by high houses called the grass market was used for the same melancholy purpose it was not ill-chosen for such a scene being of considerable extent and therefore fit to accommodate a great number of spectators such as are usually assembled by this melancholy spectacle on the other hand few of the houses which surround it were even in early times inhabited by persons of fashion so that those likely to be offended or over deeply affected by such unpleasant exhibitions were not in the way of having their quiet disturbed by them the houses in the grass market are generally speaking of a mean description yet the place is not without some features of grandeur being overhung by the southern side of the huge rock on which the castle stands and by the moss-grown battlements and turreted walls of that ancient fortress it was the custom until within these thirty years or thereabouts to use this esplanade for the scene of public executions the fatal day was announced to the public by the appearance of a huge black gallows tree towards the eastern end of the grass market this ill-omened apparition was of great height with a scaffold surrounding it and a double ladder placed against it for the ascent of the unhappy criminal and executioner as this apparatus was always arranged before dawn it seemed as if the gallows had grown out of the earth in the course of one night like the production of some foul demon and i well remember the fright with which the schoolboys when i was one of their number used to regard these ominous signs of deadly preparation on the night after the execution the gallows again disappeared and was conveyed in silence and darkness to the place where it was usually deposited which was one of the vaults under the parliament house or courts of justice this mode of execution is now exchanged for one similar to that in front of newgate with what beneficial effect is uncertain the mental sufferings of the convict are indeed shortened he no longer stalks between the attendant clergyman dressed in his grave clothes through a considerable part of the city looking like a moving and walking corpse while yet an inhabitant of this world but as the ultimate purpose of punishment has in view the prevention of crimes it may at least be doubted whether in abridging the melancholy ceremony we have not in part diminished that appalling effect upon the spectators which is the useful end 
of all such inflictions and in consideration of which alone unless in very particular cases capital sentences can be altogether justified on the seventh day of september seventeen thirty six these ominous preparations for execution were descried in the place we have described and at an early hour the space around began to be occupied by several groups who gazed on the scaffold and gibbet with a stern and vindictive show of satisfaction very seldom testified by the populace whose good nature in most cases forgets the crime of the condemned person and dwells only on his misery but the act of which the expected culprit had been convicted was of a description calculated nearly and closely to awaken and irritate the resentful feelings of the multitude the tale is well known yet it is necessary to recapitulate its leading circumstances for the better understanding of what is to follow and the narrative may prove long but i trust not uninteresting even to those who have heard its general issue at any rate some detail is necessary in order to render intelligible the subsequent events of our narrative contraband trade though it strikes at the root of legitimate government by encroaching on its revenues though it injures the fair trader and debauches the mind of those who engage in it is not usually looked upon either by the vulgar or by their betters in a very heinous point of view on the contrary in those countries where it prevails the cleverest boldest and most intelligent of the peasantry are uniformly engaged in illicit transactions and very often with the sanction of the farmers and inferior gentry smuggling was almost universal in scotland in the reigns of george the first and second for the people unaccustomed to imposts and regarding them as an unjust aggression upon their ancient liberties made no scruple to elude them whenever it was possible to do so the county of fife bounded by two firths on the south and north and by the sea on the east and having a number of small seaports was long famed for maintaining successfully a contraband trade and as there were many seafaring men residing there who had been pirates and buccaneers in their youth there were not wanting a sufficient number of daring men to carry it on among these a fellow called andrew wilson originally a baker in the village of pathhead was particularly obnoxious to the revenue officers he was possessed of great personal strength courage and cunning was perfectly acquainted with the coast and capable of conducting the most desperate enterprises on several occasions he succeeded in baffling the pursuit and researches of the king's officers but he became so much the object of their suspicions and watchful attention that at length he was totally ruined by repeated seizures the man became desperate he considered himself as robbed and plundered and took it into his head that he had a right to make reprisals as he could find opportunity where the heart is prepared for evil opportunity is seldom long wanting this wilson learned that the collector of the customs at kirkaldy had come to pittenweem in the course of his official round of duty with a considerable sum of public money in his custody as the amount was greatly within the value of the goods which had been seized from him wilson felt no scruple of conscience in resolving to reimburse himself 
for his losses at the expense of the collector and the revenue he associated with himself one robertson and two other idle young men whom having been concerned in the same illicit trade he persuaded to view the transaction in the same justifiable light in which he himself considered it they watched the motions of the collector they broke forcibly into the house where he lodged wilson with two of his associates entering the collector's apartment while robertson the fourth kept watch at the door with a drawn cutlass in his hand the officer of the customs conceiving his life in danger escaped out of his bedroom window and fled in his shirt so that the plunderers with much ease possessed themselves of about two hundred pounds of public money the robbery was committed in a very audacious manner for several persons were passing in the street at the time but robertson representing the noise they heard as a dispute or fray betwixt the collector and the people of the house the worthy citizens of pittenweem felt themselves no way called on to interfere in behalf of the obnoxious revenue officer so satisfying themselves with this very superficial account of the matter like the levite in the parable they passed on the opposite side of the way an alarm was at length given military were called in the depredators were pursued the booty recovered and wilson and robertson tried and condemned to death chiefly on the evidence of an accomplice many thought that in consideration of the men's erroneous opinion of the nature of the action they had committed justice might have been satisfied with a less forfeiture than that of two lives on the other hand from the audacity of the fact a severe example was judged necessary and such was the opinion of the government when it became apparent that the sentence of death was to be executed files and other implements necessary for their escape were transmitted secretly to the culprits by a friend from without by these means they sawed a bar out of one of the prison windows and might have made their escape but for the obstinacy of wilson who as he was daringly resolute was doggedly pertinacious of his opinion his comrade robertson a young and slender man proposed to make the experiment of passing the foremost through the gap they had made and enlarging it from the outside if necessary to allow wilson free passage wilson however insisted on making the first experiment and being a robust and lusty man he not only found it impossible to get through betwixt the bars but by his struggles he jammed himself so fast that he was unable to draw his body back again in these circumstances discovery became unavoidable and sufficient precautions were taken by the jailer to prevent any repetition of the same attempt robertson uttered not a word of reflection on his companion for the consequences of his obstinacy but it appeared from the sequel that wilson's mind was deeply impressed with the recollection that but for him his comrade over whose mind he exercised considerable influence would not have engaged in the criminal enterprise which had terminated thus fatally and that now he had become his destroyer a second time since but for his obstinacy robertson might have effected his escape minds like wilson's even when exercised in evil practices sometimes retain the power of thinking and resolving with enthusiastic generosity his whole thoughts were now bent on the possibility of saving robertson's life without the least respect to his own 
the resolution which he adopted and the manner in which he carried it into effect were striking and unusual adjacent to the tolbooth or city jail of edinburgh is one of three churches into which the cathedral of st giles is now divided called from its vicinity the tolbooth church it was the custom that criminals under sentence of death were brought to this church with a sufficient guard to hear and join in public worship on the sabbath before execution it was supposed that the hearts of these unfortunate persons however hardened before against feelings of devotion could not but be accessible to them upon uniting their thoughts and voices for the last time along with their fellow-mortals in addressing their creator and to the rest of the congregation it was thought it could not but be impressive and affecting to find their devotions mingling with those who sent by the doom of an earthly tribunal to appear where the whole earth is judged might be considered as beings trembling on the verge of eternity the practice however edifying has been discontinued in consequence of the incident we are about to detail the clergyman whose duty it was to officiate in the tolbooth church had concluded an affecting discourse part of which was particularly directed to the unfortunate men wilson and robertson who were in the pew set apart for the persons in their unhappy situation each secured betwixt two soldiers of the city guard the clergyman had reminded them that the next congregation they must join would be that of the just or of the unjust that the psalms they now heard must be exchanged in the space of two brief days for eternal hallelujahs or eternal lamentations and that this fearful alternative must depend upon the state to which they might be able to bring their minds before the moment of awful preparation that they should not despair on account of the suddenness of the summons but rather to feel this comfort in their misery that though all who now lifted the voice or bent the knee in conjunction with them lay under the same sentence of certain death they only had the advantage of knowing the precise moment at which it should be executed upon them therefore urged the good man his voice trembling with emotion redeem the time my unhappy brethren which is yet left and remember that with the grace of him to whom space and time are but as nothing salvation may yet be assured even in the pittance of delay which the laws of your country afford you robertson was observed to weep at these words but wilson seemed as one whose brain had not entirely received their meaning or whose thoughts were deeply impressed with some different subject an expression so natural to a person in his situation that it excited neither suspicion nor surprise the benediction was pronounced as usual and the congregation was dismissed many lingering to indulge their curiosity with a more fixed look at the two criminals who now as well as their guards rose up as if to depart when the crowd should permit them a murmur of compassion was heard to pervade the spectators the more general perhaps on account of the alleviating circumstances of the case when all at once wilson who as we have already noticed was a very strong man seized two of the soldiers one with each hand and calling at the same time to his companion run geordie run 
threw himself on a third and fastened his teeth on the collar of his coat robertson stood for a second as if thunderstruck and unable to avail himself of the opportunity of escape but the cry of run run being echoed from many around whose feelings surprised them into a very natural interest in his behalf he shook off the grasp of the remaining soldier threw himself over the pew mixed with the dispersing congregation none of whom felt inclined to stop a poor wretch taking his last chance for his life gained the door of the church and was lost to all pursuit the generous intrepidity which wilson had displayed on this occasion augmented the feeling of compassion which attended his fate the public where their own prejudices are not concerned are easily engaged on the side of disinterestedness and humanity admired wilson's behavior and rejoiced in robertson's escape this general feeling was so great that it excited a vague report that wilson should be rescued at the place of execution either by the mob or by some of his old associates or by some second extraordinary and unexpected exertion of strength and courage on his own part the magistrates thought it their duty to provide against the possibility of disturbance they ordered out for protection of the execution of the sentence the greater part of their own city guard under the command of captain porteus a man whose name became too memorable from the melancholy circumstances of the day and subsequent events it may be necessary to say a word about this person and the corps which he commanded but the subject is of importance sufficient to deserve another chapter end of chapter first chapter second of the heart of mid lothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah and thou great god of aquavita what sways the empire of this city when foul we're sometimes capernoidi be thou prepared to save us from that black banditti the city guard ferguson's daft days captain john porteus a name memorable in the traditions of edinburgh as well as in the records of criminal jurisprudence was the son of a citizen of edinburgh who endeavoured to breed him up to his own mechanical trade of a tailor the youth however had a wild and irreclaimable propensity to dissipation which finally sent him to serve in the corps long maintained in the service of the states of holland and called the scotch dutch here he learned military discipline and returning afterwards in the course of an idle and wandering life to his native city his services were required by the magistrates of edinburgh in the disturbed year seventeen fifteen for disciplining their city guard in which he shortly afterwards received a captain's commission it was only by his military skill and an alert and resolute character as an officer of police that he merited this promotion for he is said to have been a man of profligate habits an unnatural son and a brutal husband he was however useful in his station and his harsh and fierce habits rendered him formidable to rioters or disturbers of the public peace the corps in which he held his command is or perhaps we should rather say was a body of about one hundred and twenty soldiers divided into three companies and regularly armed 
clothed and embodied they were chiefly veterans who enlisted in this cogs having the benefit of working at their trades when they were off duty these men had the charge of preserving public order repressing riots and street robberies acting in short as an armed police and attending on all public occasions where confusion or popular disturbance might be expected the lord provost was ex officio commander and colonel of the corps which might be increased to three hundred men when the times required it no other drum but theirs was allowed to sound on the high street between the luckenbooths and the netherbow poor ferguson whose irregularities sometimes led him into unpleasant rencontres with these military conservators of public order and who mentions them so often that he may be termed their poet laureate thus admonishes his readers warned doubtless by his own experience good folk as ye come from the fair bide yon fray this black squad there's na sick savages elsewhere allowed to wear cockade in fact the soldiers of the city guard being as we have said in general discharged veterans who had strength enough remaining for this municipal duty and being moreover for the greater part highlanders were neither by birth education nor former habits trained to endure with much patience the insults of the rabble or the provoking petulance of truant schoolboys and idle debauchees of all descriptions with whom their occupation brought them into contact on the contrary the tempers of the poor old fellows were soured by the indignities with which the mob distinguished them on many occasions and frequently might have required the soothing strains of the poet we have just quoted o oh, soldiers for your sin dear sakes for scotland's love the land of cakes give not her bairns sick deadly pakes nor be say rude with firelock or lockaber axe as spill their blood on all occasions when a holiday licensed some riot and irregularity a skirmish with these veterans was a favourite recreation with the rabble of edinburgh these pages may perhaps see the light when many have in fresh recollection such onsets as we allude to but the venerable corps with whom the contention was held may now be considered as totally extinct of late the gradual diminution of these civic soldiers reminds one of the abatement of king lear's hundred knights the edicts of each succeeding set of magistrates have like those of goneril and regan diminished this venerable band with the similar question what need we five and twenty ten or five and it is now nearly come to what need one a spectre may indeed here and there still be seen of an old grey-headed and grey-bearded highlander with war-worn features but bent double by age dressed in an old-fashioned cocked hat bound with white tape instead of silver lace and in coat waistcoat and breeches of a muddy-coloured red bearing in his withered hand an ancient weapon called a lockaber axe a long pole namely with an axe at the extremity and a hook at the back of the hatchet this hook was to enable the bearer of the lockaber axe to scale a gateway by grappling the top of the door and swinging himself up by the staff of his weapon such a phantom of former days still creeps i have been informed round the statue of charles the second 
in the parliament square as if the image of a stuart were the last refuge for any memorial of our ancient manners and one or two others are supposed to glide around the door of the guard-house assigned to them in the lucken booths when their ancient refuge in the high street was laid low this ancient corps is now entirely disbanded their last march to do duty at hollow fair had something in it affecting their drums and fifes had been wont on better days to play on this joyous occasion the lively tune of jockey to the fair but on his final occasion the afflicted veterans moved slowly to the dirge of the last time i came o'er the muir but the fate of manuscripts bequeathed to friends and executors is so uncertain that the narrative containing these frail memorials of the old town guard of edinburgh who with their grim and valiant corporal john dew the fiercest looking fellow i ever saw were in my boyhood the alternate terror and derision of the petulant brood of the high school may perhaps only come to light when all memory of the institution has faded away and then serve as an illustration of kay's caricatures who has preserved the features of some of their heroes in the preceding generation when there was a perpetual alarm for the plots and activity of the jacobites some pains were taken by the magistrates of edinburgh to keep this corps though composed always of such materials as we have noticed in a more effective state than was afterwards judged necessary when their most dangerous service was to skirmish with the rabble on the king's birthday they were therefore more the objects of hatred and less that of scorn than they were afterwards accounted to captain john porteous the honour of his command and of his corps seems seems to have been a matter of high interest and importance he was exceedingly incensed against wilson for the affront which he construed him to have put upon his soldiers in the effort he made for the liberation of his companion and expressed himself most ardently on the subject he was no less indignant at the report that there was an intention to rescue wilson himself from the gallows and uttered many threats and imprecations upon that subject which were afterwards remembered to his disadvantage in fact if a good deal of determination and promptitude rendered porteous in one respect fit to command guards designed to suppress popular commotion he seems on the other to have been disqualified for a charge so delicate by a hot and surly temper always too ready to come to blows and violence a character void of principle and a disposition to regard the rabble who seldom failed to regale him and his soldiers with some marks of their displeasure as declared enemies upon whom it was natural and justifiable that he should seek opportunities of vengeance being however the most active and trustworthy among the captains of the city guard he was the person to whom the magistrates confided the command of the soldiers appointed to keep the peace at the time of wilson's execution he was ordered to guard the gallows and scaffold with about eighty men all the disposable force that could be spared for that duty but the magistrates took farther precautions which affected porteous's pride very deeply they requested the assistance of part of a regular infantry regiment not to attend upon the execution but to remain drawn up 
on the principal street of the city during the time that it went forward in order to intimidate the multitude in case they should be disposed to be unruly with a display of force which could not be resisted without desperation it may sound ridiculous in our ears considering the fallen state of this ancient civic corps that its officer should have felt punctiliously jealous of its honour yet so it was captain porteous resented as an indignity the introducing the welch fusiliers within the city and drawing them up in the street where no drums but his own were allowed to be sounded without the special command or permission of the magistrates as he could not show his ill-humour to his patrons the magistrates it increased his indignation and his desire to be revenged on the unfortunate criminal wilson and all who favoured him these internal emotions of jealousy and rage wrought a change on the man's mien and bearing visible to all who saw him on the fatal morning when wilson was appointed to suffer porteous's ordinary appearance was rather favourable he was about the middle size stout and well made having a military air and yet rather a gentle and mild countenance his complexion was brown his face somewhat fretted with the sears of the smallpox his eyes rather languid than keen or fierce on the present occasion however it seemed to those who saw him as if he were agitated by some evil demon his step was irregular his voice hollow and broken his countenance pale his eyes staring and wild his speech imperfect and confused and his whole appearance so disordered that many remarked he seemed to be fay a scottish expression meaning the state of those who are driven on to their impending fate by the strong impulse of some irresistible necessity one part of his conduct was truly diabolical if indeed it has not been exaggerated by the general prejudice entertained against his memory when wilson the unhappy criminal was delivered to him by the keeper of the prison in order that he might be conducted to the place of execution porteous not satisfied with the usual precautions to prevent escape ordered him to be manacled this might be justifiable from the character and bodily strength of the malefactor as well as from the apprehensions so generally entertained of an expected rescue but the handcuffs which were produced being found too small for the wrists of a man so big-boned as wilson porteous proceeded with his own hands and by great exertion of strength to force them till they clasped together to the exquisite torture of the unhappy criminal wilson remonstrated against such barbarous usage declaring that the pain distracted his thoughts from the subjects of meditation proper to his unhappy condition it signifies little replied captain porteous your pain will soon be at an end your cruelty is great answered the sufferer you know not how soon you yourself may have occasion to ask the mercy which you are now refusing to a fellow-creature may god forgive you these words long afterwards quoted and remembered were all that passed between porteous and his prisoner but as they took air and became known to the people they greatly increased the popular compassion for wilson and excited a proportionate degree of indignation against porteous against whom as strict 
and even violent in the discharge of his unpopular office the common people had some real and many imaginary causes of complaint when the painful procession was completed and wilson with the escort had arrived at the scaffold in the grass market there appeared no signs of that attempt to rescue him which had occasioned such precautions the multitude in general looked on with deeper interest than at ordinary executions and there might be seen on the countenances of many a stern and indignant expression like that with which the ancient cameronians might be supposed to witness the execution of their brethren who glorified the covenant on the same occasion and at the same spot but there was no attempt at violence wilson himself seemed disposed to hasten over the space that divided time from eternity the devotions proper and usual on such occasions were no sooner finished than he submitted to his fate and the sentence of the law was fulfilled he had been suspended on the gibbet so long as to be totally deprived of life when at once as if occasioned by some newly received impulse there arose a tumult among the multitude many stones were thrown at porteus and his guards some mischief was done and the mob continued to press forward with hoops shrieks howls and exclamations a young fellow with a sailor's cap slouched over his face sprung on the scaffold and cut the rope by which the criminal was suspended others approached to carry off the body either to secure it a decent grave or to try perhaps some means of resuscitation captain porteus was wrought by this appearance of insurrection against his authority into a rage so headlong as made him forget that the sentence having been fully executed it was his duty not to engage in hostilities with the misguided multitude but to draw off his men as fast as possible he sprung from the scaffold snatched a musket from one of his soldiers commanded the party to give fire and as several eye-witnesses concurred in swearing set them the example by discharging his piece and shooting a man dead on the spot several soldiers obeyed his command or followed his example six or seven persons were slain and a great many were hurt and wounded after this act of violence the captain proceeded to withdraw his men towards their guard-house in the high street the mob were not so much intimidated as incensed by what had been done they pursued the soldiers with execrations accompanied by volleys of stones as they pressed on them the rearmost soldiers turned and again fired with fatal aim and execution it is not accurately known whether porteus commanded this second act of violence but of course the odium of the whole transactions of the fatal day attached to him and to him alone he arrived at the guard-house dismissed his soldiers and went to make his report to the magistrates concerning the unfortunate events of the day apparently by this time captain porteus had begun to doubt the propriety of his own conduct and the reception he met with from the magistrates was such as to make him still more anxious to gloss it over he denied that he had given orders to fire he denied that he had fired with his own hand he even produced the fusee which he carried as an officer for examination it was found still loaded of three cartridges which he was seen to put in his pouch that morning 
two were still there a white handkerchief was thrust into the muzzle of the piece and returned unsoiled or blackened to the defence founded on these circumstances it was answered that porteus had not used his own piece but had been seen to take one from a soldier among the many who had been killed and wounded by the unhappy fire there were several of better rank for even the humanity of such soldiers as fired over the heads of the mere rabble around the scaffold proved in some instances fatal to persons who were stationed in windows or observed the melancholy scene from a distance the voice of public indignation was loud and general and ere men's tempers had time to cool the trial of captain porteus took place before the high court of justiciary after a long and patient hearing the jury had the difficult duty of balancing the positive evidence of many persons and those of respectability who deposed positively to the prisoners commanding his soldiers to fire and himself firing his piece of which some swore that they saw the smoke and flash and beheld a man drop at whom it was pointed with the negative testimony of others who though well stationed foreseeing what had passed neither heard porteus give orders to fire nor saw him fire himself but on the contrary averred that the first shot was fired by a soldier who stood close by him a great part of his defence was also founded on the turbulence of the mob which witnesses according to their feelings their predilections and their opportunities of observation represented differently some describing as a formidable riot what others represented as a trifling disturbance such as always used to take place on the like occasions when the executioner of the law and the men commissioned to protect him in his task were generally exposed to some indignities the verdict of the jury sufficiently shows how the evidence preponderated in their minds it declared that john porteus fired a gun among the people assembled at the execution that he gave orders to his soldiers to fire by which many persons were killed and wounded but at the same time that the prisoner and his guard had been wounded and beaten by stones thrown at them by the multitude upon this verdict the lords of justiciary passed sentence of death against captain john porteus adjudging him in the common form to be hanged on a gibbet at the common place of execution on wednesday eighth september seventeen thirty six and all his movable property to be forfeited to the king's use according to the scottish law in cases of wilful murder End of chapter second chapter third of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the hours come but not the man there is a tradition that while a little stream was swollen into a torrent by recent showers the discontented voice of the water spirit was heard to pronounce these words at the same moment a man urged on by his fate or in scottish language fay arrived at a gallop and prepared to cross the water no remonstrance from the bystanders was of power to stop him he plunged into the stream and perished kelpy on the day when the unhappy porteus was expected to suffer the sentence of the law 
the place of execution extensive as it is was crowded almost to suffocation there was not a window in all the lofty tenements around it or in the steep and crooked street called the bow by which the fatal procession was to descend from the high street that was not absolutely filled with spectators the uncommon height and antique appearance of these houses some of which were formerly the property of the knights templars and the knights of st john and still exhibit on their fronts and gables the iron cross of these orders gave additional effect to a scene in itself so striking the area of the grass market resembled a huge dark lake or sea of human heads in the centre of which arose the fatal tree tall black and ominous from which dangled the deadly halter every object takes interest from its uses and associations and the erect beam and empty noose things so simple in themselves became on such an occasion objects of terror and of solemn interest amid so numerous an assembly there was scarcely a word spoken save in whispers the thirst of vengeance was in some degree allayed by its supposed certainty and even the populace with deeper feeling than they are wont to entertain suppressed all clamorous exultation and prepared to enjoy the scene of retaliation in triumph silent and decent though stern and relentless it seemed as if the depth of their hatred to the unfortunate criminal scorned to display itself in anything resembling the more noisy current of their ordinary feelings had a stranger consulted only the evidence of his ears he might have supposed that so vast a multitude were assembled for some purpose which affected them with the deepest sorrow and stilled those noises which on all ordinary occasions arise from such a concourse but if he had gazed upon their faces he would have been instantly undeceived the compressed lip the bent brow the stern and flashing eye of almost every one on whom he looked conveyed the expression of men come to glut their sight with triumphant revenge it is probable that the appearance of the criminal might have somewhat changed the temper of the populace in his favour and that they might in the moment of death have forgiven the man against whom their resentment had been so fiercely heated it had however been destined that the mutability of their sentiments was not to be exposed to this trial the usual hour for producing the criminal had been passed for many minutes yet the spectators observed no symptom of his appearance would they venture to defraud public justice was the question which men began anxiously to ask at each other the first answer in every case was bold and positive they dare not but when the point was further canvassed other opinions were entertained and various causes of doubt were suggested porteus had been a favorite officer of the magistracy of the city which being a numerous and fluctuating body requires for its support a degree of energy in its functionaries which the individuals who compose it cannot at all times alike be supposed to possess in their own persons it was remembered that in the information for porteus the paper namely in which his case was stated to the judges of the criminal court he had been described by his counsel as the person on whom the magistrates chiefly relied 
in all emergencies of uncommon difficulty it was argued too that his conduct on the unhappy occasion of wilson's execution was capable of being attributed to an imprudent excess of zeal in the execution of his duty a motive for which those under whose authority he acted might be supposed to have great sympathy and as these considerations might move the magistrates to make a favourable representation of porteus's case there were not wanting others in the higher departments of government which would make suggestions favourably listened to the mob of edinburgh when thoroughly excited had been at all times one of the fiercest which could be found in europe and of late years they had risen repeatedly against the government and sometimes not without temporary success they were conscious therefore that they were no favourites with the rulers of the period and that if captain porteous's violence was not altogether regarded as good service it might certainly be thought that to visit it with a capital punishment would render it both delicate and dangerous for future officers in the same circumstances to act with effect in repressing tumults there is also a natural feeling on the part of all members of government for the general maintenance of authority and it seemed not unlikely that what to the relatives of the sufferers appeared a wanton and unprovoked massacre should be otherwise viewed in the cabinet of st james it might be there supposed that upon the whole matter captain porteous was in the exercise of a trust delegated to him by the lawful civil authority that he had been assaulted by the populace and several of his men hurt and that in finally repelling force by force his conduct could be fairly imputed to no other motive than self-defence in the discharge of his duty these considerations of themselves very powerful induced the spectators to apprehend the possibility of a reprieve and to the various causes which might interest the rulers in his favour the lower part of the rabble added one which was peculiarly well adapted to their comprehension it was averred in order to increase the odium against porteous that while he repressed with the utmost severity the slightest excesses of the poor he not only overlooked the license of the young nobles and gentry but was very willing to lend them the countenance of his official authority in execution of such loose pranks as it was chiefly his duty to have restrained this suspicion which was perhaps much exaggerated made a deep impression on the minds of the populace and when several of the higher rank joined in a petition recommending porteous to the mercy of the crown it was generally supposed he owed their favour not to any conviction of the hardship of his case but to the fear of losing a convenient accomplice in their debaucheries it is scarcely necessary to say how much this suspicion augmented the people's detestation of this obnoxious criminal as well as their fear of his escaping the sentence pronounced against him while these arguments were stated and replied to and canvassed and supported the hitherto silent expectation of the people became changed into that deep and agitating murmur which is sent forth by the ocean before the tempest begins to howl the crowded populace as if their motions had corresponded with the unsettled state of their minds fluctuated to and fro without any visible cause of impulse like the agitation of the waters called by sailors 
the ground swell the news which the magistrates had almost hesitated to communicate to them were at length announced and spread among the spectators with a rapidity like lightning a reprieve from the secretary of state's office under the hand of his grace the duke of newcastle had arrived intimating the pleasure of queen caroline regent of the kingdom during the absence of george the second on the continent that the execution of the sentence of death pronounced against john porteous late captain lieutenant of the city guard of edinburgh present prisoner in the tolbooth of that city be respited for six weeks from the time appointed for his execution the assembled spectators of almost all degrees whose minds had been wound up to the pitch which we have described uttered a groan or rather a roar of indignation and disappointed revenge similar to that of a tiger from whom his meal has been rent by his keeper when he was just about to devour it this fierce exclamation seemed to forebode some immediate explosion of popular resentment and in fact such had been expected by the magistrates and the necessary measures had been taken to repress it but the shout was not repeated nor did any sudden tumult ensue such as it appeared to announce the populace seemed to be ashamed of having expressed their disappointment in a vain clamour and the sound changed not into the silence which had preceded the arrival of these stunning news but into stifled mutterings which each group maintained among themselves and which were blended into one deep and hoarse murmur which floated above the assembly yet still though all expectation of the execution was over the mob remained assembled stationary as it were through very resentment gazing on the preparations for death which had now been made in vain and stimulating their feelings by recalling the various claims which wilson might have had on royal mercy from the mistaken motives on which he acted as well as from the generosity he had displayed towards his accomplice this man they said the brave the resolute the generous was executed to death without mercy for stealing a purse of gold which in some sense he might consider as a fair reprisal while the profligate satellite who took advantage of a trifling tumult inseparable from such occasions to shed the blood of twenty of his fellow-citizens is deemed a fitting object for the exercise of the royal prerogative of mercy is this to be borne would our fathers have borne it are not we like them scotsmen and burghers of edinburgh the officers of justice began now to remove the scaffold and other preparations which had been made for the execution in hopes by doing so to accelerate the dispersion of the multitude the measure had the desired effect for no sooner had the fatal tree been unfixed from the large stone pedestal or socket in which it was secured and sunk slowly down upon the wain intended to remove it to the place where it was usually deposited than the populace after giving vent to their feelings in a second shout of rage and mortification began slowly to disperse to their usual abodes and occupations the windows were in like manner gradually deserted and groups of the more decent class of citizens formed themselves as if waiting to return homewards 
when the streets should be cleared of the rabble contrary to what is frequently the case this description of persons agreed in general with the sentiments of their inferiors and considered the cause as common to all ranks indeed as we have already noticed it was by no means amongst the lowest class of the spectators or those most likely to be engaged in the riot at wilson's execution that the fatal fire of porteus's soldiers had taken effect several persons were killed who were looking out at windows at the scene who would not of course belong to the rioters and were persons of decent rank and condition the burghers therefore resenting the loss which had fallen on their own body and proud and tenacious of their rights as the citizens of edinburgh have at all times been were greatly exasperated at the unexpected respite of captain porteus it was noticed at the time and afterwards more particularly remembered that while the mob were in the act of dispersing several individuals were seen busily passing from one place and one group of people to another remaining long with none but whispering for a little time with those who appeared to be declaiming most violently against the conduct of government these active agents had the appearance of men from the country and were generally supposed to be old friends and confederates of wilson whose minds were of course highly excited against porteus if however it was the intention of these men to stir the multitude to any sudden act of mutiny it seemed for the time to be fruitless the rabble as well as the more decent part of the assembly dispersed and went home peaceably and it was only by observing the moody discontent on their brows or catching the tenor of the conversation they held with each other that a stranger could estimate the state of their minds we will give the reader this advantage by associating ourselves with one of the numerous groups who were painfully ascending the steep declivity of the west bow to return to their dwellings in the lawn market an unco thing this mrs howden said old peter plumdamus to his neighbour the rooping wife or saleswoman as he offered her his arm to assist her in the toilsome ascent to see the grit folk at lunan set their face against law and gospel and let loose such a reprobate as porteus upon a peaceable town and to think of the weary walk they have given us answered mrs howden with a groan and sick a comfortable window as i had gotten too just within a penny stain-cast of the scaffold i could have heard every word the minister said and to pay twelve pennies for my stand and all for nothing i am judging said mr plum damas that this reprieve wouldn't stand good in the old scots law when the kingdom was a kingdom i dinna can muckle about the law answered mrs howden but i can when we had a king and a chancellor and parliament men of our ain we could aye people them with stains when they werena good bairns but nobody's nails can reach the length of lunan weary on lunan and all that ever came out of it said mrs grizzle damahoy an ancient seamstress they have taken away our parliament and they have oppressed our trade our gentles will hardly allow that a scots needle can sew ruffles on a sark or lace on an o'erlay ye may say that miss damahoy and i ken of them that have gotten raisins from lunnon by forpits at once responded plum damas and then sick an host of idle english godgers and excisemen as has come down to vex and torment us that an honest man canna fetch some muckle as a bit 
anchor of brandy from leith to the lawn market but he's like to be robbed of the very goods he's bought and paid for well i winna justify andrew wilson for pittin hands on what wasna his but if he took no more than his own there's an awful difference between that and the fact this man stands for if ye speak about the law said mrs howden here comes mr saddletree that can settle it as well as any on the bench the party she mentioned a grave elderly person with a superb periwig dressed in a decent suit of sad coloured clothes came up as she spoke and courteously gave his arm to miss grizzle damahoy it may be necessary to mention that mr bartoline saddletree kept an excellent and highly esteemed shop for harness saddles etc etc at the sign of the golden nag at the head of bess wind his genius however as he himself and most of his neighbours conceived lay towards the weightier matters of the law and he failed not to give frequent attendance upon the pleadings and arguments of the lawyers and judges in the neighbouring square where to say the truth he was oftener to be found than would have consisted with his own emolument but that his wife an active painstaking person could in his absence make an admirable shift to please the customers and scold the journeymen this good lady was in the habit of letting her husband take his way and go on improving his stock of legal knowledge without interruption but as if in requital she insisted upon having her own will in the domestic and commercial departments which he abandoned to her now as bartoline saddletree had a considerable gift of words which he mistook for eloquence and conferred more liberally upon the society in which he lived than was at all times gracious and acceptable there went forth a saying with which wags used sometimes to interrupt his rhetoric that as he had a golden nag at his door so he had a grey mare in his shop this reproach induced mr saddletree on all occasions to assume rather a haughty and stately tone towards his good woman a circumstance by which she seemed very little affected unless he attempted to exercise any real authority when she never failed to fly into open rebellion but such extremes bartolin seldom provoked for like the gentle king jamie he was fonder of talking of authority than really exercising it this turn of mind was on the whole lucky for him since his substance was increased without any trouble on his part or any interruption of his favourite studies this word in explanation has been thrown in to the reader while saddletree was laying down with great precision the law upon porteus's case by which he arrived at this conclusion that if porteus had fired five minutes sooner before wilson was cut down he would have been for sans in licito engaged that is in a lawful act and only liable to be punished propter excessum or for lack of discretion which might have mitigated the punishment to poena ordinaria discretion echoed mrs howden on whom it may well be supposed the fineness of this distinction was entirely thrown away when had jock porteus either grace discretion or good manners i mind when his father but mrs howden said saddletree and i said mrs damahoy mind when his mother miss damahoy entreated the interrupted orator and i said plumdamus mind when his wife mr plumdamus miss howden miss damahoy again implored the orator mind the distinction as counsellor crossmaloof says i says he take a distinction 
now the body of the criminal being cut down and the execution ended porteus was no longer official the act which he came to protect and guard being done and ended he was no better than suivus ex populo quivis quivis mr saddletree craving your pardon said with a prolonged emphasis on the first syllable mr butler the deputy schoolmaster of a parish near edinburgh who at that moment came up behind them as the false latin was uttered what signifies interrupting me mr butler but i am glad to see ye notwithstanding i speak after counsellor crossmyloof and he said suavis if counsellor crossmyloof used the dative for the nominative i would have crossed his loof with a tight leathern strap mr saddletree there is not a boy on the booby form but should have been scourged for such a solecism in grammar i speak latin like a lawyer mr butler and not like a schoolmaster retorted saddletree scarce like a schoolboy i think rejoined butler it matters little said bartolin all i mean to say is that porteus has become liable to the poena extra ordinum or capital punishment which is to say in plain scotch the gallows simply because he did not fire when he was in office but waited till the body was cut down the execution whilk he had in charge to guard implemented and he himself exonered of the public trust imposed on him but mr saddletree said plum damas do ye really think john porteous's case would have been better if he had begun firing before any stones were flung at a indeed do i neighbour plum damas replied bartolin confidently he being then in point of trust and in point of power the execution being but inchoit or at least not implemented or finally ended but after wilson was cut down it was all o'er he was clean ex octorate and had nay mere ado but to get away with his guard up this west bow as fast as if there had been a caption after him and this is law for i heard it laid down by lord vincoven centum vincoven centum is he a lord of state or a lord of seat inquired mrs howden a lord of seat a lord of session i fash myself little with lords of state they vex me with a ween idle questions about their saddles and kirples and holsters and horse furniture and what they'll cost and when they'll be ready a ween galloping geese my wife may serve the like of them and so might she in her day have served the best lord in the land for as little as ye think of her mr saddletree said mrs howden somewhat indignant at the contemptuous way in which her gossip was mentioned when she and i were twa gilpies we little thought to have sitten down with the like of my old davy howden or you either mr saddletree while saddletree who was not bright at a reply was cudgelling his brains for an answer to this home thrust miss damahoy broke in on him and as for the lords of state said miss damahoy ye sold mind the writing o the parliament mr saddletree in the good old time before the union a year's rent o money a good estate gaed for horse-greath and harnessing for by broidered robes and foot-mantles that would have stood by their lane with gold brocade and that were muckle in my ain line ay and then the lusty banqueting with sweetmeats and comfits wet and dry and dried fruits of divers sorts said plumdamas but scotland was scotland in these days i'll tell ye what it is neighbours said mrs howden i'll never believe scotland is scotland any more 
if our kindly scots sit down with the affront they have given us this day it is not only the blood that is shed but the blood that might have been shed that's required at our hands there was my daughter's ween little epi dadel my own ye can miss grizzle had played the truant from the school as bairns will do ye can mr butler and for which interjected mr butler they should be soundly scourged by their well-wishers and had just croopen to the gallows foot to see the hanging as was natural for a ween and what for mightna had she been shot as well as the rest of em and where would we have been then i wonder how queen carolyn if her name be carolyn would have liked to have had one of her own bairns in suck a venture report says answered butler that such a circumstance would not have distressed her majesty beyond endurance ah well said mrs howden the sum o the matter is that were i a man i would have a mans of jock porteous be the upshot what like of it if all the carls and carlins in england had sworn to the naysay i would claw down the tolbooth door with my nails said miss grizzle but i would be at him ye may be very right ladies said butler but i would not advise you to speak so loud speak exclaimed both the ladies together there will be nothing else spoken about from the way-house to the water-gate till this is either ended or mended the females now departed to their respective places of abode plum demus joined the other two gentlemen in drinking their meridian a bumper dram of brandy as they passed the well-known low-browed shop in the lawn market where they were wont to take that refreshment mr plumdemus then departed towards his shop and mr butler who happened to have some particular occasion for the reign of an old bridal the truants of that busy day could have anticipated its application walked down the lawn market with mr saddletree each talking as he could get a word thrust in the one on the laws of scotland the other on those of syntax and neither listening to a word which his companion uttered End of chapter third chapter fourth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah elsewhere he could write will lay down the law but in his house was meek as is a daw davy lindsay there has been jock driver the carrier here spearing about his new grath said mrs saddletree to her husband as he crossed his threshold not with the purpose by any means of consulting him upon his own affairs but merely to intimate by a gentle recapitulation how much duty she had gone through in his absence well replied bartolin and deigned not a word more and the laird of girdingburst has had his running footman here and called himself he's a civil pleasant young gentleman to see when the broidered saddle-cloth for his sorrel horse will be ready for he wants it again the kelso races well a will replied bartolin as laconically as before and his lordship the earl of blazonbury lord flash and flame is like to be clean daft that the harness for the six flanders mirrors with the crests coronets housings and mountings conform are no sent home according to promise given well 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 good wife said saddletree if he gangs daft we'll have him cognosed it's all very well it's well that ye think say 
mr saddletree answered his helpmate rather nettled at the indifference with which her report was received there's many and would have thought themselves affronted if so many customers had called and nobody to answer them but women folk for all the lads were off as soon as your back was turned to see porteous hanged that might be counted upon and say you know being at home houts mrs saddletree said bartolin with an air of consequence dinna deave me with your nonsense i was under the necessity of being elsewhere non omnia as mr crossmeloof said when he was called by two macers at once non omnia possimus pessimus possimus i ken our law latin offends mr butler's ears but it means nobody and it were the lord president himself can do twa turns at once very right mr saddletree answered his careful helpmate with a sarcastic smile and no doubt it's a decent thing to leave your wife to look after young gentlemen's saddles and bridles when ye gang to see a man that never did ye nay ill raxing a halter woman said saddletree assuming an elevated tone to which the meridian had somewhat contributed desist i say forbear from intermitting with affairs thou canst not understand do you think i was born to sit here brogging an elshin through bend leather when sick men as duncan forbes and that other arniston child there without muckle greater parts if the close head speak true than myself mon be presidents and king's advocates no doubt and what but they whereas were favour equally distribute as in the days of the white wallace i ken nothing we would have gotten by the white wallace said mrs saddletree unless as i have heard the old folk tell they fought in those days with bend leather guns and then it's a chance but what if he had bought them he might have forgot to pay for them and as for the greatness of your parts bartley the folk in the close head mon can mare about them than i do if they make sick a report of them i tell ye woman said saddletree in high dudgeon that ye can nothing about these matters in sir william wallace's days there was nay man pinned down to sick a slavish work as a saddler's for they got any leather graith they had use for ready-made out of holland well said butler who was like many of his profession something of a humorist and dry joker if that be the case mr saddletree i think we have changed for the better since we make our own harness and only import our lawyers from holland tis over true mr butler answered bartolin with a sigh if i had had the luck or rather if my father had had the sense to send me to leyden and utrecht to learn the substitutes and pandects you mean the institutes justinian's institutes mr saddletree said butler institutes and substitutes are synonymous words mr butler and used indifferently as such in deeds of telsey as you may see in balfour's practiques or dallas of st martin's styles i understand these things pretty well i thank god but i own i should have studied in holland to comfort you you might not have been further forward than you are now mr saddletree replied mr butler for our scottish advocates are an aristocratic race their brass is of the right corinthian quality and non contigit a dire corinthum aha mr saddletree and aha mr butler 
rejoined bartolin upon whom as may be well supposed the jest was lost and all but the sound of the words ye said a glyph sin it was quivis and now i heard ye say quivis with my own ears as plain as ever i heard a word at the forebar give me your patience mr saddletree and i'll explain the discrepancy in three words said butler as pedantic in his own department though with infinitely more judgment and learning as bartolin was in his self-assumed profession of the law give me your patience for a moment you'll grant that the nominative case is that by which a person or thing is nominated or designed and which may be called the primary case all others being formed from it by alterations of the termination in the learned languages and by prepositions in our modern babylonian jargons you'll grant me that i suppose mr saddletree i dinna ken whether i will or no ad avisandum ye can nobody should be in a hurry to make admissions either in point of law or in point of fact said saddletree looking or endeavouring to look as if he understood what was said and the dative case continued butler i ken what a tutor dative is said saddletree readily enough the dative case resumed the grammarian is that in which anything is given or assigned as properly belonging to a person or thing you cannot deny that i am sure i am sure i'll no grant it though said saddletree then what the devil do you take the nominative and the dative cases to be said butler hastily and surprised at once out of his decency of expression and accuracy of pronunciation i'll tell you that at leisure mr butler said saddletree with a very knowing look i'll take a day to see and answer every article of your condescendence and then i'll hold you to confess or deny as accords come come mr saddletree said his wife we'll have no confessions and condescendences here let them deal in that sort of wares where they are paid for them they suit the like of us as all as a demipeak saddle would suit a draught ox aha said mr butler optet aphipia bas piger nothing new under the sun but it was a fair hit of mrs saddletree however and it would far better become ye mr saddletree continued his helpmate since ye say ye have skill of the law to try if ye can do anything for effie deans poor thing she's lying up in the toll-booth yonder cold and hungry and comfortless a servant lass of ours mr butler and as innocent a lass to my thinking and as useful in the shop when mr saddletree gains out and you're aware he's seldom at home when there's any of the plea-houses open poor effie used to help me to tumble the bundles of barkened leather up and down and range out the goods and suit a body's humours and troth she could i please the customers with her answers for she was i civil and a bonnier lass wasna in old reeky and when folk were hasty and unreasonable she would serve them better than me that am no so young as i have been mr butler and a wee bit short in the temper into the bargain for when there's over many folks crying on me at once and none but a tongue to answer them folk mon speak hastily or they'll never get through their work so i miss effie daily de dia in diem added saddletree i think said butler after a good deal of hesitation i have seen the girl in the shop a modest-looking fair-haired girl ay ay that's just poor effie 
said her mistress how she was abandoned to herself or whether she was sackless of the sinful deed god in heaven knows but if she's been guilty she's been sore tempted and i would almost take my bible oath she hasna been herself at the time butler had by this time become much agitated he fidgeted up and down the shop and showed the greatest agitation that a person of such strict decorum could be supposed to give way to was not this girl he said the daughter of david deans that had the parks at st leonard's taken and has she not a sister in troth she has poor jeanie deans ten years older than herself she was here greeting a wee while since about her titty and what could i say to her but that she behooved to come and speak to mr saddletree when he was at home it wasna that i thought mr saddletree could do her or any other body muckle good or ill but it would i serve to keep the poor thing's heart up for a wee while and let sorrow come when sorrow mine you're mistaken though good wife said saddletree scornfully for i could have given her great satisfaction i could have proved to her that her sister was indicted upon the statute sixteen hundred and ninety chapter one for the mere ready prevention of child murder for concealing her pregnancy and giving no account of the child which she had borne i hope said butler i trust in a gracious god that she can clear herself and so do i mr butler replied mrs saddletree i am sure i would have answered for her as my own daughter but weighs my heart i had been tender all the summer and scarce over the door of my room for twelve weeks and as for mr saddletree he might be in a lying hospital and never find out what the woman came there for so i could see little or nothing of her or i would have had the truth of her situation out of her i's warrant ye but we all think her sister mine be able to speak something to clear her the hale parliament house said saddletree was speaking of nothing else till this job of porteus's put it out of head tis a beautiful point of presumptive murder and there's been none like it in the justiciar court since the case of lucky smith the howdy that suffered in the year sixteen hundred and seventy nine but what's the matter with you mr butler said the good woman ye are looking as white as a sheet will ye take a dram by no means said butler compelling himself to speak i walked in from dumfries yesterday and this is a warm day sit down said mrs saddletree laying hands on him kindly and rest ye ye'll kill yourself man at that rate and are we to wish you joy of gettin the school mr butler yes no i do not know answered the young man vaguely but mrs saddletree kept him to point partly out of real interest partly from curiosity ye dinna ken whether ye are to get the free school of dumfries or no after hinging on and teaching it all the summer no mrs saddletree i am not to have it replied butler more collectedly the laird of black at the bane had a natural son bred to the kirk that the presbytery could not be prevailed upon to license and so ay ye need say no more about it if there was a laird that had a poor kinsman or a bastard that it would suit there's enough said and ye're even come back to liberton to wait for dead men's shoon and for as frail as mr whackbairn is he may live as long as you that are his assistant and successor very like replied butler with a sigh i do not know if i should wish it otherwise 
no doubt it's a very vexing thing continued the good lady to be in that dependent station and you that have right and title to so muckle better i wonder how ye bear these crosses quos diliget castiget answered butler even the pagan seneca could see an advantage in affliction the heathens had their philosophy and the jews their revelation mrs saddletree and they endured their distresses in their day christians have a better dispensation than either but doubtless he stopped and sighed i ken what ye mean said mrs saddletree looking toward her husband there's whiles we lose patience in spite of both book and bible but ye are no gone away and looking so poorly ye'll stay and take some kale with us mr saddletree laid aside balfour's practiques his favourite study and much good may it do him to join in his wife's hospitable importunity but the teacher declined all entreaty and took his leave upon the spot there's something in all this said mrs saddletree looking after him as he walked up the street i wonder what makes mr butler so distressed about effie's misfortune there was no acquaintance atween them that ever i saw or heard of but they were neighbours when david deans was on the laird of drumby dyke's land mr butler would ken her father or some of her folk get up mr saddletree ye have set yourself down on the very breechum that wants stitching and here's little willie the prentice ye little rin there out devil that ye are what takes you raking through the gutters to see folk hang it how would ye like when it comes to be your own chance as i winna ensure ye if ye dinna mend your manners and what are ye maundering and greeting for as if a word were breaking your bones get in by and be a better bairn another time and tell peggy to give ye a bicker of broth for ye'll be as gleg as a gled i's warrant ye it's a fatherless bairn mr saddletree and motherless whilk in some cases may be war and any would take care of him if they could it's a christian duty very true good wife said saddletree in reply we are in loco parentis to him during his years of pupillarity and i have had thoughts of applying to the court for a commission as factor loco tutoris seeing there is no tutor nominate and the tutor at law declines to act but only i fear the expense of the procedure would not be in rem versum for i am not aware if willie has any effects whereof to assume the administration he concluded this sentence with a self-important cough as one who has laid down the law in an indisputable manner effects said mrs saddletree what effects has the poor ween he was in rags when his mother died and the blue polony that effie made for him out of an old mantle of my own was the first decent dress the bairn ever had on poor effie can ye tell me now really with all your law will her life be in danger mr saddletree when they are na able to prove that ever there was a bairn eva why said mr saddletree delighted at having for once in his life seen his wife's attention arrested by a topic of legal discussion why there are two sorts of murdrum or murdragium or what you populariter at vulgariser call murther i mean there are many sorts for there's your murthrum per vigilius et insidious and your murthrum under trust i am sure replied his moiety that murther by trust is the way that the gentry murther us merchants and whiles make us shut the booth up 
but that has nothing to do with effie's misfortune the case of effie or euphemia deans resumed saddletree is one of those cases of murder presumptive that is a murder of the law's inferring or construction being derived from certain indicia or grounds of suspicion so that said the good woman unless poor effie has communicated her situation she'll be hanged by the neck if the bairn was stillborn or if it be alive at this moment assuredly said saddletree it being a statute made by our sovereign lord and lady to prevent the horrid delect of bringing forth children in secret the crime is rather a favourite of the law this species of murther being one of its own creation then if the law makes murders said mrs saddletree the law should be hanged for them or if they would hang a lawyer instead the country would find no fault a summons to their frugal dinner interrupted the farther progress of the conversation which was otherwise like to take a turn much less favourable to the science of jurisprudence and its professors than mr bartolin saddletree the fond admirer of both had at its opening anticipated End of chapter fourth chapter fifth of the heart of mid lothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah but up then raise all edinburgh they all rose up by thousands three johnny armstrong's good night butler on his departure from the sign of the golden nag went in quest of a friend of his connected with the law of whom he wished to make particular inquiries concerning the circumstances in which the unfortunate young woman mentioned in the last chapter was placed having as the reader has probably already conjectured reasons much deeper than those dictated by mere humanity for interesting himself in her fate he found the person he sought absent from home and was equally unfortunate in one or two other calls which he made upon acquaintances whom he hoped to interest in her story but everybody was for the moment stark mad on the subject of porteous and engaged busily in attacking or defending the measures of government in reprieving him and the ardour of dispute had excited such universal thirst that half the young lawyers and writers together with their very clerks the class whom butler was looking after had adjoined the debate to some favourite tavern it was computed by an experienced arithmetician that there was as much twopenny ale consumed on the discussion as would have floated a first-rate man-of-war butler wandered about until it was dusk resolving to take that opportunity of visiting the unfortunate young woman when his doing so might be least observed for he had his own reasons for avoiding the remarks of mrs saddletree whose shop door opened at no great distance from that of the jail though on the opposite or south side of the street and a little higher up he passed therefore through the narrow and partly covered passage leading from the northwest end of the parliament square he stood now before the gothic entrance of the ancient prison which as is well known to all men rears its ancient front in the very middle of the high street forming as it were the termination to a huge pile of buildings called the luckin booths which for some inconceivable reason our ancestors had jammed into the midst of the principal street of the town 
leaving for passage a narrow street on the north and on the south into which the prison opens a narrow crooked lane winding betwixt the high and sombre walls of the tolbooth and the adjacent houses on the one side and the buttresses and projections of the old cathedral upon the other to give some gaiety to this sombre passage well known by the name of the crames a number of little booths or shops after the fashion of cobbler's stalls are plastered as it were against the gothic projections and abutments so that it seemed as if the traders had occupied with nests bearing the same proportion to the building every buttress and coin of vantage as the martlet did in macbeth's castle of later years these booths have degenerated into mere toy shops where the little loiterers chiefly interested in such wares are tempted to linger enchanted by the rich display of hobby horses babies and dutch toys arranged in artful and gay confusion yet half scared by the cross looks of the withered pantaloon or spectacled old lady by whom these tempting stores are watched and superintended but in the times we write of the hosiers the glovers the hatters the mercers the milliners and all who dealt in the miscellaneous wares now termed haberdashers goods were to be found in this narrow alley to return from our digression butler found the outer turnkey a tall thin old man with long silver hair in the act of locking the outward door of the jail he addressed himself to this person and asked admittance to effie deans confined upon accusation of child murder the turnkey looked at him earnestly and civilly touching his hat out of respect to butler's black coat and clerical appearance replied it was impossible any one could be admitted at present you shut up earlier than usual probably on account of captain porteous's affair said butler the turnkey with the true mystery of a person in office gave two grave nods and withdrawing from the wards a ponderous key of about two feet in length he proceeded to shut a strong plate of steel which folded down above the keyhole and was secured by a steel spring and catch butler stood still instinctively while the door was made fast and then looking at his watch walked briskly up the street muttering to himself almost unconsciously porta adversa ingens solidoc automante columnae vis ut nulla verum non ipsi excindere ferro solicole valiant stat feria turris ad aris etc dryden's virgil book six wide is the fronting gate and raised on high with adamantine columns threats the sky vain is the force of man and heavens as vain to crush the pillars which the pile sustain sublime on these a tower of steel is reared having wasted half an hour more in a second fruitless attempt to find his legal friend and adviser he thought it time to leave the city and return to his place of residence in a small village about two miles and a half to the southward of edinburgh the metropolis was at this time surrounded by a high wall with battlements and flanking projections at some intervals and the access was through gates called in the scottish language ports which were regularly shut at night a small fee to the keepers would indeed procure egress and ingress at any time through a wicket left for that purpose in the large gate but it was of some importance 
to a man so poor as butler to avoid even this slight pecuniary mulct and fearing the hour of shutting the gates might be near he made for that to which he found himself nearest although by doing so he somewhat lengthened his walk homewards bristow port was that by which his direct road lay but the west port which leads out of the grass market was the nearest of the city gates to the place where he found himself and to that therefore he directed his course he reached the port in ample time to pass the circuit of the walls and entered a suburb called portsburg chiefly inhabited by the lower order of citizens and mechanics here he was unexpectedly interrupted he had not gone far from the gate before he heard the sound of a drum and to his great surprise met a number of persons sufficient to occupy the whole front of the street and form a considerable mass behind moving with great speed towards the gate he had just come from and having in front of them a drum beating to arms while he considered how he should escape a party assembled as it might be presumed for no lawful purpose they came full on him and stopped him are you a clergyman one questioned him butler replied that he was in orders but was not a placed minister it's mr butler from liberton said a voice from behind he'll discharge the duty as well as any man you must turn back with us sir said the first speaker in a tone civil but peremptory for what purpose gentlemen said mr butler i live at some distance from town the roads are unsafe by night you will do me a serious injury by stopping me you shall be sent safely home no man shall touch a hair of your head but you must and shall come along with us but to what purpose or end gentlemen said butler i hope you will be so civil as to explain that to me you shall know that in good time come along for come you must by force or fair means and i warn you to look neither to the right hand nor the left and to take no notice of any man's face but consider all that is passing before you as a dream i would it were a dream i could awaken from said butler to himself but having no means to oppose the violence with which he was threatened he was compelled to turn round and march in front of the rioters two men partly supporting and partly holding him during this parley the insurgents had made themselves masters of the west port rushing upon the waiters so the people were called who had the charge of the gates and possessing themselves of the keys they bolted and barred the folding doors and commanded the person whose duty it usually was to secure the wicket of which they did not understand the fastenings the man terrified at an incident so totally unexpected was unable to perform his usual office and gave the matter up after several attempts the rioters who seemed to have come prepared for every emergency called for torches by the light of which they nailed up the wicket with long nails which it seemed probable they had provided on purpose while this was going on butler could not even if he had been willing avoid making remarks on the individuals who seemed to lead this singular mob the torchlight while it fell on their forms and left him in the shade gave him an opportunity to do so without their observing him several of those who seemed most active were dressed in sailors jackets trousers and sea caps others in large loose-bodied greatcoats and slouched hats and there were several who judging from their dress should have been called women 
whose rough deep voices uncommon size and masculine deportment and mode of walking forbade them being so interpreted they moved as if by some well-concerted plan of arrangement they had signals by which they knew and nicknames by which they distinguished each other butler remarked that the name of wildfire was used among them to which one stout amazon seemed to reply the rioters left a small party to observe the west port and directed the waiters as they valued their lives to remain within their lodge and make no attempt for that night to repossess themselves of the gate they then moved with rapidity along the low street called the cowgate the mob of the city everywhere rising at the sound of their drum and joining them when the multitude arrived at the cowgate port they secured it with as little opposition as the former made it fast and left a small party to observe it it was afterwards remarked as a striking instance of prudence and precaution singularly combined with audacity that the parties left to guard those gates did not remain stationary on their posts but flitted to and fro keeping so near the gates as to see that no efforts were made to open them yet not remaining so long as to have their persons closely observed the mob at first only about one hundred strong now amounted to thousands and were increasing every moment they divided themselves so as to ascend with more speed the various narrow lanes which led up from the cowgate to the high street and still beating to arms as they went and calling on all true scotsmen to join them they now filled the principal street of the city the netherbow port might be called the temple bar of edinburgh as intersecting the high street at its termination it divided edinburgh properly so called from the suburb called the canongate as temple bar separates london from westminster it was of the utmost importance to the rioters to possess themselves of this pass because there was quartered in the cannon gate at that time a regiment of infantry commanded by colonel moyle which might have occupied the city by advancing through this gate and would possess the power of totally defeating their purpose the leaders therefore hastened to the netherbow port which they secured in the same manner and with as little trouble as the other gates leaving a party to watch it strong in proportion to the importance of the post the next object of these hardy insurgents was at once to disarm the city guard and to procure arms for themselves for scarce any weapons but staves and bludgeons had been yet seen among them the guard-house was a long low ugly building removed in seventeen eighty seven which to a fanciful imagination might have suggested the idea of a long black snail crawling up the middle of the high street and deforming its beautiful esplanade this formidable insurrection had been so unexpected that there were no more than the ordinary sergeant's guard of the city corps upon duty even these were without any supply of powder and ball and sensible enough what had raised the storm and which way it was rolling could hardly be supposed very desirous to expose themselves by a valiant defence to the animosity of so numerous and desperate a mob to whom they were on the present occasion much more than usually obnoxious there was a sentinel upon guard who that one town guard soldier might do his duty on that eventful evening presented his piece and desired the foremost of the rioters to stand off the young amazon 
whom butler had observed particularly active sprung upon the soldier seized his musket and after a struggle succeeded in wrenching it from him and throwing him down on the causeway one or two soldiers who endeavoured to turn out to the support of their sentinel were in the same manner seized and disarmed and the mob without difficulty possessed themselves of the guard-house disarming and turning out of doors the rest of the men on duty it was remarked that notwithstanding the city soldiers had been the instruments of the slaughter which this riot was designed to revenge no ill usage or even insult was offered to them it seemed as if the vengeance of the people disdained to stoop at any head meaner than that which they considered as the source and origin of their injuries on possessing themselves of the guard the first act of the multitude was to destroy the drums by which they supposed an alarm might be conveyed to the garrison in the castle for the same reason they now silenced their own which was beaten by a young fellow son to the drummer of portsburg whom they had forced upon that service their next business was to distribute among the boldest of the rioters the guns bayonets partisans halberts and battle or lockaber axes until this period the principal rioters had preserved silence on the ultimate object of their rising as being that which all knew but none expressed now however having accomplished all the preliminary parts of their design they raised a tremendous shout of porteous porteous to the tollbooth to the tollbooth they proceeded with the same prudence when the object seemed to be nearly in their grasp as they had done hitherto when the success was more dubious a strong party of the rioters drawn up in front of the luckin booths and facing down the street prevented all access from the eastward and the west end of the defile formed by the luckin booths was secured in the same manner so that the toll booth was completely surrounded and those who undertook the task of breaking it open effectually secured against the risk of interruption the magistrates in the meanwhile had taken the alarm and assembled in a tavern with the purpose of raising some strength to subdue the rioters the deacons or presidents of the trades were applied to but declared there was little chance of their authority being respected by the craftsmen where it was the object to save a man so obnoxious mr lindsay member of the parliament for the city volunteered the perilous task of carrying a verbal message from the lord provost to colonel moyle the commander of the regiment lying in the cannon gate requesting him to force the netherbow port and enter the city to put down the tumult but mr lindsay declined to charge himself with any written order which if found on his person by an enraged mob might have cost him his life and the issue of the application was that colonel moyle having no written requisition from the civil authorities and having the fate of porteous before his eyes as an example of the severe construction put by a jury on the proceedings of military men acting on their own responsibility declined to encounter the risk to which the provost's verbal communication invited him more than one messenger was dispatched by different ways to the castle to require the commanding officer to march down his troops to fire a few cannon shot or even to throw a shell among the mob for the purpose of clearing the streets 
but so strict and watchful were the various patrols whom the rioters had established in different parts of the streets that none of the emissaries of the magistrates could reach the gate of the castle they were however turned back without either injury or insult and with nothing more of menace than was necessary to deter them from again attempting to accomplish their errand the same vigilance was used to prevent everybody of the higher and those which in this case might be deemed the more suspicious orders of society from appearing in the street and observing the movements or distinguishing the persons of the rioters every person in the garb of a gentleman was stopped by small parties of two or three of the mob who partly exhorted partly required of them that they should return to the place from whence they came many a quadrille table was spoilt that memorable evening for the sedan chairs of ladies even of the highest rank were interrupted in their passage from one point to another in spite of the laced footmen and blazing flambeau this was uniformly done with a deference and attention to the feelings of the terrified females which could hardly have been expected from the vedettes of a mob so desperate those who stopped the chair usually made the excuse that there was much disturbance on the streets and that it was absolutely necessary for the lady's safety that the chair should turn back they offered themselves to escort the vehicles which they had thus interrupted in their progress from the apprehension probably that some of those who had casually united themselves to the riot might disgrace their systematic and determined plan of vengeance by those acts of general insult and license which are common on similar occasions persons are yet living who remember to have heard from the mouths of ladies thus interrupted on their journey in the manner we have described that they were escorted to their lodgings by the young men who stopped them and even handed out of their chairs with a polite attention far beyond what was consistent with their dress which was apparently that of journeymen mechanics a near relation of the author's used to tell of having been stopped by the rioters and escorted home in the manner described on reaching her own home one of her attendants in the appearance a baxter a baker's lad handed her out of her chair and took leave with a bow which in the lady's opinion argued breeding that could hardly be learned at the oven's mouth it seemed as if the conspirators like those who assassinated cardinal Bethune in former days had entertained the opinion that the work about which they went was a judgment of heaven which though unsanctioned by the usual authorities ought to be proceeded in with order and gravity while their outposts continued thus vigilant and suffered themselves neither from fear nor curiosity to neglect that part of the duty assigned to them and while the main guards to the east and west secured them against interruption a select body of the rioters thundered at the door of the jail and demanded instant admission no one answered for the outer keeper had prudently made his escape with the keys at the commencement of the riot and was nowhere to be found the door was instantly assailed with sledge-hammers iron crows and the coulters of ploughs already provided for the purpose with which they prized heaved and battered for some time with little effect for the door besides being of double oak planks clenched both end long and athwart with broad-headed nails was so hung and secured as to yield to no means of forcing without the expenditure of much time the rioters however appeared determined to gain admittance 
gang after gang relieved each other at the exercise for of course only a few could work at once but gang after gang retired exhausted with their violent exertions without making much progress enforcing the prison door butler had been led up near to this the principal scene of action so near indeed that he was almost deafened by the unceasing clang of the heavy forehammers against the iron-bound portal of the prison he began to entertain hopes as the task seemed protracted that the populace might give it over in despair or that some rescue might arrive to disperse them there was a moment at which the latter seemed probable the magistrates having assembled their officers and some of the citizens who were willing to hazard themselves for the public tranquillity now sallied forth from the tavern where they held their sitting and approached the point of danger their officers went before them with links and torches with a herald to read the riot act if necessary they easily drove before them the outposts and videttes of the rioters but when they approached the line of guard which the mob or rather we should say the conspirators had drawn across the street in the front of the luckenbooths they were received with an unintermitted volley of stones and on their nearer approach the pikes bayonets and lockaber axes of which the populace had possessed themselves were presented against them one of their ordinary officers a strong resolute fellow went forward seized a rioter and took from him a musket but being unsupported he was instantly thrown on his back in the street and disarmed in his turn the officer was too happy to be permitted to rise and run away without receiving any farther injury which afforded another remarkable instance of the mode in which these men had united a sort of moderation towards all others with the most inflexible inveteracy against the object of their resentment the magistrates after vain attempts to make themselves heard and obeyed possessing no means of enforcing their authority were constrained to abandon the field to the rioters and retreat in all speed from the showers of missiles that whistled around their ears the passive resistance of the tolbooth gate promised to do more to baffle the purpose of the mob than the active interference of the magistrates the heavy sledge-hammers continued to din against it without intermission and with a noise which echoed from the lofty buildings around the spot seemed enough to have alarmed the garrison in the castle it was circulated among the rioters that the troops would march down to disperse them unless they could execute their purpose without loss of time or that even without quitting the fortress the garrison might obtain the same end by throwing a bomb or two upon the street urged by such motives for apprehension they eagerly relieved each other at the labor of assailing the tolbooth door yet such was its strength that it still defied their efforts at length a voice was heard to pronounce the words try it with fire the rioters with an unanimous shout called for combustibles and as all their wishes seemed to be instantly supplied they were soon in possession of two or three empty tar-barrels a huge red glaring bonfire speedily arose close to the door of the prison sending up a tall column of smoke and flame against its antique turrets and strongly grated windows and illuminating the ferocious and wild gestures of the rioters who surrounded the place as well as the pale and anxious groups of those who from windows in the vicinage watched the progress of this alarming scene the mob fed the fire with whatever they could find fit for the purpose the flames roared and crackled among the heaps of nourishment piled on the fire and a terrible shout 
soon announced that the door had kindled and was in the act of being destroyed the fire was suffered to decay but long ere it was quite extinguished the most forward of the rioters rushed in their impatience one after another over its yet smouldering remains thick showers of sparkles rose high in the air as man after man bounded over the glowing embers and disturbed them in their passage it was now obvious to butler and all others who were present that the rioters would be instantly in possession of their victim and have it in their power to work their pleasure upon him whatever that might be End of chapter fifth chapter sixth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the evil you teach us we will execute and it shall go hard but we will better the instruction merchant of venice the unhappy object of this remarkable disturbance had been that day delivered from the apprehension of public execution and his joy was the greater as he had some reason to question whether government would have run the risk of unpopularity by interfering in his favor after he had been legally convicted by the verdict of a jury of a crime so very obnoxious relieved from this doubtful state of mind his heart was merry within him and he thought in the emphatic words of scripture on a similar occasion that surely the bitterness of death was past some of his friends however who had watched the manner and behavior of the crowd when they were made acquainted with the reprieve were of a different opinion they augured from the unusual sternness and silence with which they bore their disappointment that the populace nourished some scheme of sudden and desperate vengeance and they advised porteus to lose no time in petitioning the proper authorities that he might be conveyed to the castle under a sufficient guard to remain there in security until his ultimate fate should be determined habituated however by his office to overawe the rabble of the city porteus could not suspect them of an attempt so audacious as to storm a strong and defensible prison and despising the advice by which he might have been saved he spent the afternoon of the eventful day in giving an entertainment to some friends who visited him in jail several of whom by the indulgence of the captain of the tolbooth with whom he had an old intimacy arising from their official connection were even permitted to remain to supper with him though contrary to the rules of the jail it was therefore in the hour of unalloyed mirth when this unfortunate wretch was full of bread hot with wine and high in mistimed and ill-grounded confidence and alas with all his sins full-blown when the first distant shouts of the rioters mingled with the song of merriment and intemperance the hurried call of the jailer to the guests requiring them instantly to depart and yet his more hasty intimation that a dreadful and determined mob had possessed themselves of the city gates and guard-house were the first explanation of these fearful clamours porteus might however have eluded the fury from which the force of authority could not protect him had he thought of slipping on some disguise and leaving the prison along with his guests it is probable that the jailer might have connived at his escape or even that in the hurry of this alarming contingency he might not have observed it but porteus and his friends alike wanted presence of mind 
to suggest or execute such a plan of escape the former hastily fled from a place where their own safety seemed compromised and the latter in a state resembling stupefaction awaited in his apartment the termination of the enterprise of the rioters the cessation of the clang of the instruments with which they had at first attempted to force the door gave him momentary relief the flattering hopes that the military had marched into the city either from the castle or from the suburbs and that the rioters were intimidated and dispersing were soon destroyed by the broad and glaring light of the flames which illuminating through the grated window every corner of his apartment plainly showed that the mob determined on their fatal purpose had adopted a means of forcing entrance equally desperate and certain the sudden glare of light suggested to the stupefied and astonished object of popular hatred the possibility of concealment or escape to rush to the chimney to ascend it at the risk of suffocation were the only means which seemed to have occurred to him but his progress was speedily stopped by one of those iron gratings which are for the sake of security usually placed across the vents of buildings designed for imprisonment the bars however which impeded his farther progress served to support him in the situation which he had gained and he seized them with the tenacious grasp of one who esteemed himself clinging to his last hope of existence the lurid light which had filled the apartment lowered and died away the sound of shouts was heard within the walls and on the narrow and winding stair which eased within one of the turrets gave access to the upper apartments of the prison the huzza of the rioters was answered by a shout wild and desperate as their own the cry namely of the imprisoned felons who expecting to be liberated in the general confusion welcomed the mob as their deliverers by some of these the apartment of porteus was pointed out to his enemies the obstacle of the lock and bolts was soon overcome and from his hiding-place the unfortunate man heard his enemies search every corner of the apartment with oaths and maledictions which would but shock the reader if we recorded them but which served to prove could it have admitted of doubt the settled purpose of soul with which they sought his destruction a place of concealment so obvious to suspicion and scrutiny as that which porteus had chosen could not long screen him from detection he was dragged from his lurking place with a violence which seemed to argue an intention to put him to death on the spot more than one weapon was directed towards him when one of the rioters the same whose female disguise had been particularly noticed by butler interfered in an authoritative tone are ye mad he said or would ye execute an act of justice as if it were a crime and a cruelty this sacrifice will lose half its savour if we do not offer it at the very horns of the altar we will have him die where a murderer should die on the common gibbet we will have him die where he spilled the blood of so many innocents a loud shout of applause followed the proposal and the cry to the gallows with the murderer to the grass market with him echoed on all hands let no man hurt him continued the speaker let him make his peace with god if he can we will not kill both his soul and his body what time did he give better folk for preparing their account answered several voices let us meet to him with the same measure he measured to them but the opinion of the spokesman 
better suited the temper of those he addressed a temper rather stubborn than impetuous sedate though ferocious and desirous of colouring their cruel and revengeful action with a show of justice and moderation for an instant this man quitted the prisoner whom he consigned to a selected guard with instructions to permit him to give his money and property to whomever he pleased a person confined in the jail for debt received this last deposit from the trembling hand of the victim who was at the same time permitted to make some other brief arrangements to meet his approaching fate the felons and all others who wished to leave the jail were now at full liberty to do so not that their liberation made any part of the settled purpose of the rioters but it followed as almost a necessary consequence of forcing the jail doors with wild cries of jubilee they joined the mob or disappeared among the narrow lanes to seek out the hidden receptacles of vice and infamy where they were accustomed to lurk and conceal themselves from justice two persons a man about fifty years old and a girl about eighteen were all who continued within the fatal walls excepting two or three debtors who probably saw no advantage in attempting their escape the persons we have mentioned remained in the strong room of the prison now deserted by all others one of their late companions in misfortune called out to the man to make his escape in the tone of an acquaintance run for it ratcliffe the road's clear it may be so willie answered ratcliffe composedly but i have taken a fancy to leave off trade and set up for an honest man stay there and be hanged then for a donnered old devil said the other and ran down the prison stair the person in female attire whom we have distinguished as one of the most active rioters was about the same time at the ear of the young woman flee effie flee was all he had time to whisper she turned towards him an eye of mingled fear affection and upbraiding all contending with a sort of stupefied surprise he again repeated flee effie flee for the sake of all that's good and dear to you again she gazed on him but was unable to answer a loud noise was now heard and the name of madge wildfire was repeatedly called from the bottom of the staircase i am coming i am coming said the person who answered to that appellative and then reiterating hastily for god's sake for your own sake for my sake flee or they'll take your life he left the strong room the girl gazed after him for a moment and then faintly muttering better time life since tint is good fame she sunk her head upon her hand and remained seemingly unconscious as a statue of the noise and tumult which passed around her that tumult was now transferred from the inside to the outside of the tolbooth the mob had brought their destined victim forth and were about to conduct him to the common place of execution which they had fixed as the scene of his death the leader whom they distinguished by the name of madge wildfire had been summoned to assist at the procession by the impatient shouts of his confederates i will ensure you five hundred pounds said the unhappy man grasping wildfire's hand five hundred pounds for to save my life the other answered in the same undertone and returning his grasp with one equally convulsive five hundred weight of coined gold should not save you remember wilson a deep pause of a minute ensued when wildfire added in a more composed tone make your peace with heaven where is the clergyman 
butler who in great terror and anxiety had been detained within a few yards of the tolbooth door to wait the event of the search after porteus was now brought forward and commanded to walk by the prisoner's side and to prepare him for immediate death his answer was a supplication that the rioters would consider what they did you are neither judges nor jury said he you cannot have by the laws of god or man power to take away the life of a human creature however deserving he may be of death if it is murder even in a lawful magistrate to execute an offender otherwise than in the place time and manner which the judge's sentence prescribes what must it be in you who have no warrant for interference but your own wills in the name of him who is all mercy show mercy to this unhappy man and do not dip your hands in his blood nor rush into the very crime which you are desirous of avenging cut your sermon short you are not in your pulpit answered one of the rioters if we hear more of your clavers said another we are like to hang you up beside him peace hush said wildfire do the good man no harm he discharges his conscience and i like him the better then he addressed butler now sir we have patiently heard you and we just wish you to understand in the way of answer that you may as well argue to the ashler work and iron stanchels of the tolbooth as think to change our purpose blood must have blood we have sworn to each other by the deepest oaths ever were pledged that porteus shall die the death he deserves so richly therefore speak no more to us but prepare him for death as well as the briefness of his change will permit they had suffered the unfortunate porteus to put on his nightgown and slippers as he had thrown off his coat and shoes in order to facilitate his attempt escape up the chimney in this garb he was now mounted on the hands of two of the rioters clasped together so as to form what is called in scotland the king's cushion butler was placed close to his side and repeatedly urged to perform a duty always the most painful which can be imposed on a clergyman deserving of the name and now rendered more so by the peculiar and horrid circumstances of the criminal's case porteus at first uttered some supplications for mercy but when he found that there was no chance that these would be attended to his military education and the natural stubbornness of his disposition combined to support his spirits are you prepared for this dreadful end said butler in a faltering voice oh turn to him in whose eyes time and space have no existence and to whom a few minutes are as a lifetime and a lifetime as a minute i believe i know what you would say answered porteus sullenly i was bred a soldier if they will murder me without time let my sins as well as my blood lie at their door who was it said the stern voice of wildfire that said to wilson at this very spot when he could not pray owing to the galling agony of his fetters that his pains would soon be over i say to you to take your own tale home and if you cannot profit by the good man's lessons blame not them that are still more merciful to you than you were to others the procession now moved forward with a slow and determined pace it was enlightened by many blazing links and torches for the actors of this work were so far from affecting any secrecy on the occasion that they seemed even to court observation their principal leaders kept close to the person of the prisoner whose pallid yet stubborn features 
were seen distinctly by the torchlight as his person was raised considerably above the concourse which thronged around him those who bore swords muskets and battle-axes marched on each side as if forming a regular guard to the procession the windows as they went along were filled with the inhabitants whose slumbers had been broken by this unusual disturbance some of the spectators muttered accents of encouragement but in general they were so much appalled by a sight so strange and audacious that they looked on with a sort of stupefied astonishment no one offered by act or word the slightest interruption the rioters on their part continued to act with the same air of deliberate confidence and security which had marked all their proceedings when the object of their resentment dropped one of his slippers they stopped sought for it and replaced it upon his foot with great deliberation as they descended the bow towards the fatal spot where they designed to complete their purpose it was suggested that there should be a rope kept in readiness for this purpose the booth of a man who dealt in cordage was forced open a coil of rope fit for their purpose was selected to serve as a halter and the dealer next morning found that a guinea had been left on his counter in exchange so anxious were the perpetrators of this daring action to show that they meditated not the slightest wrong or infraction of law excepting so far as porteus was himself concerned leading or carrying along with them in this determined and regular manner the object of their vengeance they at length reached the place of common execution the scene of his crime and destined spot of his sufferings several of the rioters if they should not rather be described as conspirators endeavoured to remove the stone which filled up the socket in which the end of the fatal tree was sunk when it was erected for its fatal purpose others sought for the means of constructing a temporary gibbet the place in which the gallows itself was deposited being reported too secure to be forced without much loss of time butler endeavoured to avail himself of the delay afforded by these circumstances to turn the people from their desperate design for god's sake he exclaimed remember it is the image of your creator which you are about to deface in the person of this unfortunate man wretched as he is and wicked as he may be he has a share in every promise of scripture and you cannot destroy him in impenitence without blotting his name from the book of life do not destroy soul and body give time for preparation what time had they returned a stern voice whom he murdered on this very spot the laws both of god and man call for his death but what my friends insisted butler with a generous disregard to his own safety what hath constituted you his judges we are not his judges replied the same person he has been already judged and condemned by lawful authority we are those whom heaven and our righteous anger have stirred up to execute judgment when a corrupt government would have protected a murderer i am none said the unfortunate porteus that which you charge upon me fell out in self-defence in the lawful exercise of my duty away with him away with him was the general cry why do you trifle away time in making a gallows that dyster's pole is good enough for the homicide the unhappy man was forced to his fate 
with remorseless rapidity butler separated from him by the press escaped the last horrors of his struggles unnoticed by those who had hitherto detained him as a prisoner he fled from the fatal spot without much caring in what direction his course lay a loud shout proclaimed the stern delight with which the agents of this deed regarded its completion butler then at the opening into the low street called the cowgate cast back a terrified glance and by the red and dusky light of the torches he could discern a figure wavering and struggling as it hung suspended above the heads of the multitude and could even observe men striking at it with their lockaber axes and partisans the sight was of a nature to double his horror and to add wings to his flight the street down which the fugitive ran opens to one of the eastern ports or gates of the city butler did not stop till he reached it but found it still shut he waited nearly an hour walking up and down in inexpressible perturbation of mind at length he ventured to call out and rouse the attention of the terrified keepers of the gate who now found themselves at liberty to resume their office without interruption butler requested them to open the gate they hesitated he told them his name and occupation he is a preacher said one i have heard him preach in haddo's hole a fine preaching has he been at the night said another but maybe least said is soonest mended opening then the wicket of the main gate the keepers suffered butler to depart who hastened to carry his horror and fear beyond the walls of edinburgh his first purpose was instantly to take the road homeward but other fears and cares connected with the news he had learned in that remarkable day induced him to linger in the neighbourhood of edinburgh until daybreak more than one group of persons passed him as he was whiling away the hours of darkness that yet remained whom from the stifled tones of their discourse the unwonted hour when they travelled and the hasty pace at which they walked he conjectured to have been engaged in the late fatal transaction certainly it was that the sudden and total dispersion of the rioters when their vindictive purpose was accomplished seemed not the least remarkable feature of this singular affair in general whatever may be the impelling motive by which a mob is at first raised the attainment of their object has usually been only found to lead the way to farther excesses but not so in the present case they seemed completely satiated with the vengeance they had prosecuted with such staunch and sagacious activity when they were fully satisfied that life had abandoned their victim they dispersed in every direction throwing down the weapons which they had only assumed to enable them to carry through their purpose at daybreak there remained not the least token of the events of the night excepting the corpse of porteus which still hung suspended in the place where he had suffered and the arms of various kinds which the rioters had taken from the city guard-house which were found scattered about the streets as they had thrown them from their hands when the purpose for which they had seized them was accomplished the ordinary magistrates of the city resumed their power not without trembling at the late experience of the fragility of its tenure to march troops into the city and commence a severe inquiry into the transactions of the preceding night 
were the first marks of returning energy which they displayed but these events had been conducted on so secure and well calculated a plan of safety and secrecy that there was little or nothing learned to throw light upon the authors or principal actors in a scheme so audacious an express was dispatched to london with the tidings where they excited great indignation and surprise in the council of regency and particularly in the bosom of queen caroline who considered her own authority as exposed to contempt by the success of this singular conspiracy nothing was spoke of for some time save the measure of vengeance which should be taken not only on the actors of this tragedy so soon as they should be discovered but upon the magistrates who had suffered it to take place and upon the city which had been the scene where it was exhibited on this occasion it is still recorded in popular tradition that her majesty in the height of her displeasure told the celebrated john duke of argyle that sooner than submit to such an insult she would make scotland a hunting-field in that case madam answered that high-spirited nobleman with a profound bow i will take leave of your majesty and go down to my own country to get my hounds ready the import of the reply had more than met the ear and as most of the scottish nobility and gentry seemed actuated by the same national spirit the royal displeasure was necessarily checked in mid-volley and milder courses were recommended and adopted to some of which we may hereafter have occasion to advert End of chapter sixth chapter seventh of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah arthur's seat shall be my bed the sheets shall never be pressed by me saint anton's well shall be my drink sin my true love's forsaken me old song if i were to choose a spot from which the rising or setting sun could be seen to the greatest possible advantage it would be that wild path winding round the foot of the high belt of semicircular rocks called salisbury crags and marking the verge of the steep descent which slopes down into the glen on the southeastern side of the city of edinburgh the prospect in its general outline commands a close-built high-piled city stretching itself out beneath in a form which to a romantic imagination may be supposed to represent that of a dragon now a noble arm of the sea with its rocks isles distant shores and boundary of mountains and now a fair and fertile champagne country varied with hill dale and rock and skirted by the picturesque ridge of the pentland mountains but as the path gently circles around the base of the cliffs the prospect composed as it is of these enchanting and sublime objects changes at every step and presents them blended with or divided from each other in every possible variety which can gratify the eye and the imagination when a piece of scenery so beautiful yet so varied so exciting by its intricacy and yet so sublime is lighted up by the tints of morning or of evening and displays all that variety of shadowy depth exchanged with partial brilliancy 
which gives character even to the tamest of landscapes the effect approaches near to enchantment this path used to be my favourite evening and morning resort when engaged with a favourite author or new subject of study it is i am informed now become totally impassable a circumstance which if true reflects little credit on the taste of the good town or its leaders it was from this fascinating path the scene to me of so much delicious musing when life was young and promised to be happy that i have been unable to pass it over without an episodical description it was i say from this romantic path that butler saw the morning arise the day after the murder of porteus it was possible for him with ease to have found a much shorter road to the house to which he was directing his course and in fact that which he chose was extremely circuitous but to compose his own spirits as well as to while away the time until a proper hour for visiting the family without surprise or disturbance he was induced to extend his circuit by the foot of the rocks and to linger upon his way until the morning should be considerably advanced while now standing with his arms across and waiting the slow progress of the sun above the horizon now sitting upon one of the numerous fragments which storms had detached from the rocks above him he is meditating alternately upon the horrible catastrophe which he had witnessed and partly the melancholy and to him most interesting news which he had learned at saddletrees we shall give the reader to understand who butler was and how his fate was connected with that of effie deans the unfortunate handmaiden of the careful mrs saddletree reuben butler was of english extraction though born in scotland his grandfather was a trooper in monk's army and one of the party of dismounted dragoons which formed the forlorn hope at the storming of dundee in sixteen fifty one stephen butler called from his talents in reading and expounding scripture stephen and bible butler was a staunch independent and received in its fullest comprehension the promise that the saints should inherit the earth as hard knocks were what had chiefly fallen to his share hitherto in the division of this common property he lost not the opportunity which the storm and plunder of a commercial place afforded him to appropriate as large a share of the better things of this world as he could possibly compass it would seem that he had succeeded indifferently well for his exterior circumstances appeared in consequence of this event to have been much mended the troop to which he belonged was quartered at the village of dalkeith as forming the bodyguard of monk who in the capacity of general for the commonwealth resided in the neighbouring castle when on the eve of the restoration the general commenced his march from scotland a measure pregnant with such important consequences he new modelled his troops and more especially those immediately about his person in order that they might consist entirely of individuals devoted to himself on this occasion scripture stephen was weighed in the balance and found wanting it was supposed he felt no call to any expedition which might endanger the reign of the military sainthood and that he did not consider himself as free in conscience to join with any party which might be likely ultimately to acknowledge the interest of charles stuart the son of the last man 
as charles i was familiarly and irreverently termed by them in their common discourse as well as in their more elaborate predications and harangues as the time did not admit of cashiering such dissidents stephen butler was only advised in a friendly way to give up his horse and accoutrements to one of middleton's old troopers who possessed an accommodating conscience of a military stamp and which squared itself chiefly upon those of the colonel and paymaster as this hint came recommended by a certain sum of arrears presently payable stephen had carnal wisdom enough to embrace the proposal and with great indifference saw his old corps depart for coldstream on their route for the south to establish the tottering government of england on a new basis the zone of the ex-trooper to use horace's phrase was weighty enough to purchase a cottage and two or three fields still known by the name of beersheba within about a scottish mile of dalkeith and there did stephen establish himself with a youthful helpmate chosen out of the said village whose disposition to a comfortable settlement on this side of the grave reconciled her to the gruff manners serious temper and weather-beaten features of the martial enthusiast stephen did not long survive the falling on evil days and evil tongues of which milton in the same predicament so mournfully complains at his death his consort remained an early widow with a male child of three years old which in the sobriety wherewith it demeaned itself in the old-fashioned and even grim cast of its features and in its sententious mode of expressing itself would sufficiently have vindicated the honour of the widow of beersheba had any one thought proper to challenge the babe's descent from bible butler butler's principles had not descended to his family or extended themselves among his neighbours the heir of scotland was alien to the growth of independency however favourable to fanaticism under other colours but nevertheless they were not forgotten and a certain neighbouring laird who piqued himself upon the loyalty of his principles in the worst of times though i never heard they exposed him to more peril than that of a broken head or a night's lodging in the main guard when wine and cavalierism predominated in his upper story had found it a convenient thing to rake up all matter of accusation against the deceased stephen in this enumeration his religious principles made no small figure as indeed they must have seemed of the most exaggerated enormity to one whose own were so small and so faintly traced as to be well-nigh imperceptible in these circumstances poor widow butler was supplied with her full proportion of fines for nonconformity and all the other oppressions of the time until beersheba was fairly wrenched out of her hands and became the property of the laird who had so wantonly as it had hitherto appeared persecuted this poor forlorn woman when his purpose was fairly achieved he showed some remorse or moderation of whatever the reader may pleased to term it in permitting her to occupy her husband's cottage and cultivate on no very heavy terms a croft of land adjacent her son benjamin in the meanwhile grew up to mass a state and moved by that impulse which makes men seek marriage even when its end can only be the perpetuation of misery he wedded and brought a wife and eventually a son reuben to share the poverty of beersheba
the laird of dumby dykes had hitherto been moderate in his exactions perhaps because he was ashamed to tax too highly the miserable means of support which remained to the widow butler but when a stout active young fellow appeared as the labourer of the croft in question dumby dykes began to think so broad a pair of shoulders might bear an additional burden he regulated indeed his management of his dependents who fortunately were but few in number much upon the principle of the carters whom he observed loading their carts at a neighbouring coal-hill and who never failed to clap an additional brace of hundredweights on their burden so soon as by any means they had compassed a new horse of somewhat superior strength to that which had broken down the day before however reasonable this practice appeared to the laird of dumby dykes he ought to have observed that it may be overdone and that it infers as a matter of course the destruction and loss of both horse and cart and loading even so it befell when the additional prestations came to be demanded of benjamin butler a man of few words and few ideas but attached to beersheba with a feeling like that which a vegetable entertains to the spot in which it chances to be planted he neither remonstrated with the laird nor endeavoured to escape from him but toiling night and day to accomplish the terms of his taskmaster fell into a burning fever and died his wife did not long survive him and as if it had been the fate of his family to be left orphans our reuben butler was about the year seventeen o four to five left in the same circumstances in which his father had been placed and under the same guardianship being that of his grandmother the widow of monk's old trooper the same prospect of misery hung over the head of another tenant of this hard-hearted lord of the soil this was a tough true blue presbyterian called deans who though most obnoxious to the laird on account of principles in church and state contrived to maintain his ground upon the estate by regular payment of mail duties cane arriage carriage dry mulcher lock gowpen and knaveship and all the various exactions now commuted for money and summed up in the emphatic word rent but the years seventeen hundred and seventeen o one long remembered in scotland for dearth and general distress subdued the stout heart of the agricultural whig citations by the ground officer decrees of the baron court sequestrations poindings of outside and inside plenishing flew about his ears as fast as the tory bullets whistled around those of the covenanters at pentland bothwell brig or Ersmoss. struggle as he might and he struggled gallantly douse david deans was routed horse and foot and lay at the mercy of his grasping landlord just at the time that benjamin butler died the fate of each family was anticipated but they who prophesied their expulsion to beggary and ruin were disappointed by an accidental circumstance on the very term day when their ejection should have taken place when all their neighbours were prepared to pity and not one to assist them the minister of the parish as well as a doctor from edinburgh received a hasty summons to attend the laird of dumby dykes both were surprised for his contempt for both faculties had been pretty commonly his theme over an extra bottle 
that is to say at least once every day the leech for the soul and he for the body alighted in the court of the little old manor-house at almost the same time and when they had gazed a moment at each other with some surprise they in the same breath expressed their conviction that dumby dykes must needs be very ill indeed since he summoned them both to his presence at once ere the servant could usher them to his apartment the party was augmented by a man of law nitchell novit writing himself procurator before the sheriff court for in those days there were no solicitors this latter personage was first summoned to the apartment of the laird where after some short space the soul curer and the body curer were invited to join him dumby dykes had been by this time transported into the best bedroom used only upon occasions of death and marriage and called from the former of these occupations the dead room there were in this apartment besides the sick person himself and mr novit the son and heir of the patient a tall gawky silly-looking boy of fourteen or fifteen and a housekeeper a good buxom figure of a woman betwixt forty and fifty who had kept the keys and managed matters at dumby dykes since the lady's death it was to these attendants that dumby dykes addressed himself pretty nearly in the following words temporal and spiritual matters the care of his health and his affairs being strangely jumbled in a head which was never one of the clearest these are sair times with me gentlemen and neighbours a most as ill as at the oddy nine when i was rabbled by the collegianers they mistook me muckle they called me a papist but there was never a papist bit about me minister jock ye'll take warning it's a debt we maun all pay and there stands nitchell novit that will tell ye i was never good at paying debts in my life mr novit ye'll no forget to draw the annual rent that's due on the yearl's band if i pay debt to other folk i think they should pay it to me that equals equals jock when ye have nothing else to do ye may be eyes sticking in a tree it will be growing jock when you're sleeping my father told me some forty years since but i never found time to mind him jock never drink brandy in the morning it files the stomach sore gin ye take a morning's draught let it be aqua mirabilis jenny there makes it well doctor my breath is growing as scant as a broken-winded piper's when he has played for four-and-twenty hours at a penny wedding jenny pit the cod aneath my head but it's all needless mass john could ye think of rattling over some bit short prayer it would do me good maybe and keep some queer thoughts out of my head say something man i cannot use a prayer like a rat rhyme answered the honest clergyman and if you would have your soul redeemed like a prey from the feller laird you must needs show me your state of mind and shouldna ye ken that without my telling you answered the patient what have i been paying stipend and tend parsonage and vicarage for ever since the oddy nine and i canna get a spell of a prayer for it the only time i ever asked for one in my life gang away with your wiggery if that's all ye can do auld curate kilstoop would have read half the prayer-book to me by this time away with ye doctor let's see if ye can do anything better for me the doctor who had obtained some information in the meanwhile from the housekeeper on the state of his complaints assured him the medical art could not prolong his life many hours 
then damn mass john and you both cried the furious and intractable patience did ye come here for nothing but to tell me that ye canna help me at the pinch out with em jenny out of the house and jock my curse and the curse of cromwell go with ye if ye give them either fee or bounteth or so muckle as a black pair of chevrons the clergyman and doctor made a speedy retreat out of the apartment while dumby dykes fell into one of those transports of violent and profane language which had procured him the surname of damn me dykes bring me the brandy bottle jenny ye bitch he cried with a voice in which passion contended with pain i can die as i have lived without fashing any of them but there's one thing he said sinking his voice there's one fearful thing hangs about my heart and an anchor of brandy when i wash it away the deanses at wood end i sequestrated them in the dear years and now they are to flit they'll starve and that beersheba and that old trooper's wife and her own they'll starve they'll starve look out jock what kind of night is it on ding a sna father answered jock after having opened the window and looked out with great composure they'll perish in the drifts said the expiring sinner they'll perish with cold but i'll be het enough gin a tales be true this last observation was made under breath and in a tone which made the very attorney shudder he tried his hand at ghostly advice probably for the first time in his life and recommended as an opiate for the agonized conscience of the laird reparation of the injuries he had done to these distressed families which he observed by the way the civil law called restitutio in integrum but mammon was struggling with remorse for retaining his place in a bosom he had so long possessed and he partly succeeded as an old tyrant proves often too strong for his insurgent rebels i canna do it he answered with a voice of despair it would kill me to do it how can ye bid me pay back siller when ye can how i want it or dispone beersheba when it lies so well into my own plaid nook nature made dumby dykes and beersheba to be one man's land she did by nichol it would kill me to part them but ye maun die whether or no laird said mr novit and maybe ye would die easier it's but trying i'll scroll the disposition in no time dinna speak of it sir replied dumby dykes or i'll fling the stroop at your head but jock lad ye see how the world rustles with me on my deathbed be kind to the poor creatures the deanses and the butlers be kind to them jock dinna let the world get a grip of ye jock but keep the gear together and whatever ye do dispone beersheba at no rate let the creatures stay at a moderate mailing and have bite and soup it will may be the better with your father where he's goin lad after these contradictory instructions the lord felt his mind so much at ease that he drank three bumpers of brandy continuously and soft away as jenny expressed it in an attempt to sing devil stick the minister his death made a revolution in favour of the distressed families john dumby now of dumby dykes in his own right seemed to be close and selfish enough but wanted the grasping spirit and active mind of his father and his guardian happened to agree with him in opinion that his father's dying recommendation should be attended to the tenants therefore were not actually turned out of doors among the snow-wreaths and were allowed 
wherewith to procure buttermilk and peas bannocks which they ate under the full force of the original malediction the cottage of deans called wood end was not very distant from that at beersheba formerly there had been but little intercourse between the families deans was a sturdy scotsman with all sort of prejudices against the southern and the spawn of the southern moreover deans was as we have said a staunch presbyterian of the most rigid and unbending adherence to what he conceived to be the only possible straight line as he was wont to express himself between right-hand heats and extremes and left-hand defections and therefore he held in high dread and horror all independence and whomsoever he supposed allied to them but notwithstanding these national prejudices and religious professions deans and the widow butler were placed in such a situation as naturally and at length created some intimacy between the families they had shared a common danger and a mutual deliverance they needed each other's assistance like a company who crossing a mountain stream are compelled to cling close together lest the current should be too powerful for any who are not thus supported on nearer acquaintance too deans abated some of his prejudices he found old mrs butler though not thoroughly grounded in the extent and bearing of the real testimony against the defections of the times had no opinions in favour of the independent party neither was she an englishwoman therefore it was to be hoped that though she was the widow of an enthusiastic corporal of cromwell's dragoons her grandson might be neither schismatic nor anti-national two qualities concerning which good man deans had as wholesome a terror as against papists and malignants above all for douce davy deans had his weak side he perceived that widow butler looked up to him with reverence listened to his advice and compounded for an occasional fling at the doctrines of her deceased husbands to which as we have seen she was by no means warmly attached in consideration of the valuable counsels which the presbyterian afforded her for the management of her little farm these usually concluded with they may do otherwise in england neighbour butler for aught i can or it may be different in foreign parts or they what think differently on the great foundation of our covenanted reformation overturning and misjuggling the government and discipline of the kirk and breaking down the carved work of our zion might be for sighing the craft with aids but i say peace peace and as his advice was shrewd and sensible though conceitedly given it was received with gratitude and followed with respect the intercourse which took place betwixt the families at beersheba and wood end became strict and intimate at a very early period betwixt reuben butler with whom the reader is already in some degree acquainted and jeanie deans the only child of douce davy deans by his first wife that singular christian woman as he was wont to express himself whose name was savoury to all that knew her for a desirable professor christian menzies in hawk mcgirdle the manner of which intimacy and the consequences thereof we now proceed to relate End of chapter seventh chapter eighth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah reuben and rachel though as fond as doves 
were yet discreet and cautious in their loves nor would attend to cupid's wild commands till cool reflection bade them join their hands when both were poor they thought it argued ill of hasty love to make them poorer still crabbe's parish register while widow butler and widower deans struggled with poverty and the hard and sterile soil of those parts and portions of the lands of dumby dykes which it was their lot to occupy it became gradually apparent that deans was to gain the strife and his ally in the conflict was to lose it the former was a man and not much past the prime of life mrs butler a woman and declined into the vale of years this indeed ought in time to have been balanced by the circumstance that reuben was growing up to assist his grandmother's labors and that jeanie deans as a girl could be only supposed to add to her father's burdens but douse davy deans no better things and so schooled and trained the young minion as he called her that from the time she could walk upwards she was daily employed in some task or other suitable to her age and capacity a circumstance which added to her father's daily instructions and lectures tended to give her mind even when a child a grave serious firm and reflecting cast an uncommonly strong and healthy temperament free from all nervous affection and every other irregularity which attacking the body in its more noble functions so often influences the mind tended greatly to establish this fortitude simplicity and decision of character on the other hand reuben was weak in constitution and though not timid in temper might be safely pronounced anxious doubtful and apprehensive he partook of the temperament of his mother who had died of a consumption in early age he was a pale thin feeble sickly boy and somewhat lame from an accident in early youth he was besides the child of a doting grandmother whose too solicitous attention to him soon taught him a sort of diffidence in himself with a disposition to overrate his own importance which is one of the very worst consequences that children deduce from overindulgence still however the two children clung to each other's society not more from habit than from taste they herded together the handful of sheep with the two or three cows which their parents turned out rather to seek food than actually to feed upon the unenclosed common of dumby dykes it was there that the two urchins might be seen seated beneath a blooming bush of whin their little faces laid close together under the shadow of the same plaid drawn over both their heads while the landscape around was embrowned by an overshadowing cloud big with the shower which had driven the children to shelter on other occasions they went together to school the boy receiving that encouragement and example from his companion in crossing the little brooks which intersected their path and encountering cattle dogs and other perils upon their journey which the male sex in such cases usually consider it as their prerogative to extend to the weaker but when seated on the benches of the schoolhouse they began to con their lessons together reuben who was as much superior to jeanie deans in acuteness of intellect as inferior to her in firmness of constitution and in that insensibility 
to fatigue and danger which depends on the conformation of the nerves was able fully to requite the kindness and countenance with which in other circumstances she used to regard him he was decidedly the best scholar at the little parish school and so gentle was his temper and disposition that he was rather admired than envied by the little mob who occupied the noisy mansion although he was the declared favourite of the master several girls in particular for in scotland they are taught with the boys longed to be kind to and comfort the sickly lad who was so much cleverer than his companions the character of reuben butler was so calculated as to offer scope both for their sympathy and their admiration the feelings perhaps through which the female sex the more deserving part of them at least is more easily attached but reuben naturally reserved and distant improved none of these advantages and only became more attached to jeanie deans as the enthusiastic approbation of his master assured him of fair prospects in future life and awakened his ambition in the meantime every advance that reuben made in learning and considering his opportunities they were uncommonly great rendered him less capable of attending to the domestic duties of his grandmother's farm while studying the pons asinorum in euclid he suffered every cuddy upon the common to trespass upon a large field of peas belonging to the laird and nothing but the active exertions of jeanie deans with her little dog dustyfoot could have saved great loss and consequent punishment similar miscarriages marked his progress in his classical studies he read virgil's georgics till he did not know bear from barley and had nearly destroyed the crofts of beersheba while attempting to cultivate them according to the practice of columella and cato the censor these blunders occasioned grief to his grand dam and disconcerted the good opinion which her neighbour davy deans had for some time entertained of reuben i see nothing ye can make of that silly callant neighbour butler said he to the old lady unless ye train him to the work of the ministry and ne'er was there more need of poorful preachers than even now in these cold gallio days when men's hearts are hardened like the nether millstone till they come to regard none of these things it's evident this poor callant of yours will never be able to do an useful day's work unless it be as an ambassador from our master and i will make it my business to procure a license when he is fit for the same trusting he will be a shaft cleanly polished and meet to be used in the body of the kirk and that he shall not turn again like the sow to wallow in the mire of heretical extremes and defections but shall have the wings of a dove though he hath lain among the pots the poor widow gulped down the affront to her husband's principles implied in this caution and hastened to take butler from the high school and encourage him in the pursuit of mathematics and divinity the only physics and ethics that chanced to be in fashion at the time jeanie deans was now compelled to part from the companion of her labour her study and her pastime and it was with more than childish feeling that both children regarded the separation but they were young and hope was high and they separated like those who hope to meet again at a more auspicious hour while reuben butler was acquiring at the university of st andrews the knowledge necessary for a clergyman and macerating his body with the privations which were necessary 
in seeking food for his mind his grand dam became daily less able to struggle with her little farm and was at length obliged to throw it up to the new laird of dumby dykes that great personage was no absolute jew and did not cheat her in making the bargain more than was tolerable he even gave her permission to tenant the house in which she had lived with her husband as long as it should be tenantable only he protested against paying for a farthing of repairs any benevolence which he possessed being of the passive but by no means of the active mood in the meanwhile from superior shrewdness skill and other circumstances some of them purely accidental davy deans gained a footing in the world the possession of some wealth the reputation of more and a growing disposition to preserve and increase his store for which when he thought upon it seriously he was inclined to blame himself from his knowledge in agriculture as it was then practised he became a sort of favourite with the laird who had no great pleasure either in active sports or in society and was wont to end his daily saunter by calling at the cottage of wood end being himself a man of slow ideas and confused utterance dumby dykes used to sit or stand for half an hour with an old laced hat of his father's upon his head and an empty tobacco-pipe in his mouth with his eyes following janey deans or the lassie as he called her through the course of her daily domestic labour while her father after exhausting the subject of bestial of ploughs and of harrows often took an opportunity of going full sail into controversial subjects to which discussions the dignitary listened with much seeming patience but without making any reply or indeed as most people thought without understanding a single word of what the orator was saying deans indeed denied this stoutly as an insult at once to his own talents for expounding hidden truths of which he was a little vain and to the laird's capacity of understanding them he said dumby dykes was nain of those flashy gentles with lace on their skirts and swords at their tails that were rather for riding on horseback to hell than gauging barefooted to heaven he wasna like his father no profane company-keeper no swearer no drinker no frequenter of playhouse or music-house or dancing-house no sabbath-breaker no imposer of aiths or bonds or denier of liberty to the flock he clave to the world and the world's gear a wee over muckle but then there was some breathing of a gale upon his spirit etc etc all this honest davy said and believed it is not to be supposed that by a father and a man of sense and observation the constant direction of the laird's eyes towards genie was altogether unnoticed this circumstance however made a much greater impression upon another member of the family a second helpmate to wit whom he had chosen to take to his bosom ten years after the death of his first some people were of opinion that douse davy had been rather surprised into this step for in general he was no friend to marriages or giving in marriage and seemed rather to regard that state of society as a necessary evil a thing lawful and to be tolerated in the imperfect state of our nature but which clipped the wings with which we ought to soar upwards and tethered the soul to its mansion of clay and the creature comforts of wife and bairns his own practice however had in this material point varied from his principles since as we have seen 
he twice knitted for himself this dangerous and ensnaring entanglement rebecca his spouse had by no means the same horror of matrimony and as she made marriages in imagination for every neighbour round she failed not to indicate a match betwixt dumby dykes and her stepdaughter jeanie the good man used regularly to frown and shaw whenever this topic was touched upon but usually ended by taking his bonnet and walking out of the house to conceal a certain gleam of satisfaction which at such a suggestion involuntarily diffused itself over his austere features the more youthful part of my readers may naturally ask whether Janie deans was deserving of this mute attention of the laird of dumby dykes and the historian with due regard to veracity is compelled to answer that her personal attractions were of no uncommon description she was short and rather too stoutly made for her size had grey eyes light-coloured hair a round good-humoured face much tanned with the sun and her only peculiar charm was an air of inexpressible serenity which a good conscience kind feelings contented temper and the regular discharge of all her duties spread over her features there was nothing it may be supposed very appalling in the form or manners of this rustic heroine yet whether from sheepish bashfulness or from want of decision and imperfect knowledge of his own mind on the subject the laird of dumby dykes with his old laced hat and empty tobacco-pipe came and enjoyed the beatific vision of jeanie downs day after day week after week year after year without proposing to accomplish any of the prophecies of the stepmother this good lady began to grow doubly impatient on the subject when after having been some years married she herself presented douse davy with another daughter who was named euphemia by corruption effie it was then that rebecca began to turn impatient with the slow pace at which the laird's wooing proceeded judiciously arguing that as lady dumby dykes would have but little occasion for toker the principal part of her good man's substance would naturally descend to the child by the second marriage other step-dames have tried less laudable means for clearing the way to the succession of their own children but rebecca to do her justice only sought little effie's advantage through the promotion or which must have generally been accounted such of her elder sister she therefore tried every female art within the compass of her simple skill to bring the laird to a point but had the mortification to perceive that her efforts like those of an unskilful angler only scared the trout she meant to catch upon one occasion in particular when she joked with the laird on the propriety of giving a mistress to the house of dumby dykes he was so effectually startled that neither laced hat tobacco-pipe nor the intelligent proprietor of these movables visited woodend for a fortnight rebecca was therefore compelled to leave the laird to proceed at his own snail's pace convinced by experience of the grave digger's aphorism that your dull ass will not mend his pace for beating reuben in the meantime pursued his studies at the university supplying his wants by teaching the younger lads the knowledge he himself acquired and thus at once gaining the means of maintaining himself at the seat of learning and fixing in his mind the elements of what he had already obtained in this manner as is usual among the poorer students 
of divinity at scottish universities he contrived not only to maintain himself according to his simple wants but even to send considerable assistance to his sole remaining parent a sacred duty of which the scotch are seldom negligent his progress in knowledge of a general kind as well as in the studies proper to his profession was very considerable but was little remarked owing to the retired modesty of his disposition which in no respect qualified him to set off his learning to the best advantage and thus had butler been a man given to make complaints he had his tale to tell like others of unjust preferences bad luck and hard usage on these subjects however he was habitually silent perhaps from modesty perhaps from a touch of pride or perhaps from a conjunction of both he obtained his license as a preacher of the gospel with some compliments from the presbytery by whom it was bestowed but this did not lead to any preferment and he found it necessary to make the cottage at beersheba his residence for some months with no other income than was afforded by the precarious occupation of teaching in one or other of the neighbouring families after having greeted his aged grandmother his first visit was to wood end where he was received by jeanie with warm cordiality arising from recollections which had never been dismissed from her mind by rebecca with good-humoured hospitality and by old deans in a mode peculiar to himself highly as douse davy honoured the clergy it was not upon each individual of the cloth that he bestowed his approbation and a little jealous perhaps at seeing his youthful acquaintance erected into the dignity of a teacher and preacher he instantly attacked him upon various points of controversy in order to discover whether he might not have fallen into some of the snares defections and desertions of the time butler was not only a man of staunch presbyterian principles but was also willing to avoid giving pain to his old friend by disputing upon points of little importance and therefore he might have hoped to have come like fine gold out of the furnace of davies interrogatories but the result on the mind of that strict investigator was not altogether so favourable as might have been hoped and anticipated old judith butler who had hobbled that evening as far as wood end in order to enjoy the congratulations of her neighbours upon reuben's return and upon his high attainments of which she was herself not a little proud was somewhat mortified to find that her old friend deans did not enter into the subject with the warmth she expected at first he seemed rather silent than dissatisfied and it was not till judith had essayed the subject more than once that it led to the following dialogue a will neighbour deans i thought ye would have been glad to see reuben among us again poor fellow i am glad mrs butler was the neighbour's concise answer since he has lost his grandfather and his father praised be him that giveth and taketh i can no friend he has in the world that's been so like a father to him as the cell of ye neighbour deans god is the only father of the fatherless said deans touching his bonnet and looking upwards give honour where it is due good wife and not to an unworthy instrument ah well that's your way a turning it and no doubt ye ken best but i have kenned ye davy send a forpit a meal to beersheba when there wasna a bough left in the mill-ark at wood end ay and i have kenned ye 
good wife said davy interrupting her these are but idle tales to tell me fit for nothing but to puff up our inward man with our own vain acts i stood beside blessed alexander peden when i heard him call the death and testimony of our happy martyrs but draps of blood and scarts of ink in respect of fitting discharge of our duty and what should i think of anything the like of me can do well neighbour deans ye can best but i mun say that i am sure you are glad to see my bairn again the halt's gone now unless he has to walk over many miles at a stretch and he has a wee bit colour in his cheek that glads my old een to see it and he has as decent a black coat as the minister and i am very heartily glad he is well and thriving said mr deans with a gravity that seemed intended to cut short the subject but a woman who is bent upon a point is not easily pushed aside from it and continued mrs butler he can wag his head in a pulpit now neighbour deans think but of that my own one and a body mon sit still and listen to him as if he were the pape of rome the what the who woman said deans with a sternness far beyond his usual gravity as soon as these offensive words had struck upon the tympanum of his ear eh guide us said the poor woman i had forgot what an ill will ye had i at the pape and so had my poor good man stephen butler many an afternoon he would sit and take up his testimony again the pape and again baptizing of bairns and the like woman reiterated deans either speak about what ye ken something of or be silent i say that independency is a foul heresy and anabaptism a damnable and deceiving error while should be rooted out of the land with the fire of the spiritual and the sword of the civil magistrate well weel neighbour i'll no say that you may not be right answered the submissive judith i am sure ye are right about the sighing and the mine the shearing and the leading and what for should ye no be right about kirkwark too but concerning my own reuben butler reuben butler good wife said david with solemnity is a lad i wish heartily will too even as if he were mine own son but i doubt there will be outs and ins in the track of his walk i muckle fear his gifts will get the heels of his grace he has over muckle human wit and learning and thinks as muckle about the form of the bicker as he does about the wholesomeness of the food he maun broider the marriage garment with lace and passments or it's no good enough for him and it's like he's something proud of his human gifts and learning whilk enables him to dress up his doctrine in that fine airy dress but added he at seeing the old woman's uneasiness at his discourse affliction may give him a jag and let the wind out of him as out of a cow that's eaten wet clover and the lad may do well and be a burning and a shining light and i trust it will be yours to see and his to feel it and that soon widow butler was obliged to retire unable to make anything more of her neighbour whose discourse though she did not comprehend it filled her with undefined apprehensions on her grandson's account and greatly depressed the joy with which she had welcomed him on his return and it must not be concealed in justice to mr deane's discernment that butler in their conference had made a greater display of his learning than the occasion called for or than was likely to be acceptable 
to the old man who accustomed to consider himself as a person pre-eminently entitled to dictate upon theological subjects of controversy felt rather humbled and mortified when learned authorities were placed in array against him in fact butler had not escaped the tinge of pedantry which naturally flowed from his education and was apt on many occasions to make parade of his knowledge when there was no need of such vanity genie deans however found no fault with this display of learning but on the contrary admired it perhaps on the same score that her sex are said to admire men of courage on account of their own deficiency in that qualification the circumstances of their families threw the young people constantly together their old intimacy was renewed though upon a footing better adapted to their age and it became at length understood betwixt them that their union should be deferred no longer than until butler should obtain some steady means of support however humble this however was not a matter speedily to be accomplished plan after plan was formed and plan after plan failed the good-humoured cheek of genie lost the first flush of juvenile freshness reuben's brow assumed the gravity of manhood yet the means of obtaining a settlement seemed remote as ever fortunately for the lovers their passion was of no ardent or enthusiastic cast and a sense of duty on both sides induced them to bear with patient fortitude the protracted interval which divided them from each other in the meantime time did not roll on without effecting his usual changes the widow of stephen butler so long the prop of the family of beersheba was gathered to her father's and rebecca the careful spouse of our friend davy deans was also summoned from her plans of matrimonial and domestic economy the morning after her death reuben butler went to offer his might of consolation to his old friend and benefactor he witnessed on this occasion a remarkable struggle betwixt the force of natural affection and the religious stoicism which the sufferer thought it was incumbent upon him to maintain under each earthly dispensation whether of weal or woe on his arrival at the cottage genie with her eyes overflowing with tears pointed to the little orchard in which she whispered with broken accents my poor father has been since his misfortune somewhat alarmed at this account butler entered the orchard and advanced slowly towards his old friend who seated in a small rude arbour appeared to be sunk in the extremity of his affliction he lifted his eyes somewhat sternly as butler approached as if offended at the interruption but as the young man hesitated whether he ought to retreat or advance he arose and came forward to meet him with a self-possessed and even dignified air young man said the sufferer lay it not to heart though the righteous perish and the merciful are removed seeing it may well be said that they are taken away from the evils to come woe to me were i to shed a tear for the wife of my bosom when i might weep rivers of water for this afflicted church cursed as it is with carnal seekers and with the dead of heart i am happy said butler that you can forget your private affliction in your regard for public duty forget reuben said poor deans putting his handkerchief to his eyes she's not to be forgotten on this side of time but he that gives the wound can send the ointment i declare there have been times during this night when my meditation has been so rapt 
that i knew not of my heavy loss it has been with me as with the worthy john semple called carsfarn john upon a like trial i have been this night on the banks of eule picking an apple here and there notwithstanding the assumed fortitude of deans which he conceived to be the discharge of a great christian duty he had too good a heart not to suffer deeply under this heavy loss would end became altogether distasteful to him and as he had obtained both substance and experience by his management of that little farm he resolved to employ them as a dairy farmer or cow-feeder as they are called in scotland the situation he chose for his new settlement was at a place called st leonard's crags lying betwixt edinburgh and the mountain called arthur's seat and adjoining to the extensive sheep pasture still named the king's park from its having been formerly dedicated to the preservation of the royal game here he rented a small lonely house about half a mile distant from the nearest point of the city but the site of which with all the adjacent ground is now occupied by the buildings which form the south-eastern suburb an extensive pasture ground adjoining which deans rented from the keeper of the royal park enabled him to feed his milk house and the unceasing industry and activity of jeanie his oldest daughter were exerted in making the most of their produce she had now less frequent opportunities of seeing reuben who had been obliged after various disappointments to accept the subordinate situation of assistant in a parochial school of some eminence at three or four miles distance from the city here he distinguished himself and became acquainted with several respectable burgesses who on account of health or other reasons chose that their children should commence their education in this little village his prospects were thus gradually brightening and upon each visit which he paid at st leonard's he had an opportunity of gliding a hint to this purpose into jeanie's ear these visits were necessarily very rare on account of the demands which the duties of the school made upon butler's time nor did he dare to make them even altogether so frequent as these avocations would permit deans received him with civility indeed and even with kindness but reuben as is usual in such cases imagined that he read his purpose in his eyes and was afraid too premature an explanation on the subject would draw down his positive disapproval upon the whole therefore he judged it prudent to call at st leonard's just so frequently as old acquaintance and neighbourhood seemed to authorise and no oftener there was another person who was more regular in his visit when davy deans intimated to the laird of dumby dykes his purpose of quitting with the land and house at wood end the laird stared and said nothing he made his usual visits at the usual hour without remark until the day before the term when observing the bustle of moving furniture already commenced the great east country omri dragged out of its nook and standing with its shoulder to the company like an awkward booby about to leave the room the laird again stared mightily and was heard to ejaculate hey sirs even after the day of departure was passed and gone the laird of dumby dykes at his usual hour which was that at which davy deans was wont to loose the plough presented himself before the closed door of the cottage at wood end and seemed as much astonished at finding it shut against his approach as if it was not exactly what he had to expect on this occasion he was heard to ejaculate 
good guide us which by those who knew him was considered as a very unusual mark of emotion from that moment forward dumby dykes became an altered man and the regularity of his movements hitherto so exemplary was as totally disconcerted as those of a boy's watch when he has broken the main spring like the index of the said watch did dumby dykes spin round the whole bounds of his little property which may be likened unto the dial of the timepiece with unwonted velocity there was not a cottage into which he did not enter nor scarce a maiden on whom he did not stare but so it was that although there were better farmhouses on the land than wood end and certainly much prettier girls than jeanie deans yet it did somehow befall that the blank in the laird's time was not so pleasantly filled up as it had been there was no seat accommodated him so well as the bunker at wood end and no face he loved so much to gaze on as jeanie deans so after spinning round and round his little orbit and then remaining stationary for a week it seems to have occurred to him that he was not pinned down to circulate on a pivot like the hands of the watch but possessed the power of shifting his central point and extending his circle if he thought proper to realize which privilege of change of place he bought a pony from a highland drover and with its assistance and company stepped or rather stumbled as far as st leonard's crags jeanie deans though so much accustomed to the laird's staring that she was sometimes scarce conscious of his presence had nevertheless some occasional fears lest he should call in the organ of speech to back those expressions of admiration which he bestowed on her through his eyes should this happen farewell she thought to all chance of a union with butler for her father however stout-hearted and independent in civil and religious principles was not without that respect for the laird of the land so deeply imprinted on the scottish tenantry of the period moreover if he did not positively dislike butler yet his fund of carnal learning was often the object of sarcasms on david's part which were perhaps founded in jealousy and which certainly indicated no partiality for the party against whom they were launched and lastly the match with dumby dykes would have presented irresistible charms to one who used to complain that he felt himself apt to take o'er grit an armful of the world so that upon the whole the laird's diurnal visits were disagreeable to jeanie from apprehension of future consequences and it served much to console her upon removing from the spot where she was bred and born that she had seen the last of dumby dykes his laced hat and tobacco-pipe the poor girl no more expected he could muster courage to follow her to st leonard's crags than that any of her apple-trees or cabbages which she had left rooted in the yard at wood end would spontaneously and unaided have undertaken the same journey it was therefore with much more surprise than pleasure that on the sixth day after their removal to st leonard's she beheld dumby dykes arrive laced hat tobacco-pipe and all and with the self-same greeting of how's all with ye jeanie where's the good man assume as nearly as he could the same position in the cottage at st leonard's which he had so long and so regularly occupied at wood end he was no sooner however seated than with an unusual exertion of his powers of conversation he added jeanie i say jeanie woman 
here he extended his hand towards her shoulder with all the fingers spread out as if to clutch it but in so bashful and awkward a manner that when she whisked herself beyond its reach the paw remained suspended in the air with the palm open like the claw of a heraldic griffin genie continued the swain in this moment of inspiration i say genie it's a broad day out by and the roads are not that ill for boot hose the devil's in the dawdling body muttered genie between her teeth what would have thought of his dacring out this length and she afterwards confessed that she threw a little of this ungracious sentiment into her accent and manner for her father being abroad and the body as she irreverently termed the landed proprietor looking unco gleg and canty she didna ken what he might be coming out with next her frowns however acted as a complete sedative and the laird relapsed from that day into his former taciturn habits visiting the cow-feeder's cottage three or four times every week when the weather permitted with apparently no other purpose than to stare at genie deans while douse davy poured forth his eloquence upon the controversies and testimonies of the day end of chapter eighth chapter ninth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah her air her manners all who saw admired courteous though coy and gentle though retired the joy of youth and health her eyes displayed and ease of heart her every look conveyed crab the visits of the laird thus again sunk into matters of ordinary course from which nothing was to be expected or apprehended if a lover could have gained a fair one as a snake is said to fascinate a bird by pertinaciously gazing on her with great stupid greenish eyes which began now to be occasionally aided by spectacles unquestionably dumby dykes would have been the person to perform the feat but the art of fascination seems among the arts Perdite, and i cannot learn that this most pertinacious of starers produced any effect by his attentions beyond an occasional yawn in the meanwhile the object of his gaze was gradually attaining the verge of youth and approaching to what is called in females the middle age which is impolitely held to begin a few years earlier with their more fragile sex than with men many people would have been of opinion that the laird would have done better to have transferred his glances to an object possessed of far superior charms to genies even when genies were in their bloom who began now to be distinguished by all who visited the cottage at st leonard's crags effie deans under the tender and affectionate care of her sister had now shot up into a beautiful and blooming girl her grecian shaped head was profusely rich in waving ringlets of brown hair which confined by a blue snood of silk and shading a laughing heavy countenance seemed the picture of health pleasure and contentment her brown russet short gown set off a shape which time perhaps might be expected to render too robust the frequent objection to scottish beauty but which in her present early age was slender and taper with that graceful and easy sweep of outline which at once indicates health and beautiful proportion of parts 
these growing charms in all their juvenile profusion had no power to shake the steadfast mind or divert the fixed gaze of the constant laird of dumby dykes but there was scarce another eye that could behold this living picture of health and beauty without pausing on it with pleasure the traveller stopped his weary horse on the eve of entering the city which was the end of his journey to gaze at this sylph-like form that tripped by him with her milk-pail poised on her head bearing herself so erect and stepping so light and free under her burden that it seemed rather an ornament than an encumbrance the lads of the neighbouring suburb who held their evening rendezvous for putting the stone casting the hammer playing at long bowls and other athletic exercises watched the motions of effie deans and contended with each other which should have the good fortune to attract her attention even the rigid presbyterians of her father's persuasion who held each indulgence of the eye and sense to be a snare at least if not a crime were surprised into a moment's delight while gazing on a creature so exquisite instantly checked by a sigh reproaching at once their own weakness and mourning that a creature so fair should share in the common and hereditary guilt and imperfection of our nature which she deserved as much by her guileless purity of thought speech and action as by her uncommon loveliness of face and person yet there were points in effie's character which gave rise not only to strange doubt and anxiety on the part of douse david deans whose ideas were rigid as may easily be supposed upon the subject of youthful amusements but even of serious apprehension to her more indulgent sister the children of the scotch of the inferior classes are usually spoiled by the early indulgence of their parents how wherefore and to what degree the lively and instructive narrative of the amiable and accomplished authoress of glenburnie has saved me and all future scribblers the trouble of recording effie had had a double share of this inconsiderate and misjudged kindness even the strictness of her father's principles could not condemn the sports of infancy and childhood and to the good old man his younger daughter the child of his old age seemed a child for some years after she attained the years of womanhood was still called the bit lassie and little effie and was permitted to run up and down uncontrolled unless upon the sabbath or at the times of family worship her sister with all the love and care of a mother could not be supposed to possess the same authoritative influence and that which she had hitherto exercised became gradually limited and diminished as effie's advancing years entitled her in her own conceit at least to the right of independence and free agency with all the innocence and goodness of disposition therefore which we have described the lily of st leonard's possessed a little fund of self-conceit and obstinacy and some warmth and irritability of temper partly natural perhaps but certainly much increased by the unrestrained freedom of her childhood her character will be best illustrated by a cottage evening scene the careful father was absent in his well-stocked byre foddering those useful and patient animals on whose produce his living depended and the summer evening was beginning to close in when jeanie deans began to be very anxious for the appearance of her sister and to fear that she would not reach home before her father returned from the labour of the evening 
when it was his custom to have family exercise and when she knew that effie's absence would give him the most serious displeasure these apprehensions hung heavier upon her mind because for several preceding evenings effie had disappeared about the same time and her stay at first so brief as scarce to be noticed had been gradually protracted to half an hour and an hour and on the present occasion had considerably exceeded even this last limit and now jeanie stood at the door with her hand before her eyes to avoid the rays of the level sun and looked alternately along the various tracks which led towards their dwelling to see if she could descry the nymph-like form of her sister there was a wall and a stile which separated the royal domain or king's park as it is called from the public road to this pass she frequently directed her attention when she saw two persons appear there somewhat suddenly as if they had walked close by the side of the wall to screen themselves from observation one of them a man drew back hastily the other a female crossed the stile and advanced towards her it was effie she met her sister with that affected liveliness of manner which in her rank and sometimes in those above it females occasionally assume to hide surprise or confusion and she carolled as she came the elfin knight sat on the bray the groom grows bonny the broom grows fair and by there came lilting a lady so gay and we darna gang down to the broom no more whisht effie said her sister our father's coming out of the byre the damsel stinted in her song where have ye been so late at even it's no late lass answered effie it's chapit eight on every clock of the town and the sun's gone down ahent the corstophine hills where can ye have been so late no gate answered effie and what was that parted with you at the stile nobody replied effie once more no gate nobody i wish it may be a right gate and a right body that keeps folks out so late at even effie what needs ye be i spirin then at folk retorted effie i'm sure if you'll ask no questions i'll tell ye no lees i never ask what brings the laird of dumby dykes glowering here like a wool-cat only his inns greener and no so gleg day after day till we are all like to gaunt our charts aft because ye ken very well he comes to see our father said jeanie in answer to this pert remark and dominie butler does he come to see our father that's so taken with his latin words said effie delighted to find that by carrying the war into the enemy's country she could divert the threatened attack upon herself and with the petulance of youth she pursued her triumph over her prudent elder sister she looked at her with a sly air in which there was something like irony as she chanted in a low but marked tone a scrap of an old scotch song through the kirkyard i met with the laird the silly poor body he said me no harm but just ere twas dark i met with the clerk here the songstress stopped looked full at her sister and observing the tears gather in her eyes she suddenly flung her arms round her neck and kissed them away jeanie though hurt and displeased was unable to resist the caresses of this untaught child of nature whose good and evil seemed to flow rather from impulse 
than from reflection but as she returned the sisterly kiss in token of perfect reconciliation she could not suppress the gentle reproof effie if ye will learn full things ye might make a kinder use of them and so i might jeanie continued the girl clinging to her sister's neck and i wish i had never learned one of them and i wish we had never come here and i wish my tongue had been blistered or i had vexed ye never mind that effie replied the affectionate sister i canna be muckle vexed with anything ye say to me but oh dinna vex our father i will not i will not replied effie and if there were as many dances the morn's night as there are merry dancers in the north firmament on a frosty even i winna budge an inch to gang near any of them dance echoed jeanie deans in astonishment oh effie what could take ye to a dance it is very possible that in the communicative mood into which the lily of st leonard's was now surprised she might have given her sister her unreserved confidence and saved me the pain of telling a melancholy tale but at the moment the word dance was uttered it reached the ear of old david deans who had turned the corner of the house and came upon his daughters ere they were aware of his presence the word prelate or even the word pope could hardly have produced so appalling an effect upon david's ear for of all exercises that of dancing which he termed a voluntary and regular fit of distraction he deemed most destructive of serious thoughts and the readiest inlet to all sorts of licentiousness and he accounted the encouraging and even permitting assemblies or meetings whether among those of high or low degree for this fantastic and absurd purpose or for that of dramatic representations as one of the most flagrant proofs of defection and causes of wrath the pronouncing of the word dance by his own daughters and at his own door now drove him beyond the verge of patience dance he exclaimed dance dance said ye i dare ye limmers that ye are to name sick a word at my door cheek it's a dissolute profane pastime practised by the israelites only at their base and brutal worship of the golden calf at bethel and by the unhappy lass what danced off the head of john the baptist upon whilk chapter i will exercise this night for your farther instruction since ye need it so muckle nothing doubting that she has cause to rue the day lang or this time that ever she should have shook a limb on sick an errand better for her to have been born a cripple and carried from door to door like old bessie bowie begging bobbies than to be a king's daughter fiddling and flinging the gate she did i have often wondered that any one that ever bent a knee for the right purpose should ever dare to crook a hoff to fike and fling at piper's wind and fiddler's squealing and i bless god with that singular worthy peter walker the packman at bristow port that ordered my lot in my dancing days so that fear of my head and throat dread of bloody rope and swift bullet and trenchant swords and pains of boots and thumbkins cold and hunger wetness and weariness stopped the lightness of my head and the wantonness of my feet and now if i hear ye queen lassies so muckle as name dancing or think there's sick a thing in this world as flinging to fiddler's sounds and piper's springs as sure as my father's spirit is with the just ye shall be no more either charge or concern of mine gang in then gang in then hinnies 
he added in a softer tone for the tears of both daughters but especially those of effie began to flow very fast gang in dears and we'll seek grace to preserve us from all manner of profane folly whilk causeth to sin and promoteth the kingdom of darkness warring with the kingdom of light the objuration of david deans however well meant was unhappily timed it created a division of feelings in effie's bosom and deterred her from her intended confidence in her sister she would hand me no better than the dirt below her feet said effie to herself were i to confess i have danced with him four times on the green down by and once at maggie mcqueen's and she'll maybe hang it over my head that she'll tell my father and then she would be mistress and more but i'll no gang back there again i'm resolved i'll no gang back i'll lay in a leaf of my bible and that's very near as if i had made an eighth that i winna gang back and she kept her vow for a week during which she was unusually cross and fretful blemishes which had never before been observed in her temper except during a moment of contradiction there was something in all this so mysterious as considerably to alarm the prudent and affectionate genie the more so as she judged it unkind to her sister to mention to their father grounds of anxiety which might arise from her own imagination besides her respect for the good old man did not prevent her from being aware that he was both hot-tempered and positive and she sometimes suspected that he carried his dislike to youthful amusements beyond the verge that religion and reason demanded Jeanie had sense enough to see that a sudden and severe curb upon her sister's hitherto unrestrained freedom might be rather productive of harm than good and that effie in the headstrong wilfulness of youth was likely to make what might be overstrained in her father's precepts an excuse to herself for neglecting them altogether in the higher classes a damsel however giddy is still under the dominion of etiquette and subject to the surveillance of mammas and chaperones but the country girl who snatches her moment of gaiety during the intervals of labour is under no such guardianship or restraint and her amusement becomes so much the more hazardous Jeanie saw all this with much distress of mind when a circumstance occurred which appeared calculated to relieve her anxiety mrs saddletree with whom our readers have already been made acquainted chanced to be a distant relation of dow's david deans and as she was a woman orderly in her life and conversation and moreover of good substance a sort of acquaintance was formerly kept up between the families now this careful dame about a year and a half before our story commences chanced to need in the line of her profession a better sort of servant or rather shopwoman mr saddletree she said was never in the shop when he could get his nose within the parliament house and it was an awkward thing for a woman body to be standing among bundles of bark and leather her lane selling saddles and bridles and she had cast her eyes upon her far away cousin effie deans as just the very sort of lassie she would want to keep her in countenance on such occasions in this proposal there was much that pleased old david there was bed board and bounteth it was a decent situation 
the lassie would be under mrs saddletree's eye who had an upright walk and lived close by the tolbooth kirk in which might still be heard the comforting doctrines of one of those few ministers of the kirk of scotland who had not bent the knee unto baal according to david's expression or become accessory to the course of national defections union toleration patronages and a bundle of prelatical erastian oaths which had been imposed on the church since the revolution and particularly in the reign of the late woman as he called queen anne the last of that unhappy race of stuarts in the good man's security concerning the soundness of the theological doctrine which his daughter was to hear he was nothing disturbed on account of the snares of a different kind to which a creature so beautiful young and wilful might be exposed in the centre of a populous and corrupted city the fact is that he thought with so much horror on all approaches to irregularities of the nature most to be dreaded in such cases that he would as soon have suspected and guarded against effie's being induced to become guilty of the crime of murder he only regretted that she should live under the same roof with such a worldly wise man as bartolin saddletree whom david never suspected of being an ass as he was but considered as one really endowed with all the legal knowledge to which he made pretension and only liked him the worse for possessing it the lawyers especially those amongst them who sat as ruling elders in the general assembly of the kirk had been forward in promoting the measures of patronage of the abjuration oath and others which in the opinion of david deans were a breaking down of the carved work of the sanctuary and an intrusion upon the liberties of the kirk upon the dangers of listening to the doctrines of a legalized formalist such as saddletree david gave his daughter many lectures so much so that he had time to touch but slightly on the dangers of chambering company-keeping and promiscuous dancing to which at her time of life most people would have thought effie more exposed than to the risk of theoretical error in her religious faith jeanie parted from her sister with a mixed feeling of regret and apprehension and hope she could not be so confident concerning effie's prudence as her father for she had observed her more narrowly had more sympathy with her feelings and could better estimate the temptations to which she was exposed on the other hand mrs saddletree was an observing shrewd notable woman entitled to exercise over effie the full authority of a mistress and likely to do so strictly yet with kindness her removal to saddletree's it was most probable would also serve to break off some idle acquaintances which jeanie suspected her sister to have formed in the neighbouring suburb upon the whole then she viewed her departure from st leonard's with pleasure and it was not until the very moment of their parting for the first time in their lives that she felt the full force of sisterly sorrow while they repeatedly kissed each other's cheeks and wrung each other's hands jeanie took that moment of affectionate sympathy to press upon her sister the necessity of the utmost caution in her conduct while residing in edinburgh effie listened without once raising her large dark eyelashes from which the drops fell so fast as almost to resemble a fountain at the conclusion she sobbed again kissed her sister promised to recollect all the good counsel she had given her and they parted 
during the first weeks effie was all that her kinswoman expected and even more but with time there came a relaxation of that early zeal which she manifested in mrs saddletree's service to borrow once again from the poet who so correctly and beautifully describes living manners something there was what none presumed to say clouds lightly passing on a summer's day whispers and hints which went from ear to ear and mixed reports no judge on earth could clear during this interval mrs saddletree was sometimes displeased by effie's lingering when she was sent upon errands about the shop business and sometimes by a little degree of impatience which she manifested at being rebuked on such occasions but she good-naturedly allowed that the first was very natural to a girl to whom everything in edinburgh was new and the other was only the petulance of a spoiled child when subjected to the yoke of domestic discipline for the first time attention and submission could not be learned at once holyrood was not built in a day use would make perfect it seemed as if the considerate old lady had presaged truly ere many months had passed effie became almost wedded to her duties though she no longer discharged them with the laughing cheek and light step which had at first attracted every customer her mistress sometimes observed her in tears but they were signs of secret sorrow which she concealed as often as she saw them attract notice time wore on her cheek grew pale and her step heavy the cause of these changes could not have escaped the matronly eye of mrs saddletree but she was chiefly confined by indisposition to her bedroom for a considerable time during the latter part of effie's service this interval was marked by symptoms of anguish almost amounting to despair the utmost efforts of the poor girl to command her fits of hysterical agony were often totally unavailing and the mistakes which she made in the shop the while were so numerous and so provoking that bartolin saddletree who during his wife's illness was obliged to take closer charge of the business than consisted with his study of the weightier matters of the law lost all patience with the girl who in his law latin and without much respect to gender he declared ought to be cognosed by inquest of a jury as fatuous furiosus and natural lighter idiota neighbors also and fellow-servants remarked with malicious curiosity or degrading pity the disfigured shape loose dress and pale cheeks of the once beautiful and still interesting girl but to no one would she grant her confidence answering all taunts with bitter sarcasm and all serious expostulation with sullen denial or with floods of tears at length when mrs saddletree's recovery was likely to permit her wonted attention to the regulation of her household effie deans as if unwilling to face an investigation made by the authority of her mistress asked permission of bartolin to go home for a week or two assigning indisposition and the wish of trying the benefit of repose and the change of air as the motives of her request sharp-eyed as a lynx or conceiving himself to be so in the nice sharp quillets of legal discussion bartolin was as dull as drawing inferences from the occurrences of common life as any dutch professor of mathematics he suffered effie to depart without much suspicion and without any inquiry 
it was afterwards found that a period of a week intervened betwixt her leaving her master's house and arriving at st leonard's she made her appearance before her sister in a state rather resembling the spectre than the living substance of the gay and beautiful girl who had left her father's cottage for the first time scarce seventeen months before the lingering illness of her mistress had for the last few months given her a plea for confining herself entirely to the dusky precincts of the shop in the lawn-market and jeanie was so much occupied during the same period with the concerns of her father's household that she had rarely found leisure for a walk in the city and a brief and hurried visit to her sister the young women therefore had scarcely seen each other for several months nor had a single scandalous surmise reached the ears of the secluded inhabitants of the cottage at st leonard's Jeanie, therefore terrified to death at her sister's appearance at first overwhelmed her with inquiries to which the unfortunate young woman returned for a time incoherent and rambling answers and finally fell into a hysterical fit rendered too certain of her sister's misfortune Jeanie had now the dreadful alternative of communicating her ruin to her father or of endeavouring to conceal it from him to all questions concerning the name or rank of her seducer and the fate of the being to whom her fall had given birth effie remained as mute as the grave to which she seemed hastening and indeed the least allusion to either seemed to drive her to distraction her sister in distress and in despair was about to repair to mrs saddletree to consult her experience and at the same time to obtain what lights she could upon this most unhappy affair when she was saved that trouble by a new stroke of fate which seemed to carry misfortune to the uttermost david deans had been alarmed at the state of health in which his daughter had returned to her paternal residence but jeanie had contrived to divert him from particular and specific inquiry it was therefore like a clap of thunder to the poor old man when just as the hour of noon had brought the visit of the laird of dumbydykes as usual other and sterner as well as most unexpected guests arrived at the cottage of st leonard's these were the officers of justice with a warrant of justiciary to search for and apprehend euphemia or effie deans accused of the crime of child murder the stunning weight of a blow so totally unexpected bore down the old man who had in his early youth resisted the brow of military and civil tyranny though backed with swords and guns tortures and gibbets he fell extended and senseless upon his own hearth and the men happy to escape from the scene of his awakening raised with rude humanity the object of their warrant from her bed and placed her in a coach which they had brought with them the hasty remedies which jeanie had applied to bring back her father's senses were scarce begun to operate when the noise of the wheels in motion recalled her attention to her miserable sister to run shrieking after the carriage was the first vain effort of her distraction but she was stopped by one or two female neighbours assembled by the extraordinary appearance of a coach in that sequestered place who almost forced her back to her father's house the deep and sympathetic affliction of these poor people by whom the little family at st leonard's were held in high regard filled the house with lamentation even dumby dykes was moved from his wonted apathy and groping for his purse as he spoke ejaculated jeanie woman jeanie woman 
dinna greet it's sad work but siller will help it and he drew out his purse as he spoke the old man had now raised himself from the ground and looking about him as if he missed something seemed gradually to recover the sense of his wretchedness where he said with a voice that made the roof ring where is the vile harlot that has disgraced the blood of an honest man where is she that has no place among us but has come foul with her sins like the evil one among the children of god where is she genie bring her before me that i may kill her with a word and a look all hastened around him with their appropriate sources of consolation the laird with his purse genie with burnt feathers and strong waters and the women with their exhortations o oh, neighbour o oh, mr deans it's a sore trial doubtless but think of the rock of ages neighbour think of the promise and i do think of it neighbours and i bless god that i can think of it even in the rack and ruin of all that's nearest and dearest to me but to be the father of a castaway a profligate a bloody zippora a mere murderess oh how will the wicked exult in the high places of their wickedness the prelatus and the latitudinarians and the hand-wailed murderers whose hands are hard as horn with handling the slaughter-weapons they will push out the lip and say that we are even such as themselves sore sore i am grieved neighbours for the poor castaway for the child of mine old age but sore for the stumbling-block and scandal it will be to all tender and honest souls davy when a silver do it insinuated the laird still proffering his green purse which was full of guineas i tell ye dumby dykes said deans that if telling down my hell substance could have saved her from this black snare i would have walked out with nothing but my bonnet and my staff to beg an onmus for god's sake and called myself an happy man but if a dollar or a plaque or the nineteenth part of a bottle would save her open guilt and open shame from open punishment that purchase would david deans never make no no an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth life for life blood for blood it's the law of man and it's the law of god leave me sirs leave me i maun rustle with this trial in privacy and on my knees genie now in some degree restored to the power of thought joined in the same request the next day found the father and daughter still in the depth of affliction but the father sternly supporting his load of ill through a proud sense of religious duty and the daughter anxiously suppressing her own feelings to avoid again awakening his thus it was with the afflicted family until the morning after porteus's death a period at which we are now arrived End of chapter ninth chapter tenth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dion gines salt lake city utah is all the counsel that we two have shared the sisters vows the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty-footed time for parting us oh and is all forgot midsummer night's dream we have been a long while in conducting butler to the door of the cottage at st leonard's yet the space which we have occupied in the preceding narrative does not exceed in length that which he actually spent on salisbury crags on the morning which succeeded the execution 
done upon porteus by the rioters for this delay he had his own motives he wished to collect his thoughts strangely agitated as they were first by the melancholy news of effie dean's situation and afterwards by the frightful scene which he had witnessed in the situation also in which he stood with respect to jeanie and her father some ceremony at least some choice of fitting time and season was necessary to wait upon them eight in the morning was then the ordinary hour for breakfast and he resolved that it should arrive before he made his appearance in their cottage never did hours pass so heavily butler shifted his place and enlarged his circle to while away the time and heard the huge bell of st giles's toll each successive hour in swelling tones which were instantly attested by those of the other steeples in succession he had heard seven struck in this manner when he began to think he might venture to approach nearer to st leonard's from which he was still a mile distant accordingly he descended from his lofty station as low as the bottom of the valley which divides salisbury crags from those small rocks which take their name from st leonard it is as many of my readers may know a deep wild grassy valley scattered with huge rocks and fragments which have descended from the cliffs and steep ascent to the east this sequestered dell as well as other places of the open pasturage of the king's park was about this time often the resort of the gallants of the time who had affairs of honour to discuss with the sword duels were then very common in scotland for the gentry were at once idle haughty fierce divided by faction and addicted to intemperance so that there lacked neither provocation nor inclination to resent it when given and the sword which was part of every gentleman's dress was the only weapon used for the decision of such differences when therefore butler observed a young man skulking apparently to avoid observation among the scattered rocks at some distance from the footpath he was naturally led to suppose that he had sought this lonely spot upon that evil errand he was so strongly impressed with this that notwithstanding his own distress of mind he could not according to his sense of duty as a clergyman pass this person without speaking to him there are times thought he to himself when the slightest interference may avert a great calamity when a word spoken in season may do more for prevention than the eloquence of tully could do for remedying evil and for my own griefs be they as they may i shall feel them the lighter if they divert me not from the prosecution of my duty thus thinking and feeling he quitted the ordinary path and advanced nearer the object he had noticed the man at first directed his course towards the hill in order as it appeared to avoid him but when he saw that butler seemed disposed to follow him he adjusted his hat fiercely turned round and came forward as if to meet and defy scrutiny butler had an opportunity of accurately studying his features as they advanced slowly to meet each other the stranger seemed about twenty-five years old his dress was of a kind which could hardly be said to indicate his rank with certainty for it was such as young gentlemen sometimes wore while on active exercise in the morning and which therefore was imitated by those of the inferior ranks as young clerks and tradesmen 
because its cheapness rendered it attainable while it approached more nearly to the apparel of youths of fashion than any other which the manners of the times permitted them to wear if his air and manner could be trusted however this person seemed rather to be dressed under than above his rank for his carriage was bold and somewhat supercilious his step easy and free his manner daring and unconstrained his stature was of the middle size or rather above it his limbs well proportioned yet not so strong as to infer the reproach of clumsiness his features were uncommonly handsome and all about him would have been interesting and prepossessing but for that indescribable expression which habitual dissipation gives to the countenance joined with a certain audacity in look and manner of that kind which is often assumed as a mask for confusion and apprehension butler and the stranger met surveyed each other when as the latter slightly touching his hat was about to pass by him butler while he returned the salutation observed a fine morning sir you are on the hill early i have business here said the young man in a tone meant to repress farther inquiry i do not doubt it sir said butler i trust you will forgive my hoping that it is of a lawful kind sir said the other with marked surprise i never forgive impertinence nor can i conceive what title you have to hope anything about what no way concerns you i am a soldier sir said butler and have a charge to arrest evildoers in the name of my master a soldier said the young man stepping back and fiercely laying his hand on his sword a soldier and arrest me did you reckon what your life was worth before you took the commission upon you you mistake me sir said butler gravely neither my warfare nor my warrant are of this world i am a preacher of the gospel and have power in my master's name to command the peace upon earth and good will towards men which was proclaimed with the gospel a minister said the stranger carelessly and with an expression approaching to scorn i know the gentlemen of your cloth in scotland claim a strange right of intermeddling with men's private affairs but i have been abroad and know better than to be priest ridden sir if it be true that any of my cloth or it might be more decently said of my calling interfere with men's private affairs for the gratification either of idle curiosity or for worse motives you cannot have learned a better lesson abroad than to contemn such practices but in my master's work i am called to be busy in season and out of season and conscious as i am of a pure motive it were better for me to incur your contempt for speaking than the correction of my own conscience for being silent in the name of the devil said the young man impatiently say what you have to say then though whom you take me for or what earthly concern you have with me a stranger to you or with my actions and motives of which you can know nothing i cannot conjecture for an instant you are about said butler to violate one of your country's wisest laws you are about which is much more dreadful to violate a law which god himself has implanted within our nature and written as it were in the table of our hearts to which every thrill of our nerves is responsive and what is the law you speak of said the stranger in a hollow and somewhat disturbed accent thou shalt do no murder said butler 
with a deep and solemn voice the young man visibly started and looked considerably appalled butler perceived he had made a favourable impression and resolved to follow it up think he said young man laying his hand kindly upon the stranger's shoulder what an awful alternative you voluntarily choose for yourself to kill or be killed think what it is to rush uncalled into the presence of an offended deity your heart fermenting with evil passions your hand hot from the steel you had been urging with your best skill and malice against the breast of a fellow-creature or suppose yourself the scarce less wretched survivor with the guilt of cain the first murderer in your heart with the stamp upon your brow that stamp which struck all who gazed on him with unutterable horror and by which the murderer is made manifest to all who look upon him think the stranger gradually withdrew himself from under the hand of his monitor and pulling his hat over his brows thus interrupted him your meaning sir i dare say is excellent but you are throwing your advice away i am not in this place with violent intentions against any one i may be bad enough you priests say all men are so but i am here for the purpose of saving life not of taking it away if you wish to spend your time rather in doing a good action than in talking about you know not what i will give you an opportunity do you see yonder crag to the right over which appears the chimney of a lone house go thither inquire for one jeanie deans the daughter of the good man let her know that he she wots of remained here from daybreak till this hour expecting to see her and that he can abide no longer tell her she must meet me at the hunter's bog to-night as the moon rises behind st anthony's hill or that she will make a desperate man of me who or what are you replied butler exceedingly and most unpleasantly surprised who charge me with such an errand i am the devil answered the young man hastily butler stepped instinctively back and commanded himself internally to heaven for though a wise and strong-minded man he was neither wiser nor more strong-minded than those of his age and education with whom to disbelieve witchcraft or spectres was held an undeniable proof of atheism the stranger went on without observing his emotion yes call me apollyon abaddon whatever name you shall choose as a clergyman acquainted with the upper and lower circles of spiritual denomination to call me by you shall not find an appellation more odious to him that bears it than is mine own this sentence was spoken with the bitterness of self-upbraiding and a contortion of visage absolutely demoniacal butler though a man brave by principle if not by constitution was overawed for intensity of mental distress has in it a sort of sublimity which repels and overawes all men but especially those of kind and sympathetic dispositions the stranger turned abruptly from butler as he spoke but instantly returned and coming up to him closely and boldly said in a fierce determined tone i have told you who and what i am who and what are you what is your name butler answered the person to whom this abrupt question was addressed surprised into answering it by the sudden and fierce manner of the querist reuben butler a preacher of the gospel 
at this answer the stranger again plucked more deep over his brows the hat which he had thrown back in his former agitation butler he repeated the assistant of the schoolmaster at liberton the same answered butler composedly the stranger covered his face with his hand as if on sudden reflection and then turned away but stopped when he had walked a few paces and seeing butler follow him with his eyes called out in a stern yet suppressed tone just as if he had exactly calculated that his accents should not be heard a yard beyond the spot on which butler stood go your way and do mine errand do not look after me i will neither descend through the bowels of these rocks nor vanish in a flash of fire and yet the eye that seeks to trace my motions shall have reason to curse it was ever shrouded by eyelid or eyelash be gone and look not behind you tell jeanie deans that when the moon rises i shall expect to meet her at nicol mushat's cairn beneath st anthony's chapel as he uttered these words he turned and took the road against the hill with a haste that seemed as peremptory as his tone of authority dreading he knew not what of additional misery to a lot which seemed little capable of receiving augmentation and desperate at the idea that any living man should dare to send so extraordinary a request couched in terms so imperious to the half-betrothed object of his early and only affection butler strode hastily towards the cottage in order to ascertain how far this daring and rude gallant was actually entitled to press on jeanie deans a request which no prudent and scarce any modest young woman was likely to comply with butler was by nature neither jealous nor superstitious yet the feelings which led to those moods of the mind were rooted in his heart as a portion derived from the common stock of humanity it was maddening to think that a profligate gallant such as the manner and tone of the stranger evinced him to be should have it in his power to command forth his future bride and plighted true love at a place so improper and an hour so unseasonable yet the tone in which the stranger spoke had nothing of the soft half-breathed voice proper to the seducer who solicits an assignation it was bold fierce and imperative and had less of love in it than of menace and intimidation the suggestions of superstition seemed more plausible had butler's mind been very accessible to them was this indeed the roaring lion who goeth about seeking whom he may devour this was a question which pressed itself on butler's mind with an earnestness that cannot be conceived by those who live in the present day the fiery eye the abrupt demeanour the occasionally harsh yet studiously subdued tone of voice the features handsome but now clouded with pride now disturbed by suspicion now inflamed with passion those dark hazel eyes which he sometimes shaded with his cap as if he were averse to have them seen while they were occupied with keenly observing the motions and bearing of others those eyes which were now turbid with melancholy now gleaming with scorn and now sparkling with fury was it the passions of a mere mortal they expressed or the emotions of a fiend who seeks and seeks in vain to conceal his fiendish designs under the borrowed mask of manly beauty the whole partook of the mien 
language and port of the ruined archangel and imperfectly as we have been able to describe it the effect of the interview upon butler's nerves shaken as they were at the time by the horrors of the preceding night were greater than his understanding warranted or his pride cared to submit to the very place where he had met this singular person was desecrated as it were and unhallowed owing to many violent deaths both in duels and by suicide which had in former times taken place there and the place which he had named as a rendezvous at so late an hour was held in general to be accursed from a frightful and cruel murder which had been there committed by the wretch from whom the place took its name upon the person of his own wife it was in such places according to the belief of that period when the laws against witchcraft were still in fresh observance and had even lately been acted upon that evil spirits had power to make themselves visible to human eyes and to practise upon the feelings and senses of mankind suspicions founded on such circumstances rushed on butler's mind unprepared as it was by any previous course of reasoning to deny that which all of his time country and profession believed but common sense rejected these vain ideas as inconsistent if not with possibility at least with the general rules by which the universe is governed a deviation from which as butler well argued with himself ought not to be admitted as probable upon any but the plainest and most incontrovertible evidence an earthly lover however or a young man who from whatever cause had the right of exercising such summary and unceremonious authority over the object of his long settled and apparently sincerely returned affection was an object scarce less appalling to his mind than those which superstition suggested his limbs exhausted with fatigue his mind harassed with anxiety and with painful doubts and recollections butler dragged himself up the ascent from the valley to st leonard's crags and presented himself at the door of deans's habitation with feelings much akin to the miserable reflections and fears of its inhabitants End of chapter tenth Chapter Eleventh of *The Heart of Midlothian* by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Then she stretched out her lily hand, and for to do her best, have back thy faith and troth, Willie. God give thy soul good rest. Old ballad come in answered the low and sweet-toned voice he loved best to hear as butler tapped at the door of the cottage he lifted the latch and found himself under the roof of affliction jeanie was unable to trust herself with more than one glance towards her lover whom she now met under circumstances so agonizing to her feelings and at the same time so humbling to her honest pride it is well known that much both of what is good and bad in the scottish national character arises out of the intimacy of their family connections to become of honest folk that is of people who have borne a fair and unstained reputation is an advantage as highly prized among the lower scotch as the emphatic counterpart to be of a good family is valued among their gentry the worth and respectability 
of one member of a peasant's family is always accounted by themselves and others not only a matter of honest pride but a guarantee for the good conduct of the whole on the contrary such a melancholy stain as now was flung on one of the children of deans extended its disgrace to all connected with him and jeanie felt herself lowered at once in her own eyes and in those of her lover it was in vain that she repressed this feeling as far subordinate and too selfish to be mingled with her sorrow for her sister's calamity nature prevailed and while she shed tears for her sister's distress and danger there mingled with them bitter drops of grief for her own degradation as butler entered the old man was seated by the fire with his well-worn pocket-bible in his hands the companion of the wanderings and dangers of his youth and bequeathed to him on the scaffold by one of those who in the year sixteen eighty six sealed their enthusiastic principles with their blood the sun sent its rays through a small window at the old man's back and shining moddy through the reek to use the expression of a bard of that time and country illumined the gray hairs of the old man and the sacred page which he studied his features far from handsome and rather harsh and severe had yet from their expression of habitual gravity and contempt for earthly things an expression of stoical dignity amidst their sternness he boasted in no small degree the attributes which southey ascribes to the ancient scandinavians whom he terms firm to inflict and stubborn to endure the whole formed a picture of which the lights might have been given by rembrandt but the outline would have required the force and vigour of michael angelo deans lifted his eye as butler entered and instantly withdrew it as from an object which gave him at once surprise and sudden pain he had assumed such high ground with this carnal-witted scholar as he had in his pride termed butler that to meet him of all men under feelings of humiliation aggravated his misfortune and was a consummation like that of the dying chief in the old ballad earl percy sees my fall deans raised the bible with his left hand so as partly to screen his face and putting back his right as far as he could held it towards butler in that position at the same time turning his body from him as if to prevent his seeing the working of his countenance butler clasped the extended hand which had supported his orphan infancy wept over it and in vain endeavoured to say more than the words god comfort you god comfort you he will he doth my friend said deans assuming firmness as he discovered the agitation of his guest he doth now and he will yet more in his own good time i have been over proud of my sufferings in a good cause reuben and now i am to be tried with those whilk will turn my pride and glory into a reproach and a hissing how muckle better i have thought myself than them that lay soft fed sweet and drank deep when i was in the moss hags and moors with precious donald cameron and worthy mr blackadder called guess again and how proud i was of being made a spectacle to men and angels having stood on their pillory at the cannon gate afore i was fifteen years old for the cause of a national covenant to think reuben that i what have been so honoured and exalted in my youth nay when i was but a halfland's callant 
and that have borne testimony again the defections of the times yearly monthly daily hourly minutely striving and testifying with uplifted hand and voice crying aloud and sparing not against all great national snares as the nation wasting and church sinking abomination of union toleration and patronage imposed by the last woman of that unhappy race of stuarts also against the infringements and invasions of the just powers of eldership whereanent i uttered my paper called a cry of an howl in the desert printed at the bowhead and sold by all flying stationers in town and country and now here he paused it may well be supposed that butler though not absolutely coinciding in all the good old man's ideas about church government had too much consideration and humanity to interrupt him while he reckoned up with conscious pride his sufferings and the constancy of his testimony on the contrary when he paused under the influence of the bitter recollections of the moment butler instantly threw in his might of encouragement you have been well known my old and revered friend a true and tried follower of the cross one who as saint jerome hath it per infamium et bonum famum grassari ad immortalitatum which may be freely rendered who rushes on to immortal life through bad report and good report you have been one of those to whom the tender and fearful souls cry during the midnight solitude watchman what of the night watchman what of the night and assuredly this heavy dispensation as it comes not without divine permission so it comes not without its special commission and use i do receive it as such said poor deans returning the grasp of butler's hand and if i have not been taught to read the scripture in any other tongue but my native scottish even in his distress butler's latin quotation had not escaped his notice i have nevertheless so learned them that i trust to bear even this crook in my lot with submission but oh reuben butler the kirk of whilk though unworthy i have yet been thought a polished shaft and meet to be a pillar holding from my youth upward the place of ruling elder what will the lightsome and profane think of the guide that cannot keep his own family from stumbling how will they take up their song and their reproach when they see that the children of professors are liable to as foul backsliding as the offspring of belial but i will bear my cross with the comfort that whatever showed like goodness in me or mine was but like the light that shines from creeping insects on the brace side in a dark night it kiths bright to the eye because all is dark around it but when the morn comes on the mountains it is but a poor crawling kale-worm after all and so it shows with any rag of human righteousness or formal law-work that we may pit round us to cover our shame as he pronounced these words the door again opened and mr bartolin saddletree entered his three-pointed hat set far back on his head with a silk handkerchief beneath it to keep it in that cool position his gold-headed cane in his hand and his whole deportment that of a wealthy burgher who might one day look to have a share in the magistracy, if not actually to hold the curule chair itself rochefoucault who has torn the veil from so many foul gangrenes of the human heart says 
we find something not altogether unpleasant to us in the misfortunes of our best friends mr saddletree would have been very angry had any one told him that he felt pleasure in the disaster of poor effie deans and the disgrace of her family and yet there is great question whether the gratification of playing the person of importance inquiring investigating and laying down the law on the whole affair did not offer to say the least full consolation for the pain which pure sympathy gave him on account of his wife's kinswoman he had now got a piece of real judicial business by the end instead of being obliged as was his common case to intrude his opinion where it was neither wished nor wanted and felt as happy in the exchange as a boy when he gets his first new watch which actually goes when wound up and has real hands and a true dial-plate but besides this subject for legal disquisition bartolin's brains were also overloaded with the affair of porteus his violent death and all its probable consequences to the city and community it was what the french call l'embarras des richesses the confusion arising from too much mental wealth he walked in with a consciousness of double importance full fraught with the superiority of one who possesses more information than the company into which he enters and who feels a right to discharge his learning on them without mercy good morning mr deans good morrow to you mr butler i was not aware that you were acquainted with mr deans butler made some slight answer his reasons may be readily imagined for not making his connection with the family which in his eyes had something of tender mystery a frequent subject of conversation with indifferent persons such as saddletree the worthy burgher in the plenitude of self-importance now sat down upon a chair wiped his brow collected his breath and made the first experiment of the resolved pith of his lungs in a deep and dignified sigh resembling a groan in sound and intonation awful times these neighbor deans awful times sinful shameful heaven daring times answered deans in a lower and more subdued tone for my part continued saddletree swelling with importance what between the distress of my friends and my poor old country any wit that ever i had may be said to have abandoned me so that i sometimes think myself as ignorant as if i were inter rusticos here when i arise in the morning with my mind just arranged touching what's to be done in poor effie's misfortune and have gotten the whole statute at my finger-ends the mob mon get up and strike jock porteus to a diaster's beam and ding all thing out of my head again deeply as he was distressed with his own domestic calamity deans could not help expressing some interest in the news saddletree immediately entered on details of the insurrection and its consequences while butler took the occasion to seek some private conversation with jeanie deans she gave him the opportunity he sought by leaving the room as if in prosecution of some part of her morning labor butler followed her in a few minutes leaving deans so closely engaged by his busy visitor that there was little chance of his observing their absence the scene of their interview was an outer apartment where jeanie was used to busy herself in arranging the productions of her dairy when butler found an opportunity of stealing after her into this place he found her silent dejected and ready to burst into tears instead of the active industry with which she had been accustomed even while in the act of speaking 
to employ her hands in some useful branch of household business she was seated listless in a corner sinking apparently under the weight of her own thoughts yet the instant he entered she dried her eyes and with the simplicity and openness of her character immediately entered on conversation i am glad you have come in mr butler said she for 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 i wished to tell ye that all mon be ended between you and me it's best for both our sakes ended said butler in surprise and for what should it be ended i grant this is a heavy dispensation but it lies neither at your door nor mine it's an evil of god's sending and it must be borne but it cannot break plighted troth genie while they that plighted their word wish to keep it but reuben said the young woman looking at him affectionately i can will that ye think more of me than yourself and reuben i can only in requital think more of your well than of my own ye are a man of spotless name bred to god's ministry and all men say that ye will some day rise high in the kirk though poverty keep ye down even now poverty is a bad back friend reuben and that ye can over well but ill fame is a war one and that is a truth ye shall never learn through my means what do you mean said butler eagerly and impatiently or how do you connect your sister's guilt if guilt there be which i trust in god may yet be disproved with our engagement how can that affect you or me how can you ask me that mr butler will this stain do you think ever be forgotten as long as our heads are upon the ground will it not stick to us and to our bairns and to their very bairns bairns to have been the child of an honest man might have been saying something for me and mine but to be the sister of a oh my god with this exclamation her resolution failed and she burst into a passionate fit of tears the lover used every effort to induce her to compose herself and at length succeeded but she only resumed her composure to express herself with the same positiveness as before no reuben i'll bring disgrace home to no man's hearth my own distresses i can bear and i maun bear but there is no occasion for buckling them on other folks shouthers i shall bear my load alone the back is made for the burden a lover is by charter wayward and suspicious and genie's readiness to renounce their engagement under pretence of zeal for his peace of mind and respectability of character seemed to poor butler to form a portentous combination with the commission of the stranger he had met with that morning his voice faltered as he asked whether nothing but a sense of her sister's present distress occasioned her to talk in that manner and what else can do so she replied with simplicity is it not ten long years since we spoke together in this way ten years said butler it's a long time sufficient perhaps for a woman to weary to weary of her old gown said genie and to wish for a new one if she likes to be brave but not long enough to weary of a friend the eye may wish change but the heart never never said reuben that's a bold promise but no more bold than true said genie with the same quiet simplicity which attended her manner in joy and grief in ordinary affairs and in those which most interested her feelings butler paused and looking at her fixedly i am charged he said with a message to you genie indeed from whom or what can any one have to say to me 
it is from a stranger said butler affecting to speak with an indifference which his voice belied a young man whom i met this morning in the park mercy said jeanie eagerly and what did he say that he did not see you at the hour he expected but required you should meet him alone at mushat's cairn this night so soon as the moon rises tell him said jeanie hastily i shall certainly come may i ask said butler his suspicions increasing at the ready alacrity of the answer who this man is to whom you are so willing to give the meeting at a place and hour so uncommon folk mon do muckle they have little will to do in this world replied jeanie granted said her lover but what compels you to this who is this person what i saw of him was not very favourable who or what is he i do not know replied jeanie composedly you do not know said butler stepping impatiently through the apartment you purpose to meet a young man whom you do not know at such a time and in a place so lonely you say you are compelled to do this and yet you say you do not know the person who exercises such an influence over you jeanie what am i to think of this think only reuben that i speak truth as if i were to answer at the last day i do not ken this man i do not even ken that i ever saw him and yet i must give him the meeting he asks there's life and death upon it will you not tell your father or take him with you said butler i cannot said jeanie i have no permission will you let me go with you i will wait in the park till nightfall and join you when you set out it is impossible said jeanie there mauna be mortal creature within hearing of our conference have you considered well the nature of what you are going to do the time the place an unknown and suspicious character why if he had asked to see you in this house your father sitting in the next room and within call at such an hour you should have refused to see him my weird mon be fulfilled mr butler my life and my safety are in god's hands but i'll not spare to risk either of them on the errand i am going to do then jeanie said butler much displeased we must indeed break short off and bid farewell where there can be no confidence betwixt a man and his plighted wife on such a momentous topic it is a sign that she has no longer the regard for him that makes their engagement safe and suitable jeanie looked at him and sighed i thought she said that i had brought myself to bear this parting but but i did not ken that we were to part in unkindness but i am a woman and you are a man it may be different with you if your mind is made easier by thinking so hardly of me i would not ask you to think otherwise you are said butler what you have always been wiser better and less selfish in your native feelings than i can be with all the helps philosophy can give to a christian but why why will you persevere in an undertaking so desperate why will you not let me be your assistant your protector or at least your adviser just because i cannot and i dare not answered jeanie but hark what's that surely my father is no well in fact the voices in the next room became obstreperously loud of a sudden the cause of which vociferation it is necessary to explain before we go farther when jeanie and butler retired mr saddletree entered upon the business which chiefly interested the family in the commencement of their conversation he found old deans 
who in his usual state of mind was no granter of propositions so much subdued by a deep sense of his daughter's danger and disgrace that he heard without replying to or perhaps without understanding one or two learned disquisitions on the nature of the crime imputed to her charge and on the steps which ought to be taken in consequence his only answer at each pause was i am no misdoubting that you wis us will your wife's our faraway cousin encouraged by these symptoms of acquiescence saddletree who as an amateur of the law had a supreme deference for all constituted authorities again recurred to his other topic of interest the murder namely of porteus and pronounced a severe censure on the parties concerned these are kittle times kittle times mr deans when the people take the power of life and death out of the hands of the rightful magistrate into their own rough grip i am of opinion and so i believe will mr crossmyloof and the privy council that this rising in a fair of war to take away the life of a reprieved man will prove little better than perduelian if i hadna that on my mind whilk is ill to bear mr saddletree said deans i would make bold to dispute that point with you how could you dispute what's plain law man said saddletree somewhat contemptuously there's no a callant that ever carried a pock with a process in it but will tell you that perduelian is the worst and most virulent kind of treason being an open convocating of the king's lieges against his authority more especially in arms and by took of drum to bathe whilk accessories my eye and lugs bore witness and muckle worse than lease majesty or the concealment of a treasonable purpose it winna bear a dispute neighbour but it will though retorted douse davy deans i tell ye it will bear a disputer never like your cold legal formal doctrines neighbour saddletree i had unco little by the parliament house since the awful downfall of the hopes of honest folk that followed the revolution but what would ye have had mr deans said saddletree impatiently did not ye get both liberty and conscience made fast and settled by Talsey on you and your heirs for ever mr saddletree retorted deans i ken ye are one of those that are wise after the manner of this world and that ye hand your part and cast in your portion with the lang heads and lang gowns and keep with the smart witty pated lawyers of this our land weary on the dark and doleful cast that they have given this unhappy kingdom when their black hands of defection were clasped in the red hands of our sworn murderers when those who had numbered the towers of our zion and marked the bulwarks of reformation saw their hope turn into a snare and their rejoicing into weeping i cannot understand this neighbour answered saddletree i am an honest presbyterian of the kirk of scotland and stand by her and the general assembly and the due administration of justice by the fifteen lords of session and the five lords of justiciary out upon ye mr saddletree exclaimed david who in an opportunity of giving his testimony on the offences and backslidings of the land forgot for a moment his own domestic calamity out upon your general assembly and the back of my hand to your court of session what is the tain but a woeful bunch of caldriff professors and ministers that sat bein and warm when the persecuted remnant 
were wrestling with hunger and cold and fear of death and danger of fire and sword upon wet braesides peat hags and flow mosses and that now creep out of their holes like bluebottle fleas in a blink of sunshine to take the pulpits and places of better folk of them that witnessed and testified and fought and endured pit prison-house and transportation beyond seas a bonny bike there's of them and for your court of session ye may say what ye will of the general assembly said saddletree interrupting him and let them clear them that kens them but as for the lords of session for be that they are my next-door neighbours i would have ye ken for your own regulation that to raise scandal anent them whilk is termed to murmur again them is a crime sui generis sui generis mr deans ken ye what that amounts to i ken little of the language of antichrist said deans and i care less than little what carnal courts may call the speeches of honest men and as to murmur again them it's what all the folk that loses their pleas and nine-tenths of them that win them will be gay sure to be guilty in so i would have ye ken that i hand all your gleg-tongued advocates that sell their knowledge for pieces of silver and your worldly wise judges that will give three days of hearing in presence to a debate about the peeling of an ingan and no one half hour to the gospel testimony as legalists and formalists countenancing by sentences and quirks and cunning terms of law the late begun courses of national defections union toleration patronages and eurastian prelatic oaths as for the soul and body killing court of justiciary the habit of considering his life as dedicated to bear testimony in behalf of what he deemed the suffering and deserted cause of true religion had swept honest david along with it thus far but the mention of the criminal court the recollection of the disastrous condition of his daughter rushed at once on his mind he stopped short in the midst of his triumphant declamation pressed his hands against his forehead and remained silent saddletree was somewhat moved but apparently not so much as to induce him to relinquish the privilege of prosing in his turn afforded him by david's sudden silence no doubt neighbor he said it's a sore thing to have to do with courts of law unless it be to improve one's knowledge and practique by waiting on as a hearer and touching this unhappy affair of effie ye'll have seen the didde doubtless he dragged out of his pocket a bundle of papers and began to turn them over this is no it this is the information of mungo marsport of that ilk against captain lackland for coming on his lands of marsport with hawks hounds lying dogs nets guns crossbows hagbuts of found or other engines more or less for destruction of game sick as red deer fallow deer capper calzies grey fowl moor fowl patricks herons and sick like he the said defender not being one qualified person in terms of the statute sixteen hundred and twenty one that is not having one ploughgate of land now the defences proponed say that non constat at this present what is a ploughgate of land while uncertainty is sufficient to elide the conclusions of the libel but then the answers to the defences they are signed by mr crossmyloof but mr younglad drew them they propone that it signifies nothing in hoc statu 
what or how muckle a ploughgate of land may be in respect the defender has no lands whatsoever less or more so grant a ploughgate here saddletree read from the paper in his hand to be less than the nineteenth part of a goose's grass i trow mr crossmyloof put in that i ken his style of a goose's grass what the better will the defender be seeing he has na a divot cast of land in scotland advocatus for lackland duplies that nil interest de possession the pursuer must put his case under the statute now this is worth your notice neighbour and must show formaliter et specialiter as well as generaliter what is the qualification that defender lackland does not possess let him tell me what a ploughgate of land is and i'll tell him if i have one or no surely the pursuer is bound to understand his own libel and his own statute that he founds upon tidius pursues mavius for recovery of one black horse lent to mavius surely he shall have judgment but if tidius pursue mavius for one scarlet or crimson horse doubtless he shall be bound to show that there is such one animal in rerum natura no man can be bound to plead to nonsense that is to say to a charge which cannot be explained or understood he's rang there the better the pleadings the fewer understand them and so the reference unto this undefined and unintelligible measure of land is as if a penalty was inflicted by statute for any man who should hunt or hawk or use lying dogs and wearing a sky-blue pair of breeches without having but i am wearying you mr deans we'll pass to your own business though this cue of marsport against lackland has made an unco din in the outer house well here's the ditte against poor effie whereas it is humbly meant and shown to us etc they are words of mere style that whereas by the laws of this and every other well-regulated realm the murder of any one more especially of an infant child is a crime of one high nature and severely punishable and whereas without prejudice to the foresaid generality it was by one act made in the second session of the first parliament of our most high and dread sovereigns william and mary especially enacted that one woman who shall have concealed her condition and shall not be able to show that she hath called for help at the birth in case that the child shall be found dead or amissing shall be deemed and held guilty of the murder thereof and the said facts of concealment and pregnancy being found proven or confessed shall sustain the pains of law accordingly yet nevertheless you effie or euphemia deans read no farther said deans raising his head up i would rather ye thrust a sword into my heart than read a word farther well neighbour said saddletree i thought it would have comforted ye to ken the best and the worst of it but the question is what's to be done nothing answered deans firmly but to abide the dispensation that the lord sees meet to send us oh if it had been his will to take the grey head to rest before this awful visitation on my house and name but his will be done i can say that yet though i can say little more but neighbour said saddletree ye'll retain advocates for the poor lassie it's a thing mon needs be thought of if there was a man of them answered deans that held fast his integrity but i ken them well 
they are all carnal crafty and world-hunting self-seekers eurastians and arminians every one of them how tout neighbor ye mauna take the world at its word said saddletree the very devil is no so ill as he's called and i can more than one advocate that may be said to have some integrity as well as their neighbours that is after a sort of fashion of their own it is indeed but a fashion of integrity that ye will find among them replied david deans and a fashion of wisdom and fashion of carnal learning gazing glancing glasses they are fit only to fling the glates in folks eyes with their pocky policy and earthly engine their flights and refinements and periods of eloquence from heathen emperors and popish canons they canna in that daft trash ye were reading to me so muckle as calm men that are so ill starred as to be among their hands by any name of the dispensation of grace but mon knew baptize them by the names of the accursed titus what was made the instrument of burning the holy temple and other sick like heathens tis titius interrupted saddletree and no titus mr crossmyloof cares as little about titus or the latin as ye do but it's a case of necessity she maun have counsel now i could speak to mr crossmyloof he's will kenned for a round spun presbyterian and a ruling elder to boot he's a rank eurastian replied deans one of the public and politious worldly wise men that stood up to prevent one general owning of the cause in the day of power what say ye to the old laird of cuffabout said saddletree he whiles thumps the dust out of a case gay and well he the foss loon answered deans he was in his bandoliers to have joined the ungracious highlanders in seventeen fifteen and they had ever had the luck to cross the firth well arniston there's a clever child for ye said bartolin triumphantly ay to bring popish medals in till their very library from that schematic woman in the north the duchess of gordon well well but somebody ye maun have what think she of kittlepunt he's an arminian woodsetter he's i doubt a cocaian old Wha? he's anything ye like young nemo he's nothing at all ye're ill to please neighbor said saddletree i have run over the pick of them for you ye mun even choose for yourself but bethink ye that in the multitude of counsellors there's safety what say ye to try young mackenyi he has all his uncle's practiques at the tongue's end what sir would ye speak to me exclaimed the sturdy presbyterian in excessive wrath about a man that has the blood of the saints at his fingers ends did na his im die and gang to his place with the name of the bloody mckenny and winna he be kenned by that name so long as there's a scot's tongue to speak the word if the life of the dear bairn that's under a suffering dispensation and genies and my own and all mankind's depended on my asking sick a slave of satan to speak a word for me or them they should all go down the water together for davy deans it was the exalted tone in which he spoke this last sentence that broke up the conversation between butler and genie and brought them both ben the house to use the language of the country here they found the poor old man half frantic between grief and zealous ire against saddletree's proposed measures his cheek inflamed his hand clenched and his voice raised while the tear in his eye 
and the occasional quiver of his accents showed that his utmost efforts were inadequate to shaking off the consciousness of his misery butler apprehensive of the consequences of his agitation to an aged and feeble frame ventured to utter to him a recommendation to patience i am patient returned the old man sternly more patient than any one who is alive to the woeful backslidings of a miserable time can be patient and in so much that i need neither sectarians nor sons nor grandsons of sectarians to instruct my grey hairs how to bear my cross but sir continued butler taking no offence at the slur cast on his grandfather's faith we must use human means when you call in a physician you would not i suppose question him on the nature of his religious principles would i know answered david but i would though and if he didna satisfy me that he had a right sense of the right hand and left hand defections of the day not a gout of his physic should gang through my father's son it is a dangerous thing to trust to an illustration butler had done so and miscarried but like a gallant soldier when his musket misses fire he stood his ground and charged with the bayonet this is too rigid an interpretation of your duty sir the sun shines and the rain descends on the just and unjust and they are placed together in life in circumstances which frequently render intercourse between them indispensable perhaps that the evil may have an opportunity of being converted by the good and perhaps also that the righteous might among other trials be subjected to that of occasional converse with the profane you're a silly callant reuben answered deans with your bits of argument can a man touch pitch and not be defiled or what think ye of the brave and worthy champions of the covenant that wouldna so muckle as hear a minister speak be his gifts and graces as they would that hadna witnessed against the enormities of the day no lawyer shall ever speak for me and mine that hasna concurred in the testimony of the scattered yet lovely remnant which abode in the clifts of the rocks so saying and as if fatigued both with the arguments and presence of his guests the old man arose and seeming to bid them adieu with a motion of his head and hand went to shut himself up in his sleeping apartment it's throwing his daughter's life away said saddletree to butler to hear him speak in that daft gate where will he ever get a cameronian advocate or whatever heard of a lawyer's suffering either for one religion or another the lassie's life is clean flung away during the latter part of this debate dumby dykes had arrived at the door dismounted hung the pony's bridle on the usual hook and sunk down on his ordinary settle his eyes with more than their usual animation followed first one speaker then another till he caught the melancholy sense of the whole from saddletree's last words he rose from his seat stumped slowly across the room and coming up close to saddletree's ear said in a tremulous anxious voice will will siller do nothing for them mr saddletree umph said saddletree looking grave siller will certainly do it in the parliament house if anything can do it but where's the siller to come from mr deans ye see will do nothing and though mrs saddletree's their far away friend and right good well-wisher and is well disposed to assist yet she wouldna like to stand 
to be bound singly in solidum to such an expensive work an ilka friend would bear a share of the burden something might be done ilka one to be liable for their own input i wouldna like to see the case far through without being pled it wouldna be creditable for all that daft wig body says i'll i will yes assuming fortitude i will be answerable said dumby dykes for a score of puns sterling and he was silent staring in astonishment at finding himself capable of such unwonted resolution and excessive generosity god almighty bless ye laird said jeanie in a transport of gratitude ye may call the twenty pounds thready said dumby dykes looking bashfully away from her and towards saddletree that will do bravely said saddletree rubbing his hands and ye sall have all my skill and knowledge to gear the siller gang far i'll tape it out well i ken how to guard the burkies take short fees and be glad of them too it's only garing them tro ye have twa or three cases of importance coming on and they'll work cheap to get custom let me alone for willie wang an advocate it's no sin to get as muckle flew them for our siller as we can after all it's but the wind of their mouth it costs them nothing whereas in my wretched occupation of a saddler horse milliner and harness maker we are out unconscionable sums just for bark and hides and leather can i be of no use said butler my means alas are only worth the black coat i wear but i am young i owe much to the family can i do nothing ye can help to collect evidence sir said saddletree if ye could but find any one to say that she had given the least hint of her condition she would be brought aft with a watt finger mr crossmeloof telled me so the crown says he cannot be craved to prove a positive wasn't a positive or a negative they couldna be called to prove it was the tain or the tither of them i am sure and it makes no muckle matter whilk wherefore says he the libel maun be redargued by the panel proving her defences and it canna be done otherwise but the fact sir argued butler the fact that this poor girl has borne a child surely the crown lawyers must prove that said butler saddletree paused a moment while the visage of dumby dykes which traversed as if it had been placed on a pivot from the one spokesman to the other assumed a more blithe expression yeah 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 yes said saddletree after some grave hesitation unquestionably that is a thing to be proved as the court will more fully declare by an interlocutor of relevancy in common form but i fancy that job's done already for she has confessed her guilt confessed the murder exclaimed jeanie with a scream that made them all start no i didna say that replied bartolin but she confessed bearing the babe and what became of it then said jeanie for not a word could i get from her but bitter sighs and tears she says it was taken away from her by the woman in whose house it was born and who assisted her at the time and who was that woman said butler surely by her means the truth might be discovered who was she i will fly to her directly i wish said dumby dykes i were as young and as supple as you and had the gift of the gab as well who is she again reiterated butler impatiently who could that woman be ay what kens that but herself said saddletree she deponed farther and declined to answer that interrogatory then to herself will i instantly go said butler 
farewell jeanie then coming close up to her take no rash steps till you hear from me farewell and he immediately left the cottage i would gang too said the landed proprietor in an anxious jealous and repining tone but my powny winna for the life of me gang any other road than just from dumbydykes to this house end and so straight back again ye'll do better for them said saddletree as they left the house together by sending me the thready pounds thready pounds hesitated dumby dykes who was now out of the reach of those eyes which had inflamed his generosity i only said twenty pounds ay but said saddletree that was under protestation to add and ike and so ye craved leave to amend your libel and made it thready did i i dinna mind that i did answered dumby dykes but whatever i said i'll stand to then bestriding his steed with some difficulty he added dinna ye think poor jeanie's eyes with the tears in them glanced like lamour beads mr saddletree i canna muckle about women's eyes laird replied the insensible bartolin and i care just as little i was i were as well free of their tongues though few wives he added recollecting the necessity of keeping up his character for domestic rule are under better command than mine laird i allow neither perdwellian nor less majesty against my sovereign authority the laird saw nothing so important in this observation as to call for a rejoinder and when they had exchanged a mute salutation they parted in peace upon their different errands End of chapter eleventh chapter twelfth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. I'll warrant that fellow from drowning, were the ship no stronger than a nutshell, the tempest. Butler felt neither fatigue nor want of refreshment, although from the mode in which he had spent the night he might well have been overcome with either but in the earnestness with which he hastened to the assistance of the sister of Jeanie Deans, he forgot both. In his first progress he walked with so rapid a pace as almost approached to running, when he was surprised to hear behind him a call upon his name, contending with an asthmatic cough and half drowned amid the resounding trot of a highland pony he looked behind and saw the laird of dumby dykes making after him with what speed he might for it happened fortunately for the laird's purpose of conversing with butler that his own road homeward was for about two hundred yards the same with that which led by the nearest way to the city butler stopped when he heard himself thus summoned internally wishing no good to the panting equestrian who thus retarded his journey ha ah ah ejaculated dumby dykes as he checked the hobbling pace of the pony by our friend butler ah ah it's a hard-set williard beast this a mine he had in fact just overtaken the object of his chase at the very point beyond which it would have been absolutely impossible for him to have continued the pursuit since there butler's road parted from that leading to dumby dykes and no means of influence or compulsion which the rider could possibly have used towards his bucephalus could have induced the celtic obstinacy of roy bean such was the pony's name to have diverged a yard from the path that conducted him to his own paddock 
even when he had recovered from the shortness of breath occasioned by a trot much more rapid than roy or he were accustomed to the high purpose of dumby dykes seemed to stick as it were in his throat and impede his utterance so that butler stood for nearly three minutes ere he could utter a syllable and when he did find voice it was only to say after one or two efforts ah ah um i say mr mr butler it's a bra day for the harst fine day indeed said butler i wish you good morning sir stay stay a bit rejoined dumby dykes that was no what i had gotten to say then pray be quick and let me have your commands rejoined butler i crave your pardon but i am in haste and tempus nemini you know the proverb dumby dykes did not know the proverb nor did he even take the trouble to endeavour to look as if he did as others in his place might have done he was concentrating all his intellects for one grand proposition and could not afford any detachment to defend outposts i say mr butler said he can ye if mr saddletree's a great lawyer i have no person's word for it but his own answered butler dryly but undoubtedly he best understands his own qualities umph replied the taciturn dumby dykes in a tone which seemed to say mr butler i take your meaning in that case he pursued i'll employ my own man of business nickel novit old nickel's son and a must as gleg as his father to agent effie's plea and having thus displayed more sagacity than butler expected from him he courteously touched his gold-laced cocked hat and by a punch on the ribs conveyed to roy bean it was his writer's pleasure that he should forthwith proceed homewards a hint which the quadruped obeyed with that degree of alacrity with which men and animals interpret and obey suggestions that entirely correspond with their own inclinations butler resumed his pace not without a momentary revival of that jealousy which the honest laird's attention to the family of deans had at different times excited in his bosom but he was too generous long to nurse any feeling which was allied to selfishness he is said butler to himself rich in what i want why should i feel vexed that he has the heart to dedicate some of his pelf to render them services which i can only form the empty wish of executing in god's name let us each do what we can may she be but happy saved from the misery and disgrace that seems impending let me but find the means of preventing the fearful experiment of this evening and farewell to other thoughts though my heart-strings break in parting with them he redoubled his pace and soon stood before the door of the tow-booth or rather before the entrance where the door had formerly been placed his interview with the mysterious stranger the message to Jeanie, his agitating conversation with her on the subject of breaking off their mutual engagements and the interesting scene with old deans had so entirely occupied his mind as to drown even recollection of the tragical event which he had witnessed the preceding evening his attention was not recalled to it by the groups who stood scattered on the street in conversation 
which they hushed when strangers approached or by the bustling search of the agents of the city police supported by small parties of the military or by the appearance of the guard-house before which were treble sentinels or finally by the subdued and intimidated looks of the lower orders of society who conscious that they were liable to suspicion if they were not guilty of accession to a riot likely to be strictly inquired into glided about with an humble and dismayed aspect like men whose spirits being exhausted in the revel and the dangers of a desperate debauch overnight are nerves shaken timorous and unenterprising on the succeeding day none of these symptoms of alarm and trepidation struck butler whose mind was occupied with a different and to him still more interesting subject until he stood before the entrance to the prison and saw it defended by a double file of grenadiers instead of bolts and bars there stand stand the blackened appearance of the doorless gateway and the winding staircase and apartments of the tolbooth now open to the public eye recalled the whole proceedings of the eventful night upon his requesting to speak with effie deans the same tall thin silver-haired turnkey whom he had seen on the preceding evening made his appearance i think he replied to butler's request of admission with true scottish indirectness ye will be the same lad that was for in to see her yestreen butler admitted that he was the same person and i am thinking pursued the turnkey that ye speered at me when we locked up and if we locked up earlier on account of porteus very likely i might make some such observation said butler but the question now is can i see effie deans i dinna ken gang in by and up the turnpike stair and turn till the ward on the left hand the old man followed close behind him with his keys in his hand not forgetting even that huge one which had once opened and shut the outward gate of his dominions though at present it was but an idle and useless burden no sooner had butler entered the room to which he was directed than the experienced hand of the warder selected the proper key and locked it on the outside at first butler conceived this manoeuvre was only an effect of the man's habitual and official caution and jealousy but when he heard the hoarse command turn out the guard and immediately afterwards heard the clash of a sentinel's arms as he was posted at the door of his apartment he again called out to the turnkey my good friend i have business of some consequence with effie deans and i beg to see her as soon as possible no answer was returned if it be against your rules to admit me repeated butler in a still louder tone to see the prisoner i beg you will tell me so and let me go about my business fugit irrevocable tempus muttered he to himself if ye had business to do ye should have done it before ye came here replied the man of keys from the outside ye'll find it's easier one and in than one and out here there's some likelihood of another porteous mob coming to rabble us again the law will hold her own now neighbour and that ye'll find to your cost what do you mean by that sir retorted butler you must mistake me for some other person my name is reuben butler preacher of the gospel i ken that well enough said the turnkey well then if you know me i have a right to know from you in return what warrant you have for detaining me 
that i know is the right of every british subject warrant said the jailer the warrant's away to liberton with twas sheriff officers seeking ye if ye had stayed at home as honest men should do ye would have seen the warrant but if ye come to be incarcerated of your own accord what can help it my joe so i cannot see effie deans then said butler and you are determined not to let me out troth will i know neighbor answered the old man doggedly as for effie deans ye'll have enough ado to mind your own business and let her mind hers and for letting you out that mon be as the magistrate will determine and fare ye well for a bit for i mon see deacon sawyers put on one or twa of the doors that your quiet folk broke down yesternight mr butler there was something in this exquisitely provoking but there was also something darkly alarming to be imprisoned even on a false accusation has something in it disagreeable and menacing even to men of more constitutional courage than butler had to boast for although he had much of that resolution which arises from a sense of duty and an honourable desire to discharge it yet as his imagination was lively and his frame of body delicate he was far from possessing that cool insensibility to danger which is the happy portion of men of stronger health more firm nerves and less acute sensibility an indistinct idea of peril which he could neither understand nor ward off seemed to float before his eyes he tried to think over the events of the preceding night in hopes of discovering some means of explaining or vindicating his conduct for appearing among the mob since it immediately occurred to him that his detention must be founded on that circumstance and it was with anxiety that he found he could not recollect to have been under the observation of any disinterested witness in the attempts that he made from time to time to expostulate with the rioters and to prevail on them to release him the distress of deans's family the dangerous rendezvous which genie had formed and which he could not now hope to interrupt had also their share in his unpleasant reflections yet impatient as he was to receive an eclaircissement upon the cause of his confinement and if possible to obtain his liberty he was affected with a trepidation which seemed no good omen when after remaining an hour in this solitary apartment he received a summons to attend the sitting magistrate he was conducted from prison strongly guarded by a party of soldiers with a parade of precaution that however ill-timed and unnecessary is generally displayed after an event which such precaution if used in time might have prevented he was introduced into the council chamber as the place is called where the magistrates hold their sittings and which was then at a little distance from the prison one or two of the senators of the city were present and seemed about to engage in the examination of an individual who was brought forward to the foot of the long green-covered table round which the council usually assembled is that the preacher said one of the magistrates as the city officer in attendance introduced butler the man answered in the affirmative let him sit down there for an instant we will finish this man's business very briefly shall we remove mr butler queried the assistant it is not necessary let him remain where he is butler accordingly sat down on a bench at the bottom of the apartment attended by one of his keepers it was a large room partially and imperfectly lighted 
but by chance or the skill of the architect who might happen to remember the advantage which might occasionally be derived from such an arrangement one window was so placed as to throw a strong light at the foot of the table at which prisoners were usually posted for examination while the upper end where the examinants sat was thrown into shadow butler's eyes were instantly fixed on the person whose examination was at present proceeding in the idea that he might recognize some one of the conspirators of the former night but though the features of this man were sufficiently marked and striking he could not recollect that he had ever seen them before the complexion of this person was dark and his age somewhat advanced he wore his own hair combed smooth down and cut very short it was jet black slightly curled by nature and already mottled with grey the man's face expressed rather knavery than vice and a disposition to sharpness cunning and roguery more than the traces of stormy and indulged passions his sharp quick black eyes acute features ready sardonic smile promptitude and effrontery gave him altogether what is called among the vulgar a knowing look which generally implies a tendency to knavery at a fair or market you could not for a moment have doubted that he was a horse jockey intimate with all the tricks of his trade yet had you met him on a moor you would not have apprehended any violence from him his dress was also that of a horse dealer a close buttoned jockey coat or wrap rascal as it was then termed with huge metal buttons coarse blue upper stockings called boot hose because supplying the place of boots and a slouched hat he only wanted a loaded whip under his arm and a spur upon one heel to complete the dress of the character he seemed to represent your name is james ratcliffe said the magistrate ay always with your honour's leave that is to say you could find me another name if i did not like that one twenty to pick and choose upon always with your honour's leave resumed the respondent but james ratcliffe is your present name what is your trade i cannot just say distinctly that i have what you would call precisely a trade but repeated the magistrate what are your means of living your occupation how tout your honour with your leave kens that as well as i do replied the examined no matter i want to hear you describe it said the examinant me describe and to your honour far be it from jemmy ratcliffe responded the prisoner come sir no trifling i insist on an answer well sir replied the declarant i mon make a clean breast for ye see with your leave i am looking for favour describe my occupation quo ye troth it will be ill to do that in a feasible way in a place like this but what is it again that the ought command says thou shalt not steal answered the magistrate are you sure of that replied the accused troth then my occupation and that command are sore at odds for i read it thou shalt steal and that makes an unco difference though there's but a wee bit word left out to cut the matter short ratcliffe you have been a most notorious thief said the examinant i believe highlands and lowlands ken that sir for by england and holland replied ratcliffe with the greatest composure and effrontery and what do you think the end of your calling will be said the magistrate i could have given a bra guess yesterday but i dinna ken so well the day 
answered the prisoner and what would you have said would have been your end had you been asked the question yesterday just the gallows replied ratcliffe with the same composure you are a daring rascal sir said the magistrate and how dare you hope times are mended with you to-day dear your honour answered ratcliffe there's muckle difference between lying in prison under sentence of death and staying there of one's own proper accord when it would have cost a man nothing to get up and run away what was to hinder me from stepping out quietly when the rabble walked away with jock porteous yestreen and does your honour really think i stayed on purpose to be hanged i do not know what you may have proposed to yourself but i know said the magistrate what the law proposes for you and that is to hang you next wednesday eight days na na your honour said ratcliffe firmly craving your honour's pardon i'll never believe that till i see it i have kenned the law this many a year and many a thrawart job i have had with her first and last but the old jod is no so ill as that comes to i a fanned her bark worse than her bite and if you do not expect the gallows to which you are condemned for the fourth time to my knowledge may i beg the favour to know said the magistrate what it is you do expect in consideration of your not having taken your flight with the rest of the jailbirds which i will admit was a line of conduct little to have been expected i would never have thought for a moment of staying in that old gousty tomb house answered ratcliffe but that use and want had just given me a fancy to the place and i'm just expecting a bit post in it a post exclaimed the magistrate a whipping post i suppose you mean no no sir i had no thoughts of a whippin post after having been four times doomed to hang by the neck till i was dead i think i am far beyond being whippet then in heaven's name what did you expect just the post of under turnkey for i understand there's a vacancy said the prisoner i wouldna think of asking the lockman's place over his head it wouldna suit me so well as ither folk for i never could put a beast out of the way much less deal with a man that's something in your favour said the magistrate making exactly the inference to which ratcliffe was desirous to lead him though he mantled his art with an affectation of oddity but continued the magistrate how do you think you can be trusted with a charge in the prison when you have broken at your own hand half the jails in scotland with your honour's leave said ratcliffe if i kenned so well how to one out my cell it's like i would be all the better a hand to keep other folk in i think they would ken their business well that held me in when i wanted to be out or want out when i wanted to hand them in the remark seemed to strike the magistrate but he made no further immediate observation only desired ratcliffe to be removed when this daring and yet sly freebooter was out of hearing the magistrate asked the city clerk what he thought of the fellow's assurance tis no for me to say sir replied the clerk but if james ratcliffe be inclined to turn to good there is not a man ever came within the ports of the burg could be of so muckle use to the good town in the thief and lock-up line of business i'll speak to mr sharpetlaw about him upon ratcliffe's retreat butler was placed at the table for examination the magistrate conducted his inquiry civilly but yet in a manner which gave him to understand 
that he laboured under strong suspicion with a frankness which at once became his calling and character butler avowed his involuntary presence at the murder of porteus and at the request of the magistrate entered into a minute detail of the circumstances which attended that unhappy affair all the particulars such as we have narrated were taken minutely down by the clerk from butler's dictation when the narrative was concluded the cross-examination commenced which it is a painful task even for the most candid witness to undergo since a story especially if connected with agitating and alarming incidents can scarcely be so clearly and distinctly told but that some ambiguity and doubt may be thrown upon it by a string of successive and minute interrogatories the magistrate commenced by observing that butler had said his object was to return to the village of liberton but that he was interrupted by the mob at the west port is the west port your usual way of leaving town when you go to liberton said the magistrate with a sneer no certainly answered butler with the haste of a man anxious to vindicate the accuracy of his evidence but i chanced to be nearer that port than any other and the hour of shutting the gates was on the point of striking that was unlucky said the magistrate dryly pray being as you say under coercion and fear of the lawless multitude and compelled to accompany them through scenes disagreeable to all men of humanity and more especially irreconcilable to the profession of a minister did you not attempt to struggle resist or escape from their violence butler replied that their numbers prevented him from attempting resistance and their vigilance from effecting his escape that was unlucky again repeated the magistrate in the same dry inacquiescent tone of voice and manner he proceeded with decency and politeness but with a stiffness which argued his continued suspicion to ask many questions concerning the behavior of the mob the manners and dress of the ringleaders and when he conceived that the caution of butler if he was deceiving him must be lulled asleep the magistrate suddenly and artfully returned to former parts of his declaration and required a new recapitulation of the circumstances to the minutest and most trivial point which attended each part of the melancholy scene no confusion or contradiction however occurred that could countenance the suspicion which he seemed to have adopted against butler at length the train of his interrogatories reached madge wildfire at whose name the magistrate and town clerk exchanged significant glances if the fate of the good town had depended on her careful magistrates knowing the features and dress of this personage his inquiries could not have been more particular but butler could say almost nothing of this person's features which were disguised apparently with red paint and soot like an indian going to battle besides the projecting shade of a kerch or coif which muffled the hair of the supposed female he declared that he thought he could not know this madge wildfire if placed before him in a different dress but that he believed he might recognize her voice the magistrate requested him again to state by what gate he left the city by the cowgate port replied butler was that the nearest road to liberton no answered butler with embarrassment but it was the nearest way to extricate myself from the mob the clerk and magistrate again exchanged glances is the cowgate port a nearer way to liberton from the grass market than bristow port no replied butler but i had to visit a friend 
indeed said the interrogator you were in a hurry to tell the sight you had witnessed i suppose indeed i was not replied butler nor did i speak on the subject the whole time i was at st leonard's crags which road did you take to st leonard's crags by the foot of salisbury crags was the reply indeed you seem partial to circuitous routes again said the magistrate whom did you see after you left the city one by one he obtained a description of every one of the groups who had passed butler as already noticed their number demeanour and appearance and at length came to the circumstance of the mysterious stranger in the king's park on this subject butler would fain have remained silent but the magistrate had no sooner got a slight hint concerning the incident than he seemed bent to possess himself of the most minute particulars look ye mr butler said he you are a young man and bear an excellent character so much i will myself testify in your favour but if we are aware there has been at times a sort of bastard and fiery zeal in some of your order and those men irreproachable in other points which has led them into doing and countenancing great irregularities by which the peace of the country is liable to be shaken i will deal plainly with you i am not at all satisfied with this story of your setting out again and again to seek your dwelling by two several roads which were both circuitous and to be frank no one whom we have examined on this unhappy affair could trace in your appearance any thing like your acting under compulsion moreover the waiters at the cowgate port observed something like the trepidation of guilt in your conduct and declare that you were the first to command them to open the gate in a tone of authority as if still presiding over the guards and outposts of the rabble who had besieged them the whole night god forgive them said butler i only asked free passage for myself they must have much misunderstood if they did not wilfully misrepresent me well mr butler resumed the magistrate i am inclined to judge the best and hope the best as i am sure i wish the best but you must be frank with me if you wish to secure my good opinion and lessen the risk of inconvenience to yourself you have allowed you saw another individual in your passage through the king's park to st leonard's crags i must know every word which passed betwixt you thus closely pressed butler who had no reason for concealing what passed at that meeting unless because jeanie deans was concerned in it thought it best to tell the whole truth from beginning to end do you suppose said the magistrate pausing that the young woman will accept an invitation so mysterious i fear she will replied butler why do you use the word fear it said the magistrate because i am apprehensive for her safety in meeting at such a time and place one who had something of the manner of a desperado and whose message was of a character so inexplicable her safety shall be cared for said the magistrate mr butler i am concerned i cannot immediately discharge you from confinement but i hope you will not be long detained remove mr butler and let him be provided with decent accommodation in all respects he was conducted back to the prison accordingly but in the food offered to him as well as in the apartment in which he was lodged the recommendation of the magistrate was strictly attended to End of chapter twelfth chapter thirteenth of the heart of midlothian by sir walter scott 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dark and eerie was the night, and lonely was the way, as Janet, with her green mantle, to Miles Cross she did go. Old Ballad leaving butler to all the uncomfortable thoughts attached to his new situation among which the most predominant was his feeling that he was by his confinement deprived of all possibility of assisting the family at st leonard's in their greatest need we returned to jeanie deans who had seen him depart without an opportunity of farther explanation in all that agony of mind with which the female heart bids adieu to the complicated sensations so well described by coleridge hopes and fears that kindle hope an undistinguishable throng and gentle wishes long subdued subdued and cherished long it is not the firmest heart and jeanie under her russet rockelay had one that would not have disgraced cato's daughter that can most easily bid adieu to these soft and mingled emotions she wept for a few minutes bitterly and without attempting to refrain from this indulgence of passion but a moment's recollection induced her to check herself for a grief selfish and proper to her own affections while her father and sister were plunged into such deep and irretrievable affliction she drew from her pocket the letter which had been that morning flung into her apartment through an open window and the contents of which were as singular as the expression was violent and energetic if she would save a human being from the most damning guilt and all its desperate consequences if she desired the life and honour of her sister to be saved from the bloody fangs of an unjust law if she desired not to forfeit peace of mind here and happiness hereafter such was the frantic style of the conjuration she was entreated to give a sure secret and solitary meeting to the writer she alone could rescue him so ran the letter and he only could rescue her he was in such circumstances the billet farther informed her that an attempt to bring any witness of their conference or even to mention to her father or any other person whatsoever the letter which requested it would inevitably prevent its taking place and ensure the destruction of her sister the letter concluded with incoherent but violent protestations that in obeying this summons she had nothing to fear personally the message delivered to her by butler from the stranger in the park tallied exactly with the contents of the letter but assigned a later hour and a different place of meeting apparently the writer of the letter had been compelled to let butler so far into his confidence for the sake of announcing this change to jeanie she was more than once on the point of producing the billet in vindication of herself from her lover's half-hinted suspicions but there is something in stooping to justification which the pride of innocence does not at all times willingly submit to besides that the threats contained in the letter in case of her betraying the secret hung heavy on her heart it is probable however that had they remained longer together she might have taken the resolution to submit the whole matter to butler and be guided by him as to the line of conduct which she should adopt and when by the sudden interruption of their conference she lost the opportunity of doing so she felt as if she had been unjust to a friend whose advice might have been highly useful and whose attachment 
deserved her full and unreserved confidence to have recourse to her father upon this occasion she considered as highly imprudent there was no possibility of conjecturing in what light the matter might strike old david whose manner of acting and thinking in extraordinary circumstances depended upon feelings and principles peculiar to himself the operation of which could not be calculated upon even by those best acquainted with him to have requested some female friend to have accompanied her to the place of rendezvous would perhaps have been the most eligible expedient but the threats of the writer that betraying his secret would prevent their meeting on which her sister's safety was said to depend from taking place at all would have deterred her from making such a confidence even had she known a person in whom she thought it could with safety have been reposed but she knew none such their acquaintance with the cottagers in the vicinity had been very slight and limited to trifling acts of good neighbourhood jeanie knew little of them and what she knew did not greatly incline her to trust any of them they were in the order of loquacious good-humoured gossips usually found in their situation of life and their conversation had at all times few charms for a young woman to whom nature and the circumstance of a solitary life had given a depth of thought and force of character superior to the frivolous part of her sex whether in high or low degree left alone and separated from all earthly counsel she had recourse to a friend and adviser whose ear is open to the cry of the poorest and most afflicted of his people she knelt and prayed with fervent sincerity that god would please to direct her what course to follow in her arduous and distressing situation it was the belief of the time and sect to which she belonged that special answers to prayer differing little in their character from divine inspiration were as they expressed it born in upon their minds in answer to their earnest petitions in a crisis of difficulty without entering into an obtruse point of divinity one thing is plain namely that the person who lays open his doubts and distresses in prayer with feeling and sincerity must necessarily in the act of doing so purify his mind from the dross of worldly passions and interests and bring it into that state when the resolutions adopted are likely to be selected rather from a sense of duty than from any inferior motive jeanie arose from her devotions with her heart fortified to endure affliction and encouraged to face difficulties i will meet this unhappy man she said to herself unhappy he must be since i doubt he has been the cause of poor effie's misfortune but i will meet him be it for good or ill my mind shall never cast up to me that for fear of what might be said or done to myself i left that undone that might even yet be the rescue of her with a mind greatly composed since the adoption of this resolution she went to attend her father the old man firm in the principles of his youth did not in outward appearance at least permit a thought of his family distress to interfere with the stoical reserve of his countenance and manners he even chid his daughter for having neglected in the distress of the morning some trifling domestic duties which fell under her department why what meaneth this genie said the old man the brown four-year-old's milk is not sealed yet nor the bowies put up on the bink if ye neglect your worldly duties 
in the day of affliction what confidence have i that ye mind the greater matters that concern salvation god knows our bowies and our pipkins and our drops of milk and our bits of bread are nearer and dearer to us than the bread of life Jeanie, not unpleased to hear her father's thoughts thus expand themselves beyond the sphere of his immediate distress obeyed him and proceeded to put her household matters in order while old david moved from place to place about his ordinary employments scarce showing unless by a nervous impatience at remaining long stationary an occasional convulsive sigh or twinkle of the eyelid that he was labouring under the yoke of such bitter affliction the hour of noon came on and the father and child sat down to their homely repast in his petition for a blessing on the meal the poor old man added to his supplication a prayer that the bread eaten in sadness of heart and the bitter waters of mara might be made as nourishing as those which had been poured forth from a full cup and a plentiful basket and store and having concluded his benediction and resumed the bonnet which he had laid reverently aside he proceeded to exhort his daughter to eat not by example indeed but at least by precept the man after god's own heart he said washed and anointed himself and did eat bread in order to express his submission under a dispensation of suffering and it did not become a christian man or woman so to cling to creature comforts of wife or bairns here the words became too great as it were for his utterance as to forget the first duty submission to the divine will to add force to his precept he took a morsel on his plate but nature proved too strong even for the powerful feelings with which he endeavoured to bridle it ashamed of his weakness he started up and ran out of the house with haste very unlike the deliberation of his usual movements in less than five minutes he returned having successfully struggled to recover his ordinary composure of mind and countenance and affected to colour over his late retreat by muttering that he thought he heard the young stag loose in the byre he did not again trust himself with the subject of his former conversation and his daughter was glad to see that he seemed to avoid farther discourse on that agitating topic the hours glided on as on they must and do pass whether winged with joy or laden with affliction the sun set beyond the dusky eminence of the castle and the screen of western hills and the close of evening summoned david deans and his daughter to the family duty of the night it came bitterly upon jeanie's recollection how often when the hour of worship approached she used to watch the lengthening shadows and look out from the door of the house to see if she could spy her sister's return homeward alas this idle and thoughtless waste of time to what evils had it not finally led and was she altogether guiltless who noticing effie's turn to idle and light society had not called in her father's authority to restrain her but i acted for the best she again reflected and who could have expected such a growth of evil from one grain of human leaven in a disposition so kind and candid and generous as they sat down to the exercise as it is called a chair happened accidentally to stand in the place which effie usually occupied david deans saw his daughter's eyes swim in tears as they were directed towards this object 
and pushed it aside with a gesture of some impatience as if desirous to destroy every memorial of earthly interest when about to address the deity the portion of scripture was read the psalm was sung the prayer was made and it was remarkable that in discharging these duties the old man avoided all passages and expressions of which scripture affords so many that might be considered as applicable to his own domestic misfortune in doing so it was perhaps his intention to spare the feelings of his daughter as well as to maintain in outward show at least that stoical appearance of patient endurance of all the evil which earth could bring which was in his opinion essential to the character of one who rated all earthly things at their just estimate of nothingness when he had finished the duty of the evening he came up to his daughter wished her good-night and having done so continued to hold her by the hands for half a minute then drawing her towards him kissed her forehead and ejaculated the god of israel bless you even with the blessings of the promise my dear bairn it was not either in the nature or habits of david deans to seem a fond father nor was he often observed to experience or at least to evince that fullness of heart which seeks to expand itself in tender expressions or caresses even to those who were dearest to him on the contrary he used to censure this as a degree of weakness in several of his neighbours and particularly in poor widow butler it followed however from the rarity of such emotions in this self-denied and reserved man that his children attached to occasional marks of his affection and approbation a degree of high interest and solemnity well considering them as evidences of feelings which were only expressed when they became too intense for suppression or concealment with deep emotion therefore did he bestow and his daughter receive this benediction and paternal caress and you my dear father exclaimed jeanie when the door had closed upon the venerable old man may you have purchased and promised blessings multiplied upon you upon you who walk in this world as though you were not of the world and hold all that it can give or take away but as the midges that the sun blink brings out and the evening wind sweeps away she now made preparation for her night walk her father slept in another part of the dwelling and regular in all his habits seldom or never left his apartment when he had betaken himself to it for the evening it was therefore easy for her to leave the house unobserved so soon as the time approached at which she was to keep her appointment but the step she was about to take had difficulties and terrors in her own eyes though she had no reason to apprehend her father's interference her life had been spent in the quiet uniform and regular seclusion of their peaceful and monotonous household the very hour which some damsels of the present day as well of her own as of higher degree would consider as the natural period of commencing an evening of pleasure brought in her opinion awe and solemnity in it and the resolution she had taken had a strange daring and adventurous character to which she could hardly reconcile herself when the moment approached for putting it into execution 
her hands trembled as she snooted her fair hair beneath the riband then the only ornament or cover which young unmarried women wore on their head and as she adjusted the scarlet tartan screen or muffler made of plaid which the scottish women wore much in the fashion of the black silk veils still a part of female dress in the netherlands a sense of impropriety as well as of danger pressed upon her as she lifted the latch of her paternal mansion to leave it on so wild an expedition and at so late an hour unprotected and without the knowledge of her natural guardian when she found herself abroad and in the open fields additional subjects of apprehension crowded upon her the dim cliffs and scattered rocks interspersed with greensward through which she had to pass to the place of appointment as they glimmered before her in a clear autumn night recalled to her memory many a deed of violence which according to tradition had been done and suffered among them in earlier days they had been the haunt of robbers and assassins the memory of whose crimes is preserved in the various edicts which the council of the city and even the parliament of scotland had passed for dispersing their bands and ensuring safety to the lieges so near the precincts of the city the names of these criminals and of their atrocities were still remembered in traditions of the scattered cottages and the neighboring suburb in latter times as we have already noticed the sequestered and broken character of the ground rendered it a fit theatre for duels and rencontres among the fiery youth of the period two or three of these incidents all sanguinary and one of them fatal in its termination had happened since deans came to live at st leonard's his daughter's recollections therefore were of blood and horror as she pursued the small scarce tracked solitary path every step of which conveyed her to a greater distance from help and deeper into the ominous seclusion of these unhallowed precincts as the moon began to peer forth on the scene with a doubtful flitting and solemn light jeanie's apprehensions took another turn too peculiar to her rank and country to remain unnoticed but to trace its origin will require another chapter End of chapter thirteenth